Maureen Atato, welcome everybody to today's meeting of the governing body. We've got a whole lot of things and various people out there who've got interests presumably in the crowd. Uh, before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the Maritime Union have made their presence felt this morning and I've just come out of a meeting with them, and, um, and including Grant Millions, the Assistant Secretary, and others. We heard each other out, they've made the position, union's position clear and I respect that. And everyone around the table knows what we're trying to do. I'm going to lecture on that, but there's one thing I want to clarify, and it's important that journalists here take note, if there are any, um, that the protection of workers' rights must be a bottom line in any lease agreement, and that's non-negotiable. In my discussion with the union, just to emphasise that. So if we go ahead with the lease, there would be providing certainty to workers about their jobs, including protections about their conditions and safety. And I want to see well-paid jobs continue in this region. Whatever we do, regardless of our decisions in the future, we will continue to meet because of a shared interest in a profitable port and productive port, and noting that the container port is as yet not profitable, but it could well be. I also note that I'm under pressure from other groups, including leading citizens who want the port closed and shifted in the short term. I also agreed to meet with them, but unlike the union, they chose not to do so. So there. OK. For today. This is our second meeting of the year. As we said last month, it's up to our selected members to come prepared with our questions, not to make them up while we're asking them. The help for guide is that questions have question marks at the end. They're not speeches or sentences. So, Sandra, today one with an R will make me use the buzzer if there isn't a clear question. So let's get on with it. I have received policies from Councillors Dalton. Dalton is the only one. For absence and absence. Uh, Councillor Henderson for early departure. Councillor Henderson, he gets bored early, so he wants to go off. And, you know, that's what happens to the young people. Um, <laughs> Any more apologies? If not, I'll move those and it'll be seconded by the Deputy Mayor and all those in favour will say aye. And those, no, aye. Contrary carried. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there are no declarations of interest that I'm aware of. Confirmation of the minutes. I hope somebody's read those and seconded those because I'll move those. And I oh, know Leone and Deputy Mayor move and second the notes. Thank you. All those in favour, please say aye. No, contrary carried. Thank you very much indeed. We did decline a request for um, the Maritime Union because it came in uh, under... It was declined under Order 774B. There is a consultation process, but in fact we did have a meeting with them, which is a good way to do it. And there's another one for Bill Rayner from the Motet Levy request. He was also declined under the same thing. There is a consultation process and there was an opportunity... In both cases, there was an opportunity for them as organisations to meet with us in several of the meetings we've, we've had in the last few days, but there have been gaps that people could have spoken had they wished to. No local board input. There's no extraordinary items known. And so we're going to start off with the Chief Executive and the Group Financial Officer update, which I'm sure you're all coming here specifically to hear. Welcome to Phil and Nicola. Come and share some good news with us, please. Kia ora koutou. Morena, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I want to um, uh, start this by introducing... I oh, have a seat here, Nick. Um, to introduce um, Nick Turo to you, who, of course, um, will already be... Well known to some of you, yes. Um, given uh, Nick's um, role as Kai Fakahiri uh, Tawaka Tauranga Whenua, looking after all of our co governance arrangements um, and navigating that very interesting space on behalf of the city, uh, Nick's been appointed to the role of Tumuaki Huanga Māori, meaning our most senior. Māori position in the organisation and on the executive team. So in that capacity, I just wanted you to um, take a fresh look at my uh, colleague here and, uh, and give him the opportunity perhaps just to say a couple of words. Uh, tēnā tātou, um, aku rangatira nei rā ka mihi atu rungi o koutou. 
kahuri anō ki o tātou mea, um, nei raka mihi, uh, ki o koutou katoa, uh, me o koutou mahi e mahi ana mō o mātou mā me ki ko tāma ki makaurau. Um, yeah, kia ora everyone, my name is Nick Tūroa. Um, from a tribal perspective, I am affiliated to Ngāti Raukawa and Wanganui, um, and to Te Whanua, Apanui and Te Atiawa. Um, I've lived in Auckland now for, since 2009, um, mainly involved in conservation stuff. Um, I've worked with many of you, um, Councillor Fletcher. Um, I recall working quite closely with you on Motutapu Island, Councillor Lee, um, at Aotea and Motuihinga, translocating to Atara. Um, and with many of these members on many of the, the different co-governance organisations, be it the Tupuna Maunga Authority, Kaipatsuki, um, uh, Ngāti Whātua Reserves Board, um, Te Waio Maru, um, and many other um, projects which we've um, come across each other. Um, you'll find I'm an approachable chap. Um, I'm very passionate about um, Māori outcomes and delivering for um, our Māori partners, Mana Whenua and Mātāwaka. Um, if you have any questions um, or would like to spend any time, I'd be more than happy to, to come and meet with you guys um, and discuss any opportunities or issues that you may have. Um, so, yeah, kia ora, that's me. Kia ora. Nick. Thank you. Right, moving to um, other matters. Um, um, we have reports on the agenda today about separately about recovery shared services and of course the quarterly performance update so I'll be reasonably brief in relation to a performance summary. A few things I do want to highlight though, the, um, we have just completed a staff engagement survey obviously of particular interest to me but of some interest to yourselves in terms of testing the pulse of the organisation. Um, quite an important thing that we do every six months. Um, I suppose worryingly it was uh, out in the organisation at the same time as I was announcing uh, the possibility of changes at the top end of the organisation. Um, but I'm really pleased both that the participation was high, 80% of all our staff completed that, and um, we didn't just maintain staff engagement, it actually went up a notch. Um, I won't get more scientific than that, but it's, it's actually um, quite a good result for where we are right at this, um, mo right at this moment. Um, and the indicators around various, I suppose, component parts, um, staff confidence and health and safety being looked after, um, the way that change is managed, um, diversity and inclusion type um, indices and what have you have all been preserved or slightly increased in, the, in, in that cycle. A comment, and there is um, detail in the QPR report, um, but I know there's always an interest internally and externally in um, staff numbers and, and staffing resources. Uh, you'll see that um, you'll see an increase in there, 134 FTEs since the last quarter, but that is almost um, totally due to seasonal reasons. We bring on more staff over the summer for our pools and, uh, and summer programs, and it will, um, in fact, already has um, started dropping off in the, um, uh, since that reporting period. Um, and I suppose the important indicator for you to have in your mind there is that it's um, 118 full-time equivalent numbers lower than for the quarter 12 months earlier. And that is despite gearing up in a number of areas, most notably the recovery office. Okay, so it's a net decrease in the 12 month period of 100 and 120 odd, even though we've had to increase for recovery and some other activities, and of course um, deal with uh, growth pressures. I think the thing that I want to leave in your mind is that really the organisation continues to absorb growth cost pressures within its current staffing numbers, okay, and, and quite successfully so. Um, uh, you'll see in the report um, some, some increases in terms of uh, pools and leisure memberships, um, library memberships, um, and 
uh, sustaining um, um, activity in the building and resource consents area. There's a slight drop in statutory performance in the building consent area. Um, I, and Craig might comment if there are detailed questions. Um, I don't think that's material, and I think it possibly reflects the um, the um, um, Christmas, New Year, um, summer uh, impacts. Um, in terms of what it indicates in terms of um, development um, pressure in the um, in in the wider housing market and beyond. Um, Actually, resource consents rose last month compared to um, uh, 12 months earlier, um, but they're, um, they're, they're kind of reasonably stable. Okay. I want to draw attention to the, and this has been publicised, draw attention to the fact of the uh, Gore Street um, building defects litigation and a judgment that... Um, didn't all go our way, did in some parts, um, uh, for sure, but um, it again illustrates, and while we haven't got costs out of that process yet, it was a judgment without costs at this point in time, um, it again draws attention to the exposure of this organisation and our ratepayers to building defects liabilities, given most of the other players um, involved in a construction of that scale are no longer with us in liquidation, um, moved on, and so on. And we're um, last man standing, and uh, I think this continues to be quite a significant um, um, policy issue for us to discuss and to uh, work through with government, because um, it frankly does not please me that um, our ratepayers are on the hook for costs of the scale that we're talking about. Anyway, I won't get too far in. Yes, in, indeed, Your Worship. Um, we are continuing our discussions with central government in a number of um, respects. Um, water, obviously, we're at a point in the process now where different scenarios are with credit rating agencies to test our optionality around future water um, delivery models. Um, not much more we can say until we get that uh, feedback, but I do register the fact of us um, needing to come back to you, I suggest through early May, to have some um, serious conversations about um, uh, um, water care's future um, going forward in, in that regard. Um, I won't talk to the um, GPS and the transport space because you had a, um, a significant meeting um, on, on that yesterday. Um, Matt and the team will talk to recovery separately on your agenda. I do want to um, register um, with you the fact of us receiving a letter from uh, Minister Mark Mitchell. Um, which really expresses a sentiment that I think we all share, which is that we want the categorisation of properties and the resolution of these outcomes for affected communities to go as fast as possible. Um, what I want to signal to you is that we want to have a workshop with you next week. Um, so it, it's quite an involved discussion. It goes to um, earlier matters that we've traversed with you around Category 2C, the public works um, related things that might um, safeguard homes, and the extent of uh, the extent of the Category 3 buyouts and the way the package, the funding package with government works. So I want to um, provide an opportunity next week for the recovery team to talk through with you how that might work, but all in aid of exploring how we can accelerate things um, for, the, for the resolution of some of these, some of these issues. Just, just finally, um, in terms of some of the um, chief executive priorities in my own work program, and there are numerous of these, so I'm not going to labour this, but um, um, for your information, the, the uh, work to refresh the top end leadership levels in the organisation is progressing. We are through a consultation process 
Um, I had 657 discrete bits of feedback around that proposal, and that's been worked through now as it properly should in terms of our obligation to consult and to hear input from around the organisation. The decisions around that will probably, you know, are, st are still um, two or more weeks away. So, um, um, but as an engagement exercise um, around some pretty meaty decisions, that's that's gone well. Um, I'd like to draw attention to the grads and interns program that we have um, trying to accelerate in the organisation. So we're up, you know, from a pretty much a standing start, we're up to 35 now, and by mid-year we'll be at 50 in the organisation, utilising, for the most part, currently vacant uh, positions in the organisation to try and get that talent pipeline um, uh, coming through the organisation. We're, we're well advanced and we'll be reporting separately to you around the value for money exercise that's looked at pools and leisure uh, delivery. and. Um, a procurement review is um, in the initiation stage, having a look at our procurement practice and just finally, um, and I won't labour it because there's a report on your agenda um, looking at group shared services. Um, suffice to say, we're making very good progress there and the basis for shared services going forward across the group is now largely in place and now just needs to be implemented. Um, I might say with the very positive um, collaboration um, um, and cooperation of the chief executives of the CCOs. So, you know, just a nod to them in terms of approaching that really positively. That's um, me, Your Worship. Um, perhaps I might just go directly to Nicola for the financial aspect. Thank you, Phil. Asamaria, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. So I'd like to start off this morning with some good news. So earlier this week we did make a media release about our largest ever green bond issue. So we issued 600 million euros, so around 1 billion New Zealand dollars, uh, with good interest and good rates. It's a 10-year bond. Green bonds are used to fund projects and assets with positive environmental outcomes, such as contributing to the City Rail Link, energy efficient buildings and cycleways. So pleased with how that went. Um, so today is the final day of the consultation period for the long-term plan. So for everybody in the audience, we would encourage you, if you have not yet have your say, to go ahead and do that by midnight tonight. We've had quite a range of events across uh, the Auckland region. We've been to the CUMU show, the Pacifica Festival at Western Springs, uh, very recently Polyfest held drop-in sessions uh, in libraries across the region, online webinar sessions, Hui for Matawaka and other Maori organisations, Pacifica Fono in South and West Auckland, and other regional and organisation uh, interest groups and have your say events uh, right here over the last couple of weeks, the most recent one being on Tuesday. <coughs> This year we also held participatory forums as part of the deliberative engagement approach and these are being conducted both with our advisory panels and a demographically representative group of the general public and there's been very good and thoughtful engagement through that process. As of last night, we had received and counted 11,000 submissions. They're coming in thick and fast, so we have received more than that number. They haven't all been able to be processed at the moment. While I have no results to share with you today, um, over the course of the consultation, I can report that the diversity in terms of submitters has been increasing. So that is both in terms of different age groups providing submissions and also in terms of ethnicity and engagement efforts that we have made, for example, um, at the Polyfest um, have did result in a notable uptick in the amount of Pacifica submissions. That's very pleasing. Uh, the team are expecting quite a large number of submissions to come through today and tonight from community partners, and that's uh, consistent with what we've experienced previously. Overall, the submission, submission numbers are a little bit below where we are for the last LTP consultation. That is 
really, we think, because it is quite a complex consultation with a lot of issues and the form does take a longer time for people to complete. We are on track to complete the analysis and reporting of the feedback, which is scheduled to come to a budget committee workshop on the 24th of April. I just want to acknowledge, in particular, Ken Anton and the team who are working really hard at the moment to, to wade through all of that important feedback from the public. Then uh, finally, just want to speak briefly to the year-to-date results to the end of February. As Phil has mentioned, the next item on the agenda is our quarterly performance update, update to December, so I won't speak in too much detail. Most of the results to the end of February are consistent with those that we had seen at the end of December. Um, broadly, our group capital spend is 94% of budgets, um, particularly with the large projects that continue delivery, City Rail Link, Central Interceptor, Eastern Busway. In the month of February, the Corbin Reserve stormwater upgrade achieved practical completion, and some notable transport projects have also been completed, Rata Street safety improvements, Point Wells Drive footpath construction, the CRL electric train retrofit uh, completed one of the stages. Our group revenue continues 5% above budget with strong water care IGC revenue, unbudgeted grants from central government, mainly in relation to our storm recovery activities, and also the higher consenting volumes that Phil mentioned. Our direct expenditure is on budget, lots of overs and unders, but overall we are on budget with that. The our one most recent change to our financial expectations is in terms of insurance recoveries, and you will have heard water care uh, say similar to what I'm about to report as well, the insurance claims are numerous, they are very complex and obviously there's a very large number of them as a result of the storm and flood last year. So they are taking longer to process and pay out than expected and we no longer anticipate to get the money within this financial year, however it, it, it will come, it's just a matter of working through the process. And with that I will hand over to Gary. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, just an economic update for your information. Uh, economic activity has been uh, slowing recently as higher interest rates damp demand and investment decisions in the economy. Data out last week, some of you may have seen in the news, uh, national GDP contracted in the December 2023 quarter uh, by 0.1%. That's the fourth fall out of the last five quarters in terms of measured GDP. And annually we're down 0.3% uh, on December 2022. I just note that GDP is a backward-looking measure of activity and it is subject to revisions as more data becomes available. But some contraction in GDP is to be expected and had been forecast. Uh, given the higher, higher interest rates that have been underpinned by a higher official cash rate set by the Reserve Bank to bring down inflation, uh, noting that persistent high inflation is also very damaging. Uh, the slowdown, of course, brings challenges for central government uh, with softer and expected tax revenue being signalled uh, with uh, lower activity and the details of how central government will respond will be revealed in the budget in May. Uh, just to note, some progress has been made in reducing inflation. Uh, consumer price index annually is at 4.7 as at the December quarter, down from 5.6%. Much of that reduction has come through uh, the international channel with some milder reductions among domestic components. Now on February the 28th, the Reserve Bank did hold the official cash rate at 5.5% as had been expected, uh, noting that higher interest rates are working and dampening inflation pressures in the economy. And the Reserve Bank's updated forecast as at February is for annual CPI to fall within the target band below 3% to within 1 to 3% uh, late 2024. And that forecast is similar to what we had seen in November, and so there's no material change to that outlook in terms of our assumptions. Any cuts in the OCR may not come until 2025, any material cuts anyway, and that implies conditions are likely to remain challenging for many Auckland households and businesses through the rest of this year. Uh, that uh, outline I've just shared with you is available in our Auckland Economic Quarterly, which was released earlier this week. And uh, just to note, it has a feature article that looks at the impacts of the unitary plan. And overall, it's a very good news story, I think, in terms of the unitary plan enabling more new homes to have been supplied than otherwise. And of course, uh, that's been supportive of rents and house prices being lower than otherwise. It does not take away from the housing affordability being challenging overall. 
uh, but we're in a better place than we otherwise would have been if we hadn't made that change back in 2016. And the key takeaway from that, I think, is that our decisions on land use policy uh, can impact the quantity and price of housing supply. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, questions, uh, just if the questions are about the performance, um, there's a, the next item is about the quarterly performance, so just taking questions about that. So far I have a question from Councillor Fletcher who's online. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. My question is to Phil Wilson and it's around the areas of advocacy that he is bringing to central government and it relates to Category 3 properties and buyouts where there is an approved process. But that does not, as I understand it, relate to family trusts. Can he provide any information on advocacy that he has brought to this matter to central government? Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question, Councillor Fletcher. Look, in short, not... Um, without um, a quick discussion in the background and um, and checking, so if you're if you're okay, what I might suggest is that we return to that question when we come to the recovery item and address it there. That that's fine with me as long as that it is covered and we are bringing advocacy to it. Thank you. Well, just to, um, sorry, Phil, M Mayor, if. Um, when Minister Mark Mitchell met, both yourself and I did bring that issue to his attention, so the officials were there at that point, but there hasn't been a formal response on, on that. And, yeah, excuse me, that that was what I was going to check. So, yes, yes, there's been some advocacy, but I'm unclear on the outcome of it. Thank you for that. Thank Councillor you. Darby, please. Uh, point of information, sorry, it's Julie. Um, actually, the government have made an announcement on that um, earlier in the week, uh, which was that they won't be addressing the family trust issue. There's a media statement that came out earlier in the week. I'm happy to put the link in the chat. Thanks. It's for that reason I asked about advocacy. OK, that'll be covered in the recovery item, which is later in the morning. OK, it might be day for the way things are going. Um, Councillor Darby, please. Thank you. Thanks, Gary, uh, on those GDP numbers. Gary, GDP is the most relevant number is the GDP per capita. Um, that's where you really get a read on how your city is growing or contracting by the inputs, you know, the inputs of people. Um, what, how have we trended in the last 10 years when you go through to, to the per capita number as opposed to the headline number, which can look good because you're just adding people, immigration, people coming from other parts of New Zealand, from, outs, uh, from outside of New Zealand, the construction sector, churn of finances, etc. How are we, how are we looking over 10 years and maybe the last period on GDP per capita? Per capita? Uh, thank you, Councillor. It's a very uh, relevant question. GDP per capita, um, you know, it is, it is determined by our population growth as well as our productivity. I was looking at it recently over the last 10 years. Uh, coincidentally, it has been growing uh, reasonably strongly. I look at it as a ratio uh, relative to New Zealand's GDP per capita as a whole, and we would expect Auckland has a premium on a per capita basis of GDP relative to the rest of the country on a per capita basis. And I would say that around... The last six to seven years, uh, we've been growing more quickly on a per capita basis than the country as a whole. So I would say that we've had some strong performance on a per capita basis, but in the most recent year, of course, we've had very strong population growth, record population growth, and so that, of course, has uh, sort of spread our GDP among more people in the near term anyway. So I hope that answers some of your question. Just going forward, would it be valuable to show that per capita GDP in, in the reports if, you, if it's accessible? I think it's a very good suggestion, Councillor. I'll take that on board. Uh, we tend to have a, we're intending to have a closer look at productivity, Auckland's productivity, which is what matters for uh, living standards in the long run. And so we'll put, be putting an increasing uh, focus on that in subsequent quarterlies and take that, that feedback and any other feedback on board. Thank you. Thank you for that. Did you have a question, Councillor Hills? No, OK. In that case, Councillor Leone, please. 
Oh, just a quick question. I know in the um, last report there was an update on um, how much we projected to receive with the remaining airport shares. Is it still between, is it 25 to 40 million per annum? Um, I have to ask uh, John Bishop, our treasurer, if he could address that question. Sorry, just repeat that question again. The, the, the income projections for the airport shareholding. The income projections for the airport shareholding going forward? Yeah. Yes. Um, I have to come back to you on that. I mean, it's the, the, the <coughs> dividend just announced was 6.75 cents per share times the remaining shareholding, which is about 150 million shares. Um, <laughs> what's that about? 10 million? Um, that's the interim dividend. Um, but we are updating those assumptions um, for the LTP consultation or the LTP workshop material. Okay, thank you. Okay, that brings to an end the questions I've got here. So I'm just going to I'll move that we receive this and it will be seconded by somebody. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Baker, all those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, carried. Thank you for that presentation. We're going to move to item eight, which is um, the Auckland Council Group and Council Quarterly Performance Reports for the quarter ended 31 December 2023. So it's slightly old, but uh, welcome Karuna Daya and her team to the table, and um, they'll address us on this. The purpose is to provide a quarterly performance update, and uh, we'll move and discuss this when we've got to the end of it. Thank you very much for your team. Please introduce some Karuna and you're off you go now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, so as the Mayor has just said, this is the regular quarterly performance report to go through the key financials and service performance information through to the end of December. We've got a brief presentation on results from Ross, John, Brian and I. We also have Merla Edmondson, GM Connected Communities and her team to present a few slides around um, our Auckland Library services. And there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, just before I hand over to Ross, I just wanted to mention, um, we, do, we are continuing our program to improve these reports <coughs> and respond to elected member feedback on these where we can. So for this quarter, we've built out our key performance measures summary to include annual comparisons and some additional charts and to outline more clearly where we haven't met targets, why and what we're actually doing about it. Uh, secondly, based on feedback, we have included a capital project summary um, with delivery status, project phase, spend to date and overall RAG statuses. Um, we've also provided exception-based sound bites of a few at-risk or potentially at-risk projects. Um, so just noting these are a selection of special or highlighted projects. It's still a work in progress and is for Auckland Council only at this stage. Um, but we do welcome any feedback on work, on what works and what does not work. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Ross. Okay, thank you. So just... Um, in terms of the, the group results for the uh, quarter to December, it is a bit old, but it's uh, I guess important to go through achieve, you know, some of the key achievements and figures for that quarter. Um, these are some of the projects completed in the December quarter. There's the Myers Pass underpass project, which was completed in mid-December. There's the Henry Atkinson statue in Titarangi with a whole bunch of um, extensive groundworks to support that. Uh, and then there's a bunch of improvements to the Northwest uh, bus services. So um, three new frequent routes added to bring a total of uh, five frequent services to the northwest. Um, so you've got the extra bus services in the operational sense, but you've also got the capital works to provide the bus priority to, to enable um, that to be a, a reliable frequent service. Um, other things across the group, um, a, a range of footpaths footpath uh, construction projects completed in the Rodney area, uh, supported by the, the Rodney uh, local targeted rate. 
Um, some, uh, some key pump station works, including the Newland pump station, uh, was completed. Uh, and then you've got Devon Lane and Koei. So you've got the vibrant mural and all weather canopy and all the lighting that goes with it, uh, all completed to, to help uh, brighten up and improve Pukukoi. Um, in terms of overall group capital delivery, um, as Nicola just said, uh, delivery for February is around 94% you know, of budget. It was a little bit higher at the December quarter, 96%, but not, not a lot of change. Um, it was uh, 58 million less than budget, but a significant increase from the prior year. At that stage, a, a year ago, it was um, around 90% um, of budget. So things have been, have been increasing. We're getting closer to delivering more in line with the budget this financial year than last. Um, there's been some delays with uh, flood, uh, flood remediation projects where in the first half of the financial year, more time spent in the design phase, um, but that will change later in the year as things move from design to the construction phase. Uh, in terms of group operating performance, um, uh, similar to the, uh, the updates Nicola gave for the, for the February month, but as at the, um, as at the end of the December quarter, uh, overall, um, there was a 27 million uh, favourable result compared to budgets. Uh, that was largely driven by higher revenue, the things that have been spoken about, higher consenting revenue, higher growth charges, um, a bit of you know, higher, um, higher bus patronage, basically 33% a, a more uh, patronage than, than in 12 months prior. So we've seen some of those things improve. On the flip side, water and wastewater revenue was, was down a little bit and on uh, some lower volumes. So minor movements, but overall uh, ahead of budget. Um, on the cost side of things, just marginally above budget at that December, um, end of the December quarter. Um, staff costs were up a little bit. That was because we had more staff, um, more staff costs being recorded in op uh, for operating expenditure, less of those costs being um, captured as part of the cost of capital projects, as we'd expected in the budget. Um, there were some additional costs in terms of storm and, and flooding, uh, repairs and maintenance, you know, more, more than anticipated in the budget, and there are some timing differences, particularly around grants and sponsorships. Uh, in terms of FTEs, um, as has been discussed, uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, there was an increase from the previous quarter, 220 million, with the biggest movement being Auckland Council being that seasonal uh, shift that, uh, that Phil spoke about. Uh, 100 extra FTEs um, added over the summer period, things like lifeguards and, and things that just sort of normally happen over that summer period. We always see the peak in the second quarter and then things change uh, after that. Uh, across the rest of the group, there's a bit of filling of vacancies. Um, uh, so within Auckland Transport and Tataki, they went through some significant structural changes and then that, now they've moved to filling some of the vacancies. Key areas uh, within transport is the integrated network area, customer experience and the planning and investment space, also taking on more graduates. Uh, in Tataki, there has been um, yeah, filling vacancies and taking on people in the security area uh, to, to meet safety requirements. Elsewhere across the group, um, there was a, bit less, uh, but a little bit less FTE in port, a little bit more in water care, which includes some insourcing in the digital and project management spaces. Uh, now I'll pass across to John to talk about group debt management. Uh, thanks Ross and good morning everybody. Um, so this is the first slide here. Uh, net debt at the end of December 23 was 11.9 billion and that was a decrease of 400 million from the start of the financial year. And that's largely due to the proceeds uh, from the 7% sell down of our airport shares. As a result, debt to revenue at the end of December was sitting at 241%. So well within the 290 limit, and without the sale of those airport shares, the debt to revenue would have been around about 257%. Uh, this next slide uh, was a request from Councillor Philippine from the last <coughs> quarterly catch-up. So what this chart shows is the movement in our debt from the beginning of the financial year to the beginning of March. Um, so the, the purple bars there, they show months where the cash inflows exceed cash outflows. And they're the months largely driven by the quarterly rates receipts, and also September where we had the proceeds from the sale of the airport shares. 
Uh, the pink bars show months where the cash outflows exceed cash inflows. And realise that throughout this period, we are um, continually borrowing to fund the CapEx programme uh, as approved by the annual plan. So even in the months where you see cash inflows exceeding cash outflows, obviously during that time we are still spending the capital expenditure programme. If you go to the last bar there, um, the, the debt as of the 1st of March at 11.798 billion. So without the sale of airport shares, it would have been about 12.63 uh, billion. And in fact, um, it would have been probably about 20 million higher than that, because obviously if we hadn't sold the shares, we'd have been paying interest on that debt, which would have been about 24 million. And if we hadn't sold the shares, we would have received additional airport dividends during that time of about 4 million. So it'd be about an additional 20 million on top of that. Now this last slide here just shows our projected uh, cost of funds. So the blue bar there shows you what was in our annual plan and the latest forecast as of December is that, uh, that line to the top there. Um, our interest rates have probably peaked. Um, we can't be certain about that. Uh, so that's probably about as bad as you're going to see those interest cost forecasts, and you're likely to see those modestly come down over time. And as far as our credit ratings, um, they remain at AA from S&P and AA2 from Moody's, and again, both on stable outlooks. I'll hand over to Brian. Uh, thank you, John and Kira Koto. Um, so Auckland Council's continuing to progress well with its, uh, well, let me just turn the slide. No, it's wrong way. There you go. Uh, continue to progress well with its capital delivery program, and as John mentioned, we uh, do continuously uh, borrow for that delivery. Uh, so fiscal works to extend and separate the stormwater uh, from the combined network at, from Potato Street to Great North Road was completed, fiscal works, and that's part of our water quality improvement <laughs> program. Uh, several Kauri tree uh, track upgrades have been completed and the tracks have reopened, uh, including to Penninga, Upper Kauri, Long Road, Fence Line and uh, Chatswood Reserve. Uh, and then finally, Tamaki Community Recycling Centre and Helensville a Community Recycling Centre shop opened in October. Uh, so in the quarter two, uh, for Auckland Council parent, we uh, delivered 223 million in capital investment against a budget of 225, or 99% of the budget. Uh, so, so very much on track. Uh, our Healthy Waters uh, team on track with their capital program, the Clunker Place New Lynn project reached practical completion, and that's uh, involved boring a 550 metre uh, pipeline from Clunker Place to. Uh, just through underneath and Brico Place, uh, through to the Monroe Wetland Reserve. The Sinclair Park Water Treatment Plant uh, also reached practical completion in December, uh, and that project upgraded the treatment plant to comply with uh, water quality uh, standards. The park's community facility space also very busy, uh, continuing to deliver on accelerated renewals, uh, and as well as their program of sport park development. Uh, and land acquisition. So this includes the acquisition of uh, 120 Hill Road uh, to expand Auckland Botanic Garden in October last year. Uh, and because of the accelerated program, they are running ahead on uh, budget as of December, uh, but this is balanced by um, a constrained delivery of technology projects while we uh, sort of consider the f purpose technology space in that um, uh, at the moment. A revenue of 277 million uh, for quarter two was 42 million uh, above budget, or 18%. Uh, this is mainly driven by uh, uh, building consenting inspection revenue, as mentioned before, as well as licensing compliance, and that's particularly in the dog registration and, and food licensing spaces. Uh, direct expenditure was 835 million uh, in Q2, or 14 million uh, above budget, about 1.7%, uh, predominantly to support the higher consenting volumes, uh, but also rising contract costs. That's something we're actively managing. There's also continued focus on uh, delivery of uh, storm, emergency storm resilience related repairs and maintenance, and that uh, continues to add costs uh, for us as well. Lastly, there were, were some timing differences between when we paid out grants for the 
uh, business improvement districts. Um, so all within the financial year, but just slightly ahead of when we had budgeted. <coughs> Uh, and as reported in the recent uh, Revenue Expenditure Value Committee, um, a further six million in savings were found in quarter two, uh, taking our total savings for the year to 43.7 million. Uh, and savings were found in a variety of areas, so combining regional service functions, standardizing the support for the three local board cluster model, uh, improved fees from food licensing, as well as one off, as well as one off savings from careful financial management. There's also quite a continued focus on back office efficiencies, uh, naturally, and um, so some examples of, of where we found those in quarter two, uh, negotiating uh, improved and reduced indoor plant contract costs, migration from copper to fiber lines, uh, and reducing those copper lines, uh, and then reducing the number of leased printers. Uh, so uh, we reduced that by 200, or about 32%. Uh, and we remain on track to achieve the $50 million uh, savings target that uh, is included in our 23-24 annual budget. Karina. Thanks, Brian. Um, so during quarter two, 26 performance measures were updated and we met 15, we did not meet 10, and one was substantially achieved, um, substantially achieved as um, when target has not been met by a slim margin, plus or minus 2%. So we had good performance for stormwater and emergency management, achieving targets for all their measures. Customer satisfaction in both building and resource consents has stayed sa stable. Um, in regulatory, although our statutory targets were not met, performance has improved from previous years. Um, building and resource consents achieving 82% and 83% respectively there is also additional recruitment underway. Um, in terms of our customer and community services, we have favourable results in areas such as the number of participants and activities at art facilities, community centres and higher venues. And although below target, some good results in moving in the right direction with our libraries, such as the active library members, um, and I guess at that point, it seems a good time to hand over to our library services team. So if I can please call Merla, Catherine and Daryl up. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, um, ko Merla Edmondson taku uh, It's very nice to be here, Mr Mayor and councillors, to present some more detail around the library services that were requested at the last meeting. Um, I'm going to hand over to the team because I'm currently, in the last couple of weeks, seconded um, to support Phil in his uh, work around the refresh for the senior leaders. So. Uh, Daryl Solgin uh, is acting uh, Gen General Manager for Connected Communities and we've got Catherine Leonard who is uh, Head of Library and Learning Services and they will speak to the content. I'm happy to stay if there are any questions that you have of me. Thank you. Morena, Mr Mayor and Councillors. Um, so I'm going to start by commenting on some of our performance indicators and pass to Catherine who will do a bit of a deeper dive into our digital platforms and some key business improvement initiatives and then we'll come back to me to expand on a couple of important partnerships and community wellbeing at the end before we're available to answer questions. So um, let's, let's start by acknowledging the awesome introduction from the earlier slide that shows that there are areas of improvement for three of our library's KPIs that didn't meet the target, noting that two were actually close to being met. Um, and by way of explanation rather than excuse, our targets were set in a, in a different COVID world, uh, while many other businesses and organisations adjusted their targets in response to COVID hours were, were set in LTP stone. But we like a challenge. Uh, and like other people-centred sectors like retail and hospitality, libraries have experienced a slower post-COVID recovery than others. Though many of those trends are now changing and we look forward to showing you quite a bright picture from Q3 the next time we are with you. And for example, act active members 
growth reached a new peak of uh, 394,000 people in February, our highest result since October 2020. Uh, and we're setting new LTP measures now in line with customer behaviour that's more recent. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of this slide, but there's three KPIs I would like to just draw your attention to here. And the first one is the, is the visits, which is actually physical visits. So these are actual human beings walking into a space. So people are coming into our libraries not just to borrow books, but to learn through programs and alongside skilled staff to connect with others in our spaces and become dig digitally literate so they can participate in the world and develop individual potential. We don't do all the do. Uh, a quarter and growing of our programs are actually delivered by the community for the community. And libraries are about connection and identity and belonging. Um, they're one of the few remaining places that people are welcomed regardless of their position in society. But that's a big number, four million. So we've had four million people through the door year to date at the end of Q2. That's just uh, under 1.6% of the target. And to put that into some context for you, because I find it hard to imagine 4 million people in a space, that, that's the equivalent to 160 sold out Warriors games in a, in a six month period. The other, um, the other KPI is the one in the bottom right there, the 8 million total issues. And what I just want to mention is that a subset of that, which is our digital or our e-issues, while bricks and mortar borrowing, so people physically coming in, is still the preference for the majority of Aucklanders, our digital offer is also a very significant and growing proportion of our borrowing. Um, Auckland outperforms some of the world's largest public libraries, including San Francisco, Chicago, Ontario, and Brooklyn. In, in fact, we're number 22. In the, in the entire world when it comes to um, the, the e-issues. And then finally, up the top, hidden away a little bit in the top left-hand corner up there is the um, customer satisfaction. You know, as I've just mentioned, we see a lot of Aucklanders, a lot more than the Warriors, and 95% um, of our customers are either satisfied or very satisfied. And that's a really positive contribution to council's reputation and trust and confidence. Okay, I think I'll just skip one, which shows I'm not, maybe I'm not as digital, digitally no, literate. No, that is the yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Daryl. Morena Koto, called Catherine Leonard Tokawingai, Head of Library and Learning Services. Um, so, just to dive a bit, little deeper into the success of our e collections and our digital platforms, um, we, as Daryl said, we get a lot of national and international recognition for the success and the importance of these platforms. Um, e collections and the use of them has not happened by accident. So, we started doing a lot of work on our e content strategy several years ago, well before the pandemic. So when the pandemic did hit, we were very well placed to scale up what we were offering to Aucklanders, and it was a success story at the time. The usage is driven by having the right content, well curated, the range and availability of the content, the access and the technology all right. So there's many factors that come into it being a customer success story. We also manage the money that we put to our e-collections, in some cases from the same budgets that we purchase our print. So it's a constant balancing act of getting this right for our customers. Important to remember that our customers who take out e-books and e-audiobooks also borrow print. It's not one or the other, it's, bo it's both, and it's a choice that we're offering. Um, our size and scale in this space gives us a lot of ability to advocate for our vendors and in terms of overdrive which is the uh, middle image you see on the slide there um, we are their poster child for how to manage and curate e-collections so when they're talking to other public library services around the world about how to do it they point to Auckland libraries pages what we can purchase in e is not in print is not always available in e so as i mentioned this is about a balance publishers can pull e-content at any time 
Um, and we have a very popular um, e-newspaper platform called Press Reader. Some of you may use it. A few years ago, Stuff and NZME changed the model by which Aucklanders could access their titles on that platform. So these things are not always in our control. So while we advocate, um, we can't always change the rules because those organisations have commercial models that they're working to. In terms of the content that we own ourselves and digitise and make available to Aucklanders, Kura Heritage Collections Online is the most significant one and one of the images is up there on your slides on the left. So in the time period that we're reporting on, we had 230,000 interactions on that platform. We have approximately 1.4 million records in that platform growing every day. And um, digitising the images is perhaps the easiest part of making the access um, available to Aucklanders. It's about the metadata and the description and the platform and everything else that goes on behind making that content available that is important. Every time we improve the access points, we see a bump upwards in the usage. This is unique content. It's also available via Google. So if you were looking for something in our, for instance, Sir George Grey collections, manuscripts, photos, letters, maps, archives, you don't need to come into our Auckland Library's website to access that. And that speaks a little to the change that in the way customers are using our services. They don't necessarily have to come into our world to get to it. You can do a search on Google right now and look for Sir George Grey letters and you'll find something pop up that takes you directly into Kura Heritage Collections Online. The other element that's been really important to us are our social media channels. So not only um, social media for getting important operational messages out, but also for the content we create ourselves and we promote through our own channels. So that's podcasts um, and video content that we put up on SoundCloud and YouTube. And you can see there that those interactions are quite significant nearly 390,000 in our reporting period, and they continue to grow. So this, this is work that we continue to do, and we adjust weekly, looking at how people are using these services, and we make adjustments accordingly. Happy to answer any questions about that. The world of E is quite complex, but you're speaking to a librarian, so I can go into detail if you want. Uh, a couple of very significant um, and transformational programs of work that we've been working on also for a number of years. Um, the first is automation of our collections management um, and introducing some artificial information intelligence into this process. So we started working on this project several years ago. In fact, the image you see on the screen there on the right is Tefeki, the octopus our central sorter, which is the largest centralised library sorter in the Southern Hemisphere. This was implemented during the pandemic and during lockdowns, completely safely, I might add. Um, this was the beginning of a transformational project to automate the movement of our collections around Auckland. So on any one day in Auckland, we'll, we'll have between 8 and 10,000 items moving around the city to meet customer demand. So what the intelligence part of the next stage of this project is going to do is make sure we get items into the right places. So basically increasing our return on investment in the books we have. To give you an example of that, we have um, what we call community language collections, which are very significant and important to Aucklanders. They are not languages that all are appropriate for all places in Auckland. So for instance, in Mount Albert and Panmure, Customers there want to use all six of the Indian language collections we have. Devonport Takapuna, not so much. So it's of little value in us having those books sitting in those places. So the intelligence part of the system lets us get items to the right places. The other benefits of this service is that it will significantly reduce the manual handling that our staff do in libraries, and it's going to ensure privacy requirements are met for patrons. The other significant program around efficiency and better service for customers is the Council Customer Services Integration, now live at 13 of our sites. This is about ensuring customers get a really good customer experience and they basically can come to one of those facilities and do a range of activities they want to fulfil in one place. So it's a face-to-face -face channel incorporating many aspects of council services. 
There's an ongoing piece of work now to balance um, our workforce as a result of the impacts of these services to make sure we've got the balance right um, and in the right places. We're also paying particular attention to communities of greatest need as we think about balancing the workforce across our 56 libraries, but also all of the other facilities we manage. Oh, no. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I just want to speak just to three of the, um, the items here about delivering through partnership. We mentioned earlier that a quarter of our programs and events are delivered by partners in our communities. Um, one is the, the top right there, Skinny Jump, in, in conjunction with the Digital Inclusion Alliance. So Skinny Jump is a low-cost prepaid broad, broadband service offered by um, Skinny, which is part of Spark. They, um, Spark don't have a distribution mechanism, so our libraries effectively act as a, uh, as a distribution and a place where people can come to get, get skilled advice about, a, about how to use this broadband at home. Someone asked me during the week when I was sharing this um, whether um, it had much impact. So I can tell you that for the 3,818 homes and families that have got internet connection at home that they didn't have and couldn't afford before that have been assisted by our staff, that has a huge impact. You imagine having a family of young people trying to do homework these days or if you're trying to access your, your banking, the ability to have low cost internet at home when you can't afford it is, is significant. Uh, Besties, so this is a, a, a reading initiative that Auckland Libraries developed in conjunction with some publishers in New Zealand. So this was last August and featured exclusively Auckland authors and it catapulted several into the top 10, a top 20 most borrowed book list for the first time, knocking off our usual triumvirate of, uh, of Lee Child, Michael Connolly and David Baldashi. So, um, so that was a, a significant benefit, not just to our customers, but to emerging and established Auckland authors. And even now, that's still um, a significant portion of that top 20 list. And then the other one is these, um, these results here. These are the very recent results of collaborations with communities and with the publishing ecosystem. These are um, largely children's books in, lang in Auckland's languages, Auckland's diverse languages that wouldn't normally be published because they're probably not normally commercially viable. But with Auckland libraries acting as kind of the conductor of the orchestra, we've been able to create all this content that's now available in languages that are, um, that are used in the homes of a lot of Aucklanders and are now available in libraries, um, including, including a very important one about um, being ready in one of our Pacific languages, for um, which was a co-production with Auckland Emergency Management, all with uh, Auckland Council attribution on the uh, on the cover. And then, um, so that's that for partnerships, which and partnerships are nothing new for libraries. We've been doing partnerships for ages, and, and we're doing more. So, last slide. Um, I'm conscious of time, so there's plenty of information there, but perhaps the key one that I wanted to point out was in the, the six or the seven months actually to the end of January, the 80, almost 83,000 children, parents and caregivers attending our, um, our predominantly literacy related programs, early learning programs. The, that's equivalent to about 922 electric double-decker buses parked, or not, actually not parked, they'd be driving along, wouldn't they, the, um, the Northern Busway. So um, you know, that's a lot of children and their, and their whanau coming in to progress their, their early literacy. Um, and literacy, we're, we're part of the literacy ecosystem. We don't own li literacy just because we're libraries, but we play a really important role along with schools and other organisations to make sure that we've got literate Aucklanders that can participate in society. So that's us, and we're, we're available for any questions you might have. Actually, I want questions. Uh, we've got a question from the previous one, more Karuna's team, but thank you for the library promotion. 
um, Ken Turner. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to everybody for their hard work. And I want to be constructive with this question, um, and my question will be, how do we dig deep? Thank you. Um, I asked to have those put up. You put up a picture of a statue that had been cleaned and put back. There's the before, and there's the after. The after cost us $116,980. You know, that concrete slab there for $64,555 would only just quite cover the top of that camera stand. It's got two four-metre legs underneath it still reinforced. One is absolutely arguable by anybody unnecessary. So when I look at the figures you tell me, this is why I came here, this is why I was sent here by the public, when I look at the figures you tell me, I wonder how much we could do it cheaper. How do these reports dig deeper into the actual delivery costs in a way that we could analyse them better? Thank you. Um, Daryl, it's... Yeah. I think we've had the library bits. If I was you, I'd run safely back to the... <laughs> To the, Just, into your uh, little nook and cranny and read a book, mate. Point, point of order, Chair. Um, <laughs> point of order, has this information been emailed to the staff in advance? Because this is really not the subject of a governing body meeting. This is, this is management, you know, political No, I think this is a very acceptable question. Uh, probably more in some ways that, that this is a decision-making body and uh, uh, possibly the last... Uh, um, marketing exercise from the library was probably not really more suited here, but I think finding out these sorts of things well, is a very good question. Has this information been conveyed by the simple form of email requesting the staff? It, yes, it has, several times. Look, I, I'm gonna, this question up here, I'm ruling that we're going to listen to it. Please. So, uh, look, I don't know the specifics of this particular project, uh, but I know we are asking questions and hoping to get uh, Taryn Crew and her operations manager online uh, with an answer for that. Um, uh, yes, but I don't have the specific answer to that uh, question right now. No, look, I, I mean, I'm accepting of the, the point within the question. Um, I don't know the history with this. Um, I'd have to suspect that there is some visibility at a local board level with the project, but there's a presumption in that, and we're racing to get somebody who might be able to answer the question for you. If that can't happen right in this session, then uh, I promise we'll come back to you with um, some clarity, Councillor. Thank you. So my point is just challenging what we're talking about today. Thank you. Hey, drop it. All right, we're going to get an answer to that question to you and I'll be interested in what it was in myself. Uh, uh, Councillor Watson's got another one. Yeah, this is for the, for the library team, um, for, for Daryl. Oh, it's here. Musical, James, go on, you guys, flee. Musical cheers. <coughs> He's behind you, uh, Councillor, so just one second. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so thanks for the presentation, Daryl, and, and in it you, you referred to the the, the increasing importance of the connection, identity and belonging our libraries are providing. And um, certainly from my perspective, in the context of the council withdrawing any other kind of civic function, so the, the ward I represent, you know, the, 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 the council businesses are hopped off. There is no real council presence there, other you know, for a population of 120,000 people. But there is a library, and, and what I would appreciate a little clarification on is the, the, the central important role that your library staff are now fulfilling in activities and interactions with members of the public that go way beyond um, just clientele, school groups, um, you know, elderly people, students, but, in, but increasingly people who, who are really disconnected from society. And what I would like to know is, uh, given that, you know, that incredibly important interface with, with the community, um, how staff are, are coping and, and what support they get, 
and what provision is going forward for that role that is only going to increase, particularly in these areas where the, the council is cut and run? Thank you, Councillor Watson. Yes, there's, uh, there's no question that libraries play a really important role in, in the, right across society. And as, I, as I mentioned, they're, the, they're really the last bastion of warm physical spaces where people can come and, uh, and be welcomed and not, not have to, to pay to enter. The, even, even before COVID, because of our welcoming and inclusive um, way that we, the way that libraries operate, they've, they've always attracted a very wide range of people. And sometimes we, we have people that deal with mental health issues, which you might be referring to. And since, since COVID, there's no question that, that um, our, our ability to help those people has become even more important, but that also brings some challenges with it as well. So we, we, we continue to invest in um, staff training and capability around how to, how to recognise how to um, how to respond to and how to look after themselves in terms of um, working with with people that might be dealing with mental health issues. We've got pretty clear uh, processes about when we get involved. Uh, perhaps when we have to escalate that to um, police or, or other agencies. But at the same time, as uh, recognising that that yes our people perhaps are at more risk throughout their daily work than, than we are sitting here, that by, by their nature, people who work in libraries desperately want to help these people and are, are trained to help these people to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, and, and then of course, in, outside of libraries in the Connected Communities um, Department, we have other parts, we have other units and teams that are working with um, a range of different people, including homeless people, um, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Furley, please. Uh, kia ora, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, team, for um, the report. I just wanted to pick up on some points you made um, around the library's work um, in that digital divide space um, in providing, partnering with Spark and providing the skinny jump um, uh, internet connection. And I know that for my communities, it's been a real game changer. And that during COVID, we, we, we know that the digital divide became something that people were very, very aware of. So I really commend you for that work. I just wanted to ask for people who might be listening as well, is the program still going? Is that partnership still going? And if it is, how do people join? I know there's a big push out in my area, but it may be available across the rest of Auckland. I'm not, I'm not sure. So it'd be good to have that detail. And then also, is there a cost to council itself? Um, and um, are you able to tell us, you know, maybe is there a benefit that, or what benefits have you seen? And is that able to be put into dollar amounts as well for us? Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Furley, and it's great to hear that it's, it's making a difference in your community. Um, it's, it's available right, right across Auckland, right across New Zealand, actually, but we, um, we're the main player when it comes to connecting people with this service and these modems in, in Auckland. It's ongoing. Um, there's no direct cost to council. Our people are going to be there helping people do things right throughout the, uh, all the things that happen in a library during a normal day and um, helping people connect with Skinny Jump is, is part of that. Um, so what was that, the, part, the last part of your question? Um, so if people do want to join, how do they do okay, that? Okay, that's right, yeah. So the Skinny Jump have some criteria for families to qualify um, to, to receive what is, what is very um, cheap internet at home. And so um, we, we work out in the community to, to let other agencies know that this is available. And, um, and so they often refer families to us. Um, of course, we, we have lots of connections ourselves with communities, so we, we, we're promoting it, and our staff are promoting it to, um, to whānau. Um, and then it's just a really a matter of sitting down with, um, with a family member and, and um, giving them the modem, explaining how to, how to connect it, um, working with them to understand um, how to get it working. And then, of course, once you've got the, the modem, if you haven't used, if you haven't got an email account before, or you've never used a web browser, you've never used Google, which is often the case, 
our, it's, it's our skilled staff that are helping people to understand and taking them through. This is how you set up an email account. You know, it's impossible to do just about anything with that email. So this is how you set up an email account. This is, this is how you search for things. This is what a browser is. And, and that's, that's what we do. Kia ora, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one last one. I'm conscious of time before everyone asks long questions, please. Uh, that there's a bit of pressure on us hearing from the um, Eden Park body I'm going to bring forward next. They have some problem with someone leaving shortly, so please can you make your questions reasonably short and your answers also. Walker, please, Councillor Walker. Of course, a fairly short question. Um, we've just got a, a long-term plan uh, pr uh, process underway. One of the locations that we promote are libraries for people to um, drop off the forms. But it's come to my attention that you can only drop off the forms to a very limited number of libraries that happen to have a service centre function. And that is not obvious to, um, to people. Um, uh, so my, my question is around what it would entail in terms of costs um, uh, and effort for libraries generally to be able to accept um, uh, forms. Uh, for example, in my community, you can drop one off to Ariwa, you can drop one off to Takapuna, you can't drop one off to Browns Bay, and the local service centres close down, and, and this repeats around Auckland, and it makes it quite difficult for people. I'll give a short answer. Um, so I, I, I don't know what's written on the form in terms of where to drop those off, but there's absolutely nothing standing in the way of forms being given to our staff and us um, finding a way to get those from any library to where they need to go. And I'll, I'll pick up the more general issue with the engagement team, Councillor. Uh, my direct experience is that people have been turned away. Um, okay, thank I'll, you for that, Councillor Bartley, and then we're going to Eden Park. Okay, cool. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. I really wanted to know, like I'm picking up on your presentation, you talked about how the Indian books are um, popular in some libraries, not in other libraries. Would you say that all our libraries have got uh, value in addressing the different needs of their own communities in their own ways? And also, are you satisfied with how we're getting the information of the full picture of what our libraries do around literacy, not just... Um, books taken out of a library, but everything a library does for literacy. And also, has there been an increase in the numbers to the programs that you're running, given the high cost of living and the financial struggles people are going? The library seems to be the only place where you can do free activities during the holidays. So thank you. OK, I'll try and keep that, that brief as well. Um, so in terms of the programs, yes, we, um, we are probably one of the, the few places that families on lowish incomes can have children participate in something meaningful and useful and educational during a, a school holidays, and that will continue. Um, sorry, what was the first part? I was so focused on the end part of your question, Councillor. I missed the first part. Um, was it fair to say that all our libraries are meeting the needs oh, yes, of the yeah. different communities? So in the, we all know that there's not just one Auckland and, we don't, and therefore we don't take a cookie cutter approach to the services and the, even the collections that we have in libraries. They're tailored based on our, our insights of communities from community snapshots, the, um, the intel that our staff have of their communities. So if you, if you walk into uh, a, a library that's got a certain percentage of an ethnicity, for example, we will make sure that there's, lang there's languages that reflect that in the collection. We have staff that <coughs> understand the language and, cu and cultures of the different mix in, in different communities. And so yeah, I, I, there's always ways that we can improve, but we're, we're always refining and looking at communities and, uh, and seeing how we can best respond because what we're doing in Devonport Takapuna, it was, might be great for them, that might not be appropriate for Manarewa. But still very important for Devonport, very important for... Indeed, yeah. indeed. So every library's got its value. Yeah. I, the way I describe it to our team is that there's some, there's some menu items that we have to offer everywhere. So like if you go to McDonald's around the world, you're always going to expect to see a Big Mac. But, um, we, we, but I tell our, our teams that we, we, we've got to have some Big Macs, we've got to have internet access, 
we've got to have um, you know public computers, but it, all the all the different local board areas and libraries are, are really encouraged to use their own herbs and spices to come up with programs and responses and collections that um, that meet the needs of the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that and for your presentation. I'm going to um, move that we receive that, and it's going to be seconded by Councillor Bartley. All those in favour, please say aye. I think. Contrary, thank you very much. We're going to move to item 10 and I welcome uh, Nick Sauntner and his team and Nick's CFO one is under some time pressure so perhaps you might like to lead this off <coughs> with the finance. We're interested in the finances rather than the marketing of pink, thank you. All those who got a freebie from here, put your hands up. Quite a few did, apparently, but not me. Um, kia ora koutou. Good morning, Your Worship and Councillors. So I will pretty much cut, cut straight to the chase, but just a reminder that you received this um, update from Eden Park on their performance in accordance with resolutions that the Finance and Performance Committee made some time ago, requiring this to be reported six monthly. We have Nick and Brett here, who will take you through their presentation. Um, and I'll take the report largely as read noting um, so a few key figures around uh, operating profit uh, for 31 October and uh, the net adjusted deficit for the year. Uh, the drawn loan balance on the facility that they have with Council remains steady and uh, Eden Park continue to pay interest on that facility with that loan balance due on the 30th of September 2029. So I will now hand over those boring bits aside, I'll hand over to Nick and Brett. Thank you. Uh, Morani, good morning everybody. Um, I'd just like to um, provide a summary of the financial performance uh, for the financial year into 2023. When we last uh, presented to the governing body, the, those figures were forecast, they were prior to uh, the completion of the annual audit. So I'll just summarise those numbers for you now. <clears throat> Uh, the first column on the left is our, um, the top line figures from our annual report and you can see that there are some fairly high numbers with respect to operating profit and expenses. Um, then we have net interest and uh, the depreciation charges which include a significant um, figure for impairment. So just a, a few quick notes to explain. Um, we of course uh, suffered the um, uh, insurance issues around the flood in January 2023. Um, during the course of the year, we have been advanced funds uh, by the insurers in order to cover costs. Uh, the funds that have been utilised uh, for claims payments are reflected in the top line numbers for income and expenditure um, equally and um, opposite each other. So there's over eight and a half million dollars of claims um, accepted and paid, uh, I should say the, the acceptance is a, is a, a preliminary ex acceptance, the claim hasn't been finalised or completed, uh, so the funds that have been advanced have been done so um, on more or less an ex gratia uh, basis um, uh, and goodwill. Uh, we were um, provided $15 million of uh, advance payments in order to meet costs um, in the pipeline for the insurance. Um, uh, recovery work which is ongoing uh, and 8.5 had been spent as at balance date. Um, so that inflates the uh, revenues and expenditures uh, extraordinarily in the year. Um, we've also incurred $32.5 million of depreciation and impairment um, of that. The impairment charges were $21.7 million and that uh, consisted of our estimate of the underlying costs of um, the assets that have been uh, lost or damaged in the, um, in the flood. That amounted to $12.5 million. Um, and we've also uh, impaired redundant assets that were uh, replaced during the course of the upgrades that took place uh, prior to the uh, FIFA Women's World Cup. Um, this included the replacement of the lights, of the uh, stadium lights, uh, the old screens, CCTV cameras, turnstiles, and a range of other um, projects that um, 
uh, were, were um, completed in preparation for the event to make sure that the stadium was uh, fit for purpose, um, safety aspects were improved and so forth. Uh, so the second column there is our adjusted result. Uh, the adjustments include exclusion of grant funding from IMBI of about $4.3 million, which, is, which was a revenue item, uh, and have also adjusted out the, the impairment charges. So the critical number I'd just like to focus on there is the um, net operating profit in the adjusted column of $8.2 million. That represents our real financial performance in the year. It excludes the IMBI grant funding. Um, after uh, recording that operating profit, uh, we've incurred interest costs, which bring us to a profit before depreciation of $7.3 million. Um, and I'd just like to focus on that uh, number for a few moments and make some comments uh, in respect to our balance sheet. Um, the $7.3 million was effectively spent in its entirety uh, in ensuring that those range of projects, the, the improvements um, took place. Um, we, uh, in our annual cash flow, we incurred $11.4 million, almost $11.5 million um, of costs for property, plant and equipment, um, of which, as I mentioned, 4.3 was provided by IMBI, and the balance is roughly $7 million, which equates to the profit before depreciation. So the trust invested all of its operating surplus um, on those uh, upgrades to our, finance, to our assets in the year. Um, I would then um, draw attention to the, um, the high balance of cash and cash equivalents we held at year end. Um, at year end, we held $11.4 million of cash and cash equivalents. That's an increase of $8 million over the prior year. And the reason for that is the balance of funds from the insurers that were unspent at year end was held for, uh, to cover the uh, insurance project uh, pipeline um, as had been approved by the adjusters uh, for the insurance companies uh, who underwrite our losses. So we did hold a high cash uh, uh, <clears throat> balance at year end. Uh, the reason was that those funds were uh, extended to us on an ex gratia basis by the insurers and so they were ring fenced um, as is our, uh, our policy with respect to money received in advance. Um, within the current liability section of our balance sheet, we also have a balance of income in advance of $11.4 million, equivalent to the uh, carried value of cash. Um, so uh, that covers us uh, for the, the, the types of re revenues that we receive in advance, uh, particularly for concerts, uh, memberships and so forth, uh, which haven't been earned, and uh, if uh, an event should take place, such as uh, the postponement of the concert by the weekend in December, uh, those funds are repayable. So uh, we need to maintain them as liquid um, at, um, at the um, year end, the financial year end. Looking to 2024, uh, an entirely different forecast, um, you'll see that our uh, budget on the right-hand side included um, a net operating profit of $1.7 million and after interest, $600,000. Um, the second to right-hand column is the current forecast. Uh, we um, incurred, as I say, the postponement of a major event in December, which is a concert by an artist called The Weekend. And as a consequence of that, we're running behind our budget year to date, although we have made some gains uh, to get to a position where we are forecasting above a break-even. Those are the January numbers that we provided to uh, Treasury um, in accordance with our um, quarterly reporting of the um, interest cover covenant on our loan. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, in the month of February, we made some further gains towards getting back to our, our budget for the year. Um, I'd now, now like to pass to... Nick for the next slide. Uh, 
Morena, and um, I'd just like to first acknowledge the sad passing of Fesso Collins. Um, Fesso was someone that um, we had uh, a strong relationship with uh, over a number of years, and uh, uh, I'm sure it affected everyone around the table, but certainly from an Eden Park perspective, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I'll move on to some uh, very positive uh, stories here, uh, Mr Mayor, but I also note the sense of the room, and we will be very quick. Um, Eden Park is a truly hybrid, multi-purpose facility, um, and uh, since we last reported, you can see the nature of our business um, has significantly changed. 70% of our attendance over the past 12 months was not part of our attendance only five years ago. The shift towards a multi-purpose hybrid facility uh, aligns with, uh, I suppose, the changing demographic of all Auckland, but also the expectations around the experience economy. So whether it be going from freestyle kings into to rugby league, um, golf being played at the stadium, cricket, um, and then the Phoenix recently with our 18,000 odd attendants undefeated at the Fortress. And um, we've already spoken about Pink, but uh, Pink was a phenomenal success at the park. Coincidentally, um, and linking into our previous uh, presentation, we are looking at a reading at the park event um, with various authors, so we'll be able to work in with the libraries. As far as our community engagement, it has been a strength of uh, the park over the past seven years. Um, we do a variety of fundraising initiatives. They are listed here, whether it be the Auckland City Mission, um, right through to public events on the number one oval, and then um, events such as the Make-A-Wish Foundation, whether it be through um, alignments with the likes of a Dan Carter or indeed with Pink. Um, a number of other charitable opportunities arise with our activities. Um, we are a charitable trust and we don't give, um, obviously, sponsorship or cash, but we do provide experiences for a number of organisations, including schools and charities, to do fundraising activities. Our investment in um, the asset is something that we're very proud of and we are leading the way in terms of our um, sensory room uh, as a legacy from the, the FIFA Women's World Cup and we are looking to upgrade to a second area. Our, um, also, um, one of the key areas that we've focused on is around mobility. We have comfort zones now throughout the venue where people with mobility issues have heating as well as screens and a cordoned off area across the entire price range and categories, but also with the increase in neurodiverse um, attendees, partnering with the likes of Ken Arts High to provide um, earplugs for, for attendees and areas to break out. And um, I'm not going to go through, uh, obviously, a number of um, the feedback and, and comments raised, but this is definitely an area that um, we've grown and, uh, and continue to prosper. With regard to some stadium upgrades, we are moving towards um, a variety of stadium upgrades. Um, that includes uh, some works on the Lower West End and, and also uh, reviewing down at the Eastern End. This is fantastic for the city. It could increase our capacity from between five and 10,000 patrons for sporting and also concert events. And obviously, when we get to the economic benefits from um, the likes of our major events, um, those five to 10,000 extra patrons will be material for the city. I'm not going to talk too much to um, the, the resource consent and the work we're undertaking. It's been um, extensively publicised around some of the challenges we still face with our resource consent. We do have 97 plus percent support from the community and uh, we are working closely with both council and government to make those changes needed uh, to ensure that the city doesn't miss out on events moving forward. With regard to Pink, I heard people talking about Eden Pink and um, a number of the initiatives undertaken. Um, this was something that we wanted to ensure that the city embraced the event. Um, we have a number of examples of um, whether it be 27 um, people coming up from Wellington as a group and, and staying in the city and, and spending in the city. Um, we are really looking at being a, a monopoly for major events um, and competing against the likes of the MCG and a core stadium with our increased capacity. It was fantastic to see the city embrace it. Uh, the one just on the, the bottom left-hand side, I do want to touch on that, uh, was Colour Me in Sunshine. Um, that was covered through the back house areas of um, Pink's dressing rooms. We had over 500 kids participate in that program and uh, even um, Pink's children painted in a piano that will be a legacy here at the park. 
As far as uh, occupancy of hotels, um, we've been advised that 97% occupancy of hotels on the Friday night and 94%. Um, there may well be even um, some increase um, to that based on some data that I believe Auckland Unlimited has. Also, the positivity arising out of um, the, the shows. I do think that we need to focus on um, being proudly Auckland and the piece around um, events and the importance of events to the DNA of a city. We want a city to live, stay and play, and we think that we can play a really important part in that place process. Um, again, I won't read through the comments. The comments, um, you are right, uh, um, Mayor Brown, there was a number of councillors who did attend. Um, you are always welcome at Eden Park, as you know. and. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, very happy to provide chauffeur-driven services on the way out for anyone else around the table. As far as I, I quickly moved on, if you uh, if you noticed, um, in terms of our partnerships, um, some of our partnerships, as I mentioned, are, are leading the world. Um, we're very proud of our association with the University of Auckland. We're looking at um, research, teaching, learning, fostering um, new global programs, um, particularly in the um, stadium management space. 20 years ago when I started, or 25 years ago when I started the industry, it was very much an embryonic industry, um, lifting the knowledge and the standard, but also the utilisation of the stadium. Uh, is critical, and when we understand the carbon implications and the investment in carbon to build stadiums, they must be um, the equivalent of uh, the, the, the town hall or the church moving forward in terms of bringing people together. They are not just for sporting events, uh, they are for all of Auckland and New Zealand. Um, Live Nation's been an outstanding partner of ours uh, this year. They'll bring seven shows to the park with obviously the two postponed weekend. Uh, and then I just wanted to touch on Permobile. Um, I know some councillors came to our Permobile um, event. Uh, that attracted a, around 1,000 attendees to Eden Park, demonstrating our ability to host mobility and accessibility activities at our national stadium. Uh, in terms of sustainability, we touch on this uh, regularly and our um, commitment to sustainability, um, and that, that links into our vision for Eden Park 2.1 and um, the carbon emissions associated with glass, steel and concrete, um, and the need for adaptive reuse. For those of you who haven't been to the B201 building at the University of Auckland, I encourage you to do so. Um, the highest uh, six-star green energy in the country, but it actually demonstrates what we're planning to deliver with our north and west end redevelopments and um, aligning with the climate emergency and putting a roof on the park. As far as our a sustainability action plan, we work with um, a Harvard graduate uh, to put together that plan. Believe it or not, she's based in uh, Las Vegas and um, that program now links in with our community garden and only on Sunday we had our community in to talk through our community garden and um, the future of our community composting at uh, Eden Park. A number of our partners also participate in that space and um, for those who go to the retail areas at Eden Park, all our packaging is compostable. It is coloured to the, the various events that we have and then working with Samsung, we do regular e-waste collections uh, for the community to drop off. Um, we do see ourselves as um, an opportunity to expand our revenues. It is something that we've been doing both locally and internationally. I mentioned 70% of our attendance and revenues wasn't part of the business model uh, five years ago. We envisage over the next three years, 30% of our revenue will come from outside the four walls of Eden Park, whether it be doing consulting in the turf management industry, management of other facilities, or indeed um, demonstrating licensing opportunities through some of the innovation that we create. You have all seen our vision and mission previously, but I just wanted to emphasise the importance of being multi-purpose. Our game plan, uh, again, is something that um, you see around the walls of Eden Park. It's about being the benchmark on and off the field, and um, the number one priority for us is customer service. But when you have 100,000 plus people coming through the venue and 3,000 casual staff, we do also need to ensure the safety of those patrons, so attention to detail is critical also. So those values and behaviours are seen and uh, communicated throughout our business. Our strategic priorities over the next um, few years uh, will emphasise um, the seven priorities and um, again I won't talk to those other than to say we're on track in each of those nine strategic priorities. 
For those of you that uh, aren't aware, we do uh, a number of art events at Eden Park. We have the Art Battle Grand Final. We have an artist in residence on site for our major events. We've got obviously Super Rugby Garden Shows, um, All Blacks content, and uh, and Coldplay at the end of the year, where we'll see um, over 160,000 patrons come to our city over three days. So. Um, I'm mindful that Brett does need to make a plane with our airline partner, Qatar Airways. He is paying for that flight. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, well, there are five, but um, Brett wants to go pretty soon. So has anyone got a financial question amongst those five? Finances, we'll go to the um, Councillor Newman's just fine and, and Councillor Darby's and then we'll go to the other ones. Thank, thanks, Brent, for the summary of the financial report. Um, so just looking ahead, so because uh, I think this is pretty good, it's a pretty, it's not a bad performance compared to some, I suspect. But um, okay, so the, moving forward, the financial year, next one is going to be a bit of a tough one, obviously, because of the economic climate that we're in. Moving forward beyond that, um, how do you think that that would be looking? Um, and um, yeah, congratulations on being able to move that surplus capital towards complete, um, completing some of those upgrades. So that's the first question I've got to follow up. Perhaps it's for Sarah, I'm not sure. Brent? So, so this is, uh, look, this is essentially, I guess I could say, a steady state type of um, uh, budget and forecast for the current period, but the, the um, prospect is that we will enjoy uh, greater content moving forward, looking at the pipeline of events that Nick has lined up. And if we can survive at this level with the content we've got in the current year, then I think it's only um, only going to improve uh, from there, especially with the um, the prospect of expansion into other um, revenue sources that uh, we're not reflecting in our current results. OK, well, my follow-up question, Brent, because you've got to basically run a balance sheet, which is cash in, cash out, it's transactional, it has to be... It's, it's your money, you've got to really target and report on that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, Sarah, if this is actually a question for you. Um, I, I kind of get para 12, okay. Um, but with respect to the reporting, the we're, we're referring to $2.1 million of, of investment from, from Tartaki. And then we're brackets Eden Park. Now, I'm actually struggling to understand how that, that is accounted. Is that accounted in Brent's balance sheet? I suspect it's not, which means that there's a bit of an assumption that we are spending in that in that particular space as well. And I'm just not quite sure how that money reconciles in terms of the balance sheet, or is it more of a statement of uh, sort of me too, the family's in Freedom Park and we're wanting to jump on the jump on this conversation. How how does how does that get how does that money, that two point one million, get reflected in Brent's balance sheet, or is it a broader statement about what what it is that we like to think that we're achieving? I, I'll offer a comment and maybe get Brett to um, to chime in. But um, it's really here just to illustrate the um, the good working relationship that Tartaki and Eden Park are building in terms of not only uh, Eden Park delivering great exp um, experiences and events, but how the council group family supports that through the major events fund to attract um, quality events that come to Auckland, a number of which take place in Eden Park as our, as our biggest stadium. Um, my understanding is it does not come through your balance sheet. That's really through the events fund, through to the promoters to bring um, attract that content there. So. Well, can I just get one clarify then? Is, is that... So the money through the events fund for um, promoter attraction, I mean, what line of sight does Eden Park have to that? Or do they not have... You know, I mean, it just seems to me to be a bit sort of... I'm not quite sure. Do they have access to it or not? If they don't have access to it, it seems a bit inefficient. And if they do have... you know, But, but I don't, I'm not sure if that number should be reported here because it doesn't look like it's Eden Park and they're not getting the funding. My understanding is, uh, Councillor Newman, that's across all events across the entire city. Um, it doesn't reflect in any of our figures and we, aren't, we don't have visibility. I would say that we are working closely with Auckland Unlimited to, moving forward 
and um, over the last 12 months to try and attract more events to the city. Um, but I'm just not sure of the breakdown as to how much of that is allocated to promotion or events at Eden Park versus other facilities. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor Darby. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Brent. Can I just unpack, um, I'll just find it now. Um, you've got other operational income of, of 99. Um, previous year was about 18. And then you've got um, um, operational expenses of 85, previous year zero. Can you just unpack that number? It's, it's, not, it's not there, it's, uh, it's actually on your, um, in your published document. Uh, I think it Sorry, is on 44, 44 of the annual report. So I'm referring to the top left of 44. And good to see the uh, event income growing there, Nick. Um, and also, it's good to see that uh, other operational income growing substantially, but the, I'm pointing out the expenses on that operational income have gone from nothing to 8.5. Yeah, so, so that figure there is the 8.5 of insurance monies that um, I referred to. So that's, that's the cost okay, of the Okay, I couldn't pairs, see that in the footnote. In okay, that's explained. Yep, that's okay, it. Okay, thank you. And I'll come back for another question after the financials. Thank you. I guess the only financial one, so you might as well give us your other question, and then if the finance guy has to go, you can go, mate. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, finance guy. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Um, just in t my, my other question is, Nick, um, I just want to acknowledge um, with my AT hat on maybe, but, um, you know, working together with Auckland Transport on integrated ticketing with the, um, con the content providers, I think that's um, a really good lead on uh, Eden Park Trust's uh, part. Um, on that note, the, the bus hub, which was on your plan before, um, the bus hub, um, did that receive any um, support from Auckland Transport in the design or, or the workings of it? Uh, or was that an initiative totally of, of the parks, the bus hub? My understanding is that it was entirely an Eden Park project. It was part of the redevelopment, so it was funded through the redevelopment back in uh, 2010. Um, and I don't believe there's been any um, significant changes to the bus hub in that time. I may be incorrect, but nothing that I can recall. That, and it, it's, it's a big attraction. I mean, it, it really makes the park much more efficiently accessible. At a recent concert, it was not available, though, and we did have some transport issues on that day. For the... For what was the reason that the bus hub was not available? So it's a big area, it's designed to move people in and out, and it was not available for the pink concert. Um, is it because of the constraints of uh, hosting a concert and the, the requirement of having logistics in that area to support all the you know, containers and everything else that goes with a concert? Are we likely to see, say, for Coldplay, the bus hub not accessible or any other event? Thanks for your question. And just to clarify, um, we met with, oh, I met with um, both Dean Kempton and Nick Hill following the first pink show. Um, the service provision was unacceptable and even subsequently there was a suggestion of um, 45 minutes being the key performance indicator to clear people. Now, I've worked in the industry for 25 years and that's never been a key performance indicator that I've seen anywhere in the world. Um, for the privilege for the promoter, the promoter's charged around $100,000 an event for integrated ticketing, um, something that doesn't occur in most cities around the world. Um, the public transport system did fail uh, for the first show. There was improvements made. My understanding is that there was um, some infrastructure issues um, associated with the Kingsland Railway Station that didn't enable um, our patrons to leave the venue. Um, the venue cleared in 14 minutes. Um, the capacity from the bus hub was um, compensated on Sandringham Road with greater capacity. So there was no inference or implication in terms of the buses. A lot of the time now, and, and CRL will do this as well, that um, 
you won't have buses direct to the North Shore. We want buses direct to the North Shore, but the Auckland Transport Plan sends people back into town and then they distribute it from town. So I'd encourage you to um, encourage Auckland Transport to revisit that. As far as construction for concerts, we try and mitigate the impact on the residential area and um, we're still working through, we're only sort of six concerts in to our, um, our consent, but uh, the improvements we've made working with the residents around um, bump in and bump out, the preference from the residents is actually to work 24 seven and get it done. At the moment, our consenting doesn't enable that. So we stretch out the bump in for longer periods and actually then utilize areas that shouldn't necessarily be done so. So that's something we're working through with our consenting process. So the bus parking bay was used for a boneyard because um, Pink had a show in Melbourne on Tuesday and had to get a lot of that equipment out. Again, we work with the residents, our current consent um, restricts us to send a truck every 15 minutes out after a concert. So as you can imagine, they've got 17 trucks ready to go and they have to then wait four to six hours to send them out. So we worked with our residents and got that amended. So as soon as the trucks were full, they could leave and people could go to sleep. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done around public transport. Um, we've put in a submission to the long-term plan around the, just flagging the Kingsland um, footbridge. Kings and Railway Station, our planners have told us, will be the single greatest beneficiary of CRL, yet there hasn't been um, too much work invested around what that's going to do to, to Kings and Railway Station. There has been about crossings in recent days. Um, so we're excited by CRL. We want it to open. Over 60% of our patrons are coming via public transport. We think we can get it in excess of 85% in future. Just in summary, is there an ongoing constraint um, in the bus hub area with concerts, is, is, or is it just pink, or are we likely to see other concerts uh, take up the bus hub for logistical purposes? You've explained pink, you've said that they, there's truck movement restrictions. Uh, there's obviously a footprint of land there that is required to host a concert, which impedes, it does impede, because people came to me saying, I didn't take the bus because I went there and there was nothing happening, I walked to the train station. So, the, so in terms of we're working with specific promoters, and it will depend upon Ed Sheeran, by way of example, was a 360 degree stage. This show was a Western End stage. Billy Joel was an Eastern End stage. So it does vary from event to event. We're also looking at utilising the outer oval. So again, under our consent, there are designated areas as to where we can use this boneyard. We actually want to change that to include also the outer oval um, so that, again, less truck movements, less forklift movements, but also less of the impediment, for example, on a bus parking bay. So our preference is for buses to be on in the bus parking bay, but it really comes down to each production. And, and I'm happy to give you a bit more detail after today's meeting on that. Good question, good answer. Councillor Walker. Sure, uh, just two or three things quickly. Uh, just around the, the background to this loan, would it be helpful for clarification to actually cover off that the reason for that loan is the reneging of the grant that the legacy councils should have made? Would that be helpful? That has been commented on previously, and obviously um, I have a view on that. I was involved at the venue at the time, um, and Eden Park currently pays interest on that loan. Sure. Um, so that clarification would be useful. Uh, the other um, question I've got just goes to your mention of the, um, the hybrid uh, nature of what you're proposing, which is both a retractable roof and hybrid seating, um, more so than now effectively both sides. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that will mean that you'll be able to cater cricket arguably better than now, uh, conceivably baseball, Aussie rules, uh, enhanced uh, concerts and I don't know what else. Um, so can you give us a, a flavour of that? Because I don't think Aucklanders appreciate just what you're proposing there. Thanks for the question. In terms of Eden Park 2.1, it is a truly hybrid multi-purpose stadium. We are looking at the, the fact that uh, our, we've got a population of 1.7 million people, um, the percentage of people that attend live sport, um, but also entertainment whole range of other events we're looking at, whether it be religious events through to boxing, UFC, um, car shows, etc. Um, so 
you're right that um, it does enable greater boundaries for test match cricket. That gives surety for both cricket and rugby with uh, broadcast rights. Um, as far as the adaptive reuse uh, of the, the North Stand, it's not knocking over the North Stand or the West Stand. It's actually utilising the existing infrastructure and giving it arguably a facelift. So um, I think that uh, it's a, a financially responsible and, and uh, also uh, environmentally sustainable option and the only option for Auckland, and that's based on my um, experience over the last 25 years. Thanks. Commendations on... Eden Pink. Deputy Mayor Simpson, please. Well, oh, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I just want to thank you for what you do for Auckland, but Councillor Newman asked my question around point 13. Thank you. Brilliant. Councillor Ferry. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll try and keep this quick. Um, I was interested in two aspects. One was uh, the point that you made about um, having uh, a lot of income coming in from sources that you know, didn't the park didn't work on um, previously, and it seems to me a lot of this increases in the area of content um, more for women and girls. And I wondered if you had a a comment on that and sort of the strategy there, because I, I see it as a major plus. It seems to have um, much fewer negative impacts for the surrounding neighbourhood, and and we seem to see better behaviour on public transport with those kinds of events. Not to say those are the only kinds of events we should run as a city, but um, I think there's a lot to learn there. So that was my first question. Thanks. Then I've got one other quick one. Thanks for the question, and um, I have spoken previously. I think five years ago, when the previous government launched their women in sports strategy, um, even under our consenting, women's sport was referred to as curtain raisers. And if you look now, the last um, five sellouts uh, of sporting events at Eden Park have been women's sport. And so the growth in women's sport is only going to continue. And even on the weekend, having the double header with uh, the Blues women's team ahead of the Blues men's team just demonstrates the growth. And, and Eden Park's been a proud sponsor of uh, the, the women's team, the Blues women's team, for the last three years. So um, that area does present opportunities for us, but it also presents um, challenges around our consenting because of the restrictions we have on the number of events. Um, there's no question that um, the demographic differs from men's and women's sport, um, and uh, there's certainly more families that attend women's sport. Um, it, it fills two of our strategic priorities, whether it be content is king, number five, and then um, fostering equality, inclusion in our action and events. So it's definitely a priority for us um, and it shows what is possible with women's sport in our wonderful country. Thanks. Um, and just for the record, I, I didn't take the uh, tickets to Pink, but I did go along to the um, Permobile um, uh, expo that you hosted uh, and also a water care one, those ones that have, have been free for us to attend. So um, really appreciate that work that you're doing, also hosting Eid, um, which is really important for our diverse community. My other question was just around, um, you mentioned a possible income stream in the future from management of other venues. Are you managing any other venues now? I wasn't aware that you were. No, we don't. We're in discussions with and looking at other opportunities around Auckland and New Zealand. We have done some consulting work um, both locally and internationally around um, whether it be race courses or indeed commercialisation of naming rights. And, uh, and we do do some consulting for both cricket and rugby at community level and grounds. We did previously put in a tender to run a number of the, the grass fields around Auckland but was unsuccessful, but we will be attempting to do that in future again. OK, thanks very much. Good question, good answer, Councillor Turner. Thank you, just a quick one. I risk death if I don't take this opportunity on behalf of my office ladies at my little business. Why can't Taylor Swift come? Uh, how much time do we have? Um, so we are working with council and, uh, and central government. The reality is, even next year, there's a number of artists that are looking at multiple dates for Eden Park. So this isn't just a Taylor Swift issue. This is actually a content issue for us. And um, earlier this week, I talked about the, the FIFA Women's World Cup. We did uh, nine events in 27 days and 350,000 patrons. We didn't have a consent when we actually bid with the council and government to uh, get that event. 
We don't have the luxury in the concert space to do that because of the process. So I'm confident, and the world has kept spinning, um, concerts have actually showcased what is possible at our national stadium. So I'm confident in future, whether it be that artist or other artists, um, it's on their bucket list. We are going to be competitive against Melbourne and Sydney, uh, or even Perth. Um, whether it be because of the, the, the yield that we can deliver, or indeed um, New Zealand's a desirable place for people to come. I didn't realise you're a fan there, Councillor Kuna. <laughs> yeah, Councillor Philippe. Uh, kia ora, thank you, and thank you, Councillor Turner, for asking that question. Um, Look, a lot of our councillors around the table have asked questions and you've told the story well about the economic benefits that you are providing or, you know, since the last report. But I wanted you to tell a bit more of the story around the economic benefit that you bring as an employer, as a major employer in our city. Um, I'm keen to understand, especially as we're, you know, we're in the middle of a climate we are in the middle of a climate crisis as well, but of a cost of living crisis, and we're staring down possible uh, possible increase in unemployment, um, especially for young people. So can you tell us a bit more of the story of how many people you employ in the city, um, whether you're a living wage employer, and if not, are you working towards that? And then also for those... Um, because I've come a few times over the years and I, I recognise some faces, but they're still in those entry-level jobs. Do you have a plan for career progression for your long-term workers or professional development, development for them? Kia ora. Thank you for the question. And um, it's something I'm very passionate about and it also links in with the University of Auckland and what we're doing in that space. Um, from a full-time staffing perspective, only today I proved for our um, head of legal. So um, she'll be going over to the UK, doing a, a month with a venue over in the UK to increase her skills, knowledge and, and learning. It is an industry, once people get in, um, my corporate suite manager has been 30 years with the business. Our receptionist has been over 30 years with the business. So once people get a taste, a lot of them stay. Um, our casual workforce, when you can imagine whether it be through catering, security, cleaning, customer service, um, electricians, plumbers, the train driver getting an extra shift, the bus driver getting an extra shift. But I do want to touch on um, a number of the businesses in Kingsland and Dominion Road, and we have a lot of association with them. Um, there's, a, there's a small business, um, I'm sure they wouldn't mind me mentioning, Kingsland Social. Um, husband and wife, three young children. Um, the difference between an event at Eden Park, happening or not happening, um, is the difference between their business surviving. And they are, he's one of the best chefs in New Zealand. And he reached out to me in the lead up to Pink and he said, hey, we're struggling, is there anything you can do? And um, we got 42 full-time staff and I said, you can cater for us for three days. The messages and thanks that I got um, from that family um, and the messages that actually inspires me to do the job that I do. Um, a number of our casual staff in catering succession plan into full-time roles or indeed roles during the week. So we have um, a thousand functions a year um, across our um, non-event days. So those staff, a lot of them actually, but also it provides opportunities. We've got two young ladies that um, we had an Air New Zealand function. They were staff working on event days. They were offered flight attendant roles. Um, so now they're flight attendants with Air New Zealand. We had their mother at our suite um, for the Phoenix fixture and she said, whenever they get an opportunity, they come back and work a, a shift at Eden Park. So there's these great stories to be told across our workforce and the development and opportunities. It is an embryonic industry, but it's also transferable. So the customer service skills you learn at Eden Park can be transferred into whether it be working in retail or working in your day-to-day -day business. So um, the other piece is we employ a number of um, local residents. So a number of residents use it as their second job. Um, they come in, they work in our corporate suites, they work in our retail outlets, or they work across a number of other roles. So um, the community engagement element is far broader than just employment. Thanks. Kia ora. Thank you. Thank you for that. John Watson, please. Just picking up uh, on a couple of your comments there, Nick, uh, and the one that came from uh, the remark of looking to have a positive impact on the community. Um, and, you, uh, you know, to your credit, Eden Park's always taken a, 
an Auckland wide role. In this presentation, you you mentioned um, you know an interest in going to more stadium management, lifting knowledge, understanding, utilisation, bringing people together, management of other facilities. Every time you come in here, it just gets better. It's just you're doing more. There's more big events. There's more community involvement. Um, what I want to know is, is there any possibility that stadium management and advice and utilisation could be used to, to help other parts of Auckland that, in stark contrast to this you know, glowing performance in a parlour state where the communities aren't nearly so fortunate as having an Eden Park uh, in their midst, is there any chance of, of, of it broadening out to that? Um, because there's, there's people crying out for, for help. I won't comment on um, the other facilities other than to say um, we've just lost our turf manager after 15 years, um, an assistant turf manager. And what I'd say is um, it was due to opportunity. So the ability to have scale comes back to the earlier question. By having scale and diversity of opportunities gives succession planning and um, uh, an attempt to, to rain, retain staff. So um, the ability to operate across multiple um, facilities pres presents opportunities and there's many management companies uh, globally that do that across um, a number of facilities. So it's something we're exploring um, on a commercial basis uh, and we think that we've got the expertise and knowledge to do so. There you go. Councillor Bartley and then we might have a break. Um, thank you, thank you. I just wanted to ask, maybe it's a cheeky question, but you know all this talk about a new national stadium on the waterfront, would you argue that you're the national stadium? Absolutely. Um, as someone who moved here seven years ago and now calls New Zealand home, um, I'm a New Zealand citizen, um, I'm invested in the country and I'm invested in Eden Park. Eden Park is a global brand. And even after now, we had England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, South Africa, Argentina, but now after the FIFA Women's World Cup, markets like the US, Philippines, China, our tour program represents um, the diversity of the tourists that are coming to our iconic stadium. So there's no question. And again, I know it's not for this forum, but um, spending two to five billion dollars on a new stadium is um, not financially responsible, irrespective um, of the circumstance. So Yeah, this is part of a process. We probably shouldn't be talking it here. We've got a whole other process in parallel for this. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, the processes I want to go through is lunch, actually, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. But thank you um, for that. that and just to be very clear, the Eden Park Trust hasn't made any comments on throughout that process. We've abided by the signed um, confidentiality agreement in contrast to the other three proposals. Okay, thank you for your enthusiastic performance and, uh, well, um, an enjoyable presentation. Um, we have, I had hoped to do item nine about storm recovery now, but I think we've got well into the lunch break. There's a lot of people have been sitting out there for ages. They've probably got a toilet break as well. So I'm going to reconvene in hopefully 20 minutes. But we'll try and have a quick one. But in the meantime, we will receive these reports. Thank you very much. Moved and seconded by the Albany representatives. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, thank you. A short break, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. I will accept. <laughs> Twelve forty-five kickoff. Thank you for those people who have attended patiently in the background.
Ladies and gentlemen, come on. The next item we're going to start with is the storm recovery update for those people involved in that come to the front anyhow. So they're not here. Ross, where are your mates? Matt, you can introduce this, he'll arrive. Okay. We have a quorum. I'm going to resume with item nine, a storm recovery update and request to set an end date for the homeowners to opt into the property risk assessment process. Matt, you can kick this off and um, in the fullness of time, Tanya and Megan and Hony and Mace will arrive, but if you can't amuse us between now and then I'll be disappointed. I'm not sure how amusing it will be, but thank you, Your Worship. I'll start. We, um, I'm going to take the report as read, the report that we submitted, and pull out four key items to, um, to explore in a bit more detail. I want to talk about setting an end date for opting into the categorisation process. I uh, give you some uh, more up-to-date information on where categorizations have got to. They're moving, uh, obviously, day by day, so we're going to update you since we produce the report itself. can give you some feedback on how we can now report by local board, so I want to get into that. Quick update on the status of the various agreements that we have with central government, the funding agreements. And then Linda's going to talk in a bit of depth about a recent community and social recovery needs assessment that we've done. We're proposing and, and asking you to support setting an end date for people to opt in to categorisation. Um, one of the key drivers to that is that the funding agreement with central government for the support of Category 3 homes ends at the end of the next financial year, so mid-2025, uh, there is no central government support and effectively the scheme needs to, to end then in the middle of next year. So we're proposing an end date for homeowners to opt into categorisation of 30th of September this year, 2024. Uh, the way we got to that date was simply to work backwards for when the scheme needs to shut mid next year, mid 2025. So people that were opting in right up until the end, uh, let's say in September this year, there needs to be a period for certain things to happen once somebody's opted into the scheme. There needs to be a conversation about valuations around category three projects anyway. Um, homeowners are given periods of time to consider certain things that we put to them, for example, the valuation before they need to respond and make a decision. Um, we need to allow time for disputes. We've now got an idea on how long it takes when homeowners dispute either the categorization or the valuation. So we need to build in time for that to happen as well from the last opt-ins. Also that we can get through um, all of the categorizations, particularly category three, before we get to mid-2025. 
Um, there will be an ability at Council's discretion, and we're suggesting that this be delegated to the Chief Executive, to consider homeowners that do still want to opt in after the 30th of September this year. We've yet to write the policy around that, but we're suggesting that that policy be at the Chief Executive's discretion. I would expect that would be a small number of homes. Just following on with that conversation about an end date for categorisation, we are going to need to take some kind of robust and deliberate steps to make sure that we've given everybody the opportunity to opt in um, so that all storm affected property owners are aware of the programme and can make informed choices. So that we're going to have to make a sustained effort between now and then. Um, some obvious examples are some more communication where English is a second language for some homeowners. Um, the, there's an obvious, uh, it's not necessarily obvious, we can door knock. We intend to go door knocking. We have a reasonable idea of which properties we think should have opted in from the work that we've already done uh, and the modelling. So we're able to go door knocking and will go door knocking and have face-to-face -face engagements with homeowners. That's going to be resource intensive, um, but critical. And it would be good, and we'll be seeking support from elected members and more support from the local community groups that we already work with to make sure there is um, anybody that we haven't identified to try and identify homeowners that haven't opted in and ask for support to engage and identify those homeowners between now and September. Just a quick update on categorisation numbers, simply since the report was produced. Um, the report's a couple of weeks old now since it was written. Um, you can see when the report was written, the figures are along the top in terms of how many categories we got through, a total of 685. Um, as of the last couple of days when we produced this slide, that number's now at 803 categorisations. And you can see the makeup of that along the bottom. It's self-explanatory. Cat 1, Cat 3, etc. So an indication of how many categorizations have been done simply in the space of a couple of weeks. I wanted to just talk about demolition. Demolition's now started. Um, deconstruction, I should say, rather than demolition. We've begun the deconstruction of the first home in Murawai. There's another 24 there that are on the list that we're beginning to work through now. What we do before we start deconstruction of any of the homes is go and have a good look at them. One of the things we're looking for is asbestos. Uh, we already have nine asbestos, nine homes with asbestos in them already in, in the small sample that we've already engaged with. There's obviously time and cost in asbestos, so there's something to be conscious of there. Um, We've moved to Ranui now, so we're getting into beginning to think about the deconstruction of the first homes in Ranui. Um, probably about 30 homes is a month. 30 homes a month, sorry, is what we think we can get through with the deconstruction program. When I say deconstruction, I use the word intentionally. There's homes that are actually deconstructed fully. There's homes where portions of them are deconstructed and materials are recovered. Uh, some homes we're going to lift up and take away and use elsewhere. And, and a last resort is to, is to smash homes to pieces uh, and, um, and simply then try and separate the materials at landfill. We prefer not to do that for obvious reasons. It's quite a long tail on that demolition, deconstruction. If you did the maths, 30 a month, it's going to take a long time to get through 600 or 700. We're aware of that. We've only just recently engaged with this activity, so now we need to work out how we can make that go more quickly. We, we don't want it to take as long as the numbers would suggest that it will. We 
have spent the last month or so moving from a place where when we really started categorization in a big way at the beginning of this year, we were concentrating on low hanging fruit and uh, to get categorizations done as quickly as we could. Obvious category threes, obvious category ones, um, and, and, and where we could trying to concentrate on homeowners that were displaced. Um, if I'm being honest with you, that's not the most structured way in the world of doing something like this but it was it was suitable and necessary at the time to get the program moving we've spent the last month or so now trying to be more purposeful so we have consolidated what we've been doing in flooding and geotech into one place so we've got an awful lot of data and a, a big sharepoint site and excel spreadsheets and all sorts of things that you would expect for flooding and we've got a similar system running in parallel for geotech. Um, and it's been necessary that we consolidate all of that into one place to be a lot more purposeful about how we continue categorization and less reactive. So we spent the last few weeks doing that. So what that does is it gives us better forecasts. So now we can forecast by area in a combined way for both flooding and geotech, rather than having to do this stuff separately gives us really good improved visibility of data at a, a property level and we can separate all of this stuff now by suburb and local board and I'll show you that in a second. We've got a lot better capability now to analyze all of that data in one place and make combined decisions. So that's built, that single um, source of the truth if you like is now built and I'll show you in a second. In fact, I'll show you it now. So this is a, what's called a Power BI dashboard. So it's a smart bit of um, computer wizardry that I wouldn't claim to understand, which pulls information from both the flooding teams and the geotech teams and puts it all into one place in real time. Important to note, there's a big data only thing there diagonally across the screen. What that should say is something like example data only, examples hanging off the bottom of the screen. This is actually quite close to being very accurate data, but it still needs some work. So my caution to you is don't write down any numbers from here and treat them as gospel. Uh, in a couple of weeks' time, you will be able to do that and we'll be engaging with whoever wants to engage with us by local board or suburb to, to, to help you work with this data and to understand this data. But right now, it's still in, uh, in construction. What happens though, if you click on that map on the left hand side and continue to click on it, it will zoom in right down to street by street, address by address. So every address uh, and home that we're dealing with at the moment, there's about 2,717 of them uh, that we're actively engaged with that have opted into the process are on that map. And you can zoom in and find every single one of them on that map um, fairly precisely. It, the data on the bottom right hand side, which begins to give you a feel of which of the local boards have had the most significant effects. So you can see Rodney there on the left hand side with some big numbers all the way across to Manurewa on the right. You can filter this by um, suburb as well as local board. And when you do that, that goes away off the screen. That, the, the, that long tail of statistics there sort of from Rodney through Havoc down to Manuri, where if you filter by suburb, um, it's two or three times that width. So a really surprisingly high number of suburbs have actually been impacted a lot more um, than perhaps people realize. Uh, what else can this uh, software and data do for us? From a governance perspective, um, we can produce information that looks like this. So we can see the numbers of desktop assessments that we've done. <clears throat> Again, we can split that by geotech and by flood, or we can combine it and we can interrogate it by uh, suburbs and local boards. So all of those big colored boxes on the bottom of the screen there, if you're actually in this software, you could click on any of those boxes 
and that would zoom in again on a map and specific details and graphs and charts of that local board area, or should you choose to, you could also do it by suburb. The most powerful use of this data and tool is predictive. It's all very well looking backwards and what I'm, what I'm showing you now is historical and, and clearly you can see that these are months that have passed. It's its predictive ability that we've built this for. Um, we're now populating it with when we think uh, desktop assessments will be done for those that haven't been categorized, uh, when we think site visits will be done for those that haven't been categorized, and subsequently when we will get to a categorization home by home by home for each of the 2,717 homes that are in this, uh, in this tool. And that's, it's, that's the most power. And, and the key reason that we built this is to get some accuracy around predictions of how long things are gonna take, suburb by suburb, and local board by local board. As I said, in the next week or two, we're gonna be looking for volunteers to just work with us as we finalize how this works in terms of what do you wanna see, what's most important to you from a local board or a suburb perspective. And um, we can produce all kinds of dashboards that show all kinds of things. So we'll just be asking for a couple of volunteers to help work with us on this over the next couple of weeks. Just a quick update on the various agreements we now have with the central government, with central government, not the central government. Um, minor variation in progress there. You'll see the sort of second, third line down for a $2 million storm readiness fund. You might have seen Minister Mitchell announce that in the last week or so. Um, that is um, it's essentially a fund to be distributed to communities and community groups to help with waterways and, and the like. And, and it's more about winter readiness actually than storm readiness. I think it's called winter readiness fund. We're kind of moving into the next stage of detail now with our interactions with central government. The big headline um, agreements are all executed as you'll see uh, up towards the top of the page there. And everything that's, um, that's on the go at the moment is around PDPs. So important to know that particularly the 2C infrastructure projects, community infrastructure projects and 2P, the whole tranche of 2P projects, uh, there's no money for that until we've written PDPs and, um, and central government has also accepted those PDPs, not just um, the mechanics within our own local government. Uh, a business case, project development business case type thing. Sorry, councillor. Acronyms. Um, there, the 2P grant scheme, what we've agreed to do is it isn't practical to be going to central government again and again and again for relatively small amounts of money for the 2P property level projects. So we've bundled all of that and the current conversation is about just writing one business case. Um, for all of the 2P projects. That's looking like being about $60 million in, in terms of the, the scale of that 2P uh, property level interventions. Um, in terms of the 2C, uh, the community level infrastructure, nine projects at the moment that we're talking to them about in relative detail, government share of that, central government share of that is probably about $400 million. So those are the sorts of numbers that, that, that we're now negotiating. Um, the several hundred intolerable risk to life categorization homes in those 2C projects and um, considerable wider benefit to infrastructure and, and other homes, as you might recall from previous conversations that we've had with you about those projects. I might just leave uh, sort of the facts and figures there for now and, uh, and ask Linda to talk um, uh, about some community work that's been done. Uh, kia ora, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so as I know, I do not need to um, remind you, recovery is much bigger than uh, the categorisation process. And uh, from a community and social recovery perspective, what we know from other disasters is that there's often about a five to 10 year tail 
on recovery. So it's really important that we're uh, seeking to understand what impacts um, are out there in community and what, uh, what the sector is doing to support those needs. So we can in turn understand what they need from us. Uh, so, um, over the last few months, we've been engaging with mana whenua, the community and voluntary um, and social sector, uh, and undertaken needs assessment research in our priority communities to really get a, a grasp on what those key needs are within communities. Uh, and that's uh, summarised for you in the summary report that's um, on your agenda. Uh, but I'll just quickly race through that. Sorry, can we just... Oh, I've got, oh, I have the power. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> that's all good. Um, what we know is that the extreme weather events have had a significantly negative impact on the well-being of Aucklanders. Um, and, you know, just again, um, context around scale there is that there are around 40,000 households in Auckland that required support following the weather events. So what we're really interested in through this work is understanding where those far known households are now and what ongoing needs um, are presenting. Uh, so through the course of our engagement, we heard again and again um, how the timing of the weather events coming off the back of those COVID lockdowns, which were particularly bad here in Auckland, and now in the midst of this cost of living crisis, Oh, it's back. Uh, has made the impacts far worse. People were already struggling, and those who were already struggling have been hit hardest by this. Um, we heard from our engagement that um, the, uh, the stabilising effect of ongoing uncertainty about the future was a key issue. Trying to deal with the, um, the recovery process in itself is a challenge, and that there's a fundamental um, fear emerging about the future. Key needs that were identified consistently through all of our engagement was around health and wellbeing. So we heard that the storm events have had significant impacts on individuals and whānau, physically, spiritually and emotionally. Uh, those health and wellbeing needs ranged from uh, trauma related to the events themselves, um, the anxiety about future adverse weather events, stress in addressing the impacts of the events, so um, negotiating through the insurance process, the rebuild process, the categorisation process, etc. Isolation and loneliness has come up again and again, and I think it's one of the, um, personally, I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing here in Auckland, that because of uh, the ex extent of impacts, but the uh, very wide nature of uh, the spread of them, there's a lot of people who are struggling through this alone. They don't have neighbours, they, they don't have a sense of being part of a larger uh, recovery effort and are feeling incredibly isolated uh, because of that. Uh, there's grief, um, and that's not just over the, you know, the tragedies associated with the losses of lives, but about uh, loss of possessions, you know, family treasures that are gone forever, photo albums, uh, grief about not being able to stay in the community that you love. Um, and we're certainly starting to hear about some real stresses within families and relationships. Um, the second key issue is around housing and accommodation, which will be uh, a surprise to no one, uh, I'm sure. Um, but what we heard, uh, which um, I suppose is of note here, is that the impacts are being felt across the housing system. So we were already um, a, a housing system in Auckland that was struggling, and this has just exacerbated um, the issue. We're starting to hear more and more reports of overcrowding, of people um, returning to homes that are unsafe or unhealthy. Um, and again, that separation um, from all that they know, from cultural, familial, social ties, is having a really negative impact on people. Um, uh, and then we heard that for some for our no, uh, the financial toll of these weather events will be significant, ongoing and really, really difficult to recover from. Uh, there is, there's a real fear uh, that we're hearing around the potential for intergenerational impacts as a result of these weather events, where people are losing um, their most significant family 
and one and only and most significant family asset. They're not able to repurchase a home and therefore uh, their, their children and their children's children's ability um, to get back onto the housing ladder is going to be significantly impacted. Um, and yeah, I won't talk too much more about that. Uh, if I could flip on. So those are really the, the top three key issues, um, but there were other consistent issues that were identified. Uh, and they include um, that many Aucklanders we're hearing are still uh, struggling to access uh, the information and support that they need to navigate their recoveries. Um, that may be about the suitability of um, information uh, or services, or it may be about um, whether the provision actually exists to meet their needs. Um, Insurance is coming through really, really loud and strong. I'm sure you're hearing it as well. But people are really, um, you know, we're, there's been significant progress in settling claims here in Auckland. But for those who have yet to settle, uh, there's significant stress associated with trying to do that. And we're also hearing about um, when the events occurred that there were many people who lacked sufficient insurance coverage. Um, and that includes for vehicles and contents. Um, and we're also hearing, uh, as I'm sure you are, about the prohibitively high uh, future insurance premiums um, or the prospect of being able, unable to access insurance in the future. Uh, and lastly, um, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot in here uh, in terms of infrastructure and planning, but I'll just talk through the key points. Um, so, uh, this in here sits um, a real fear about how prepared we are for future weather events, and that's both in terms of how we work with community and with the social sector to be able to respond to an event, uh, and also how prepared our assets and our infrastructure are. Um, there's frustration um, being expressed about the slow speed at which we're dealing with infrastructure issues and that's really seen to be exacerbating stress and tension within communities and undermining trust. Uh, and yeah, it, interviewees and, and people we engage with also wish to see council undertake more active engagement with communities around identifying those natural hazards and really working together uh, to think about how we get ready for future events. So, um, the issues that I've talked to in here are clearly uh, uh, big issues that go beyond Auckland Council's scope to be able to deliver, but uh, undertaking this work was really important, um, not least uh, because it gives people and community a voice and an opportunity for us to uh, hear what's happening for them. But, you know, we have a really important role in terms of advocating to government and others to make sure that there are services and supports and investment going into the right place. And I will leave it there. OK, we've got a few, starting with the Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and look, just thank you to your team for your ongoing work. I know it's challenging um, for everybody, including you as a team, so thank you for what you're doing. Look, I'm going to ask you a question that you haven't brought up today, but I know about it, so just for the benefit of um, my colleagues. So a few weeks ago, we met, uh, met with the head of the Bankers Association to discuss how the banking industry could assist people who had been affected by the weather events. So could you please outline some of the outcomes of that meeting and next steps? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Councillor Simpson. Um, we did meet with the banks, um, and they made several key points about kind of the here and now, and then did we did talk to them about the future too. In terms of the here and now, one of the key messages that they wanted us to relay to homeowners was don't wait to engage with your bank. Don't wait for your categorization. Uh, don't wait to engage with your insurers. Uh, don't wait for anything. As soon as you have a problem, if you've been affected by flooding or geotech or whatever, engage with your bank as one of the first people that you engage with. Um, they stress to us that all of the banks have uh, welfare teams. So there are there people who are not simply bankers, no offense to bankers. 
um, who, who can and will engage in, in issues of welfare and stress and challenge. Um, they talk to us actually about some of the constraints though that they face in terms of being able to be as flexible as perhaps they would like with customers and, uh, and, and explain to us some of the, 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 the regulation that sits above and around banks which constrains what they can and can't do in terms of flexibility in particular. Um, they reminded us that there's a banking ombudsman so if that engagement with banks isn't going well, that customers uh, and homeowners can engage with the bank ombudsman. Um, and customers also, homeowners, can engage with our navigators. We've got some degree of experience in our team with helping navigate the banking landscape. Looking further ahead, um, I reminded the bankers that the, the Cyclone Recovery Unit will be sounds like will be the lead agency in thinking how this can all be done better next time for New Zealand Inc. Um, it was something that we put in our funding agreement with central government last year that we didn't want to go through this again. This isn't going to set a precedent how we've all had to deal with this particular situation, both centrally and locally. Um, sounds like the CRU are going to take the lead on what can be done better next time. So I'm going to hook the bankers up and make sure that they're part of that discussion and the insurers, incidentally, with the Cyclone Recovery Unit. I just have one more, if I may, quickly. And that is um, page, uh, sorry, paragraph 23 in the report concerns me. Um, you've highlighted that mental health is a big issue. And obviously, um, we can tell by the amount of people who've applied for help um, versus how much money there was. Do you feel confident that uh, central government is assisting in that space and that there will be that support for people who are still struggling? Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, look, what's clear is that um, there is no funding allocated beyond this financial year uh, to support the implementation of the social sector recovery plan, and that is where we would expect to see funding um, to support following um, a disaster and in recovery. Um, we are having active conversations with government about how they will support those needs into the future. Um, yeah, at, at yet, um, I can't give you a response. Okay, so, but meantime, are we channeling people to the different social agencies that are available for their extra support? Absolutely. Yeah, great, thanks. Very caring. Can I have Andy Baker, please? Thanks, Mayor. Um, so, look, are we, are we absolutely confident that, that what we're doing is in a timely manner when you, and, and so, and I guess, that question comes from the fact that on more than one occasion I've had to give a nudge to say, can you have a look at this property because they've heard nothing. Um, and, and then they're getting the messages and as we work towards that 30th of September and the, and the admission that, that this is a really time consuming process, that we still got properties, and I talk about properties in, in Pukekohe um, that I know about, that are yet to be categorised whilst ones on either side of them have. and that those people are getting told, yep, it'll be February, now it's gonna be March, now it's gonna be April. And as we work towards that September date, and then they get told there's vouchers, but that's gonna take several weeks for you to receive those vouchers. I mean, geez, give them to me, I'll drop them off today. Um, you know, it's, it's how, how are we operating? Are you confident that, we've, that we are doing everything we can? Because when you get those sorts of stories, it calls into question that actually we're making it harder than it, and I don't know, but it's it's not because all of those mental health things and all of those issues that you've talked about, there are people out there still, and that's within our control. There's a lot without, but you know, I just want to know if we're doing it and how can we potentially be more responsive if we can. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Let me preface what I'm about to say with, I appreciate that we can never go fast enough. You can never go fast enough in these situations. You can never get to, and I've used this phrase before and I'll use it again, if I had a magic wand that would get to thousands of homes tomorrow, I would wave it. Um, we are, I mean, just to, to get into a teeny bit of detail about one of the questions you asked, it's quite a broad question. Um, when you talk about three homes in a row, for example, wherever they may happen to be, 
and, and, and the one on the left and the one on the right has been categorised, but the one on the middle hasn't. Um, there can be numerous reasons for that. Um, th 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 there's variables around when they all opted into the scheme. Um, there's variables around what we know from desktop assessments of those three properties in terms of which are at the greatest risk. Maybe the two, the, the two that we've got to are clear category threes, so we've gone to them because they're clear category threes. Uh, and, and the one in the, in the middle is perhaps can benefit from a 2C solution, a community level engineering uh, solution that, that we're still designing and still working through and thinking about. Um, so that's kind of to that specific point. But if talk more broadly, um, we've learned and are learning an enormous amount day by day by day as we get into this categorization. Um, remember, we only just brought the last of these categorization um, processes to you really late last year, a couple of weeks before Christmas. We were still working out how to do category 2P and what the process looked like and you, you were signing it off for us. So we're now into category 2P. As we get into category 3 and 2C, category 1, there's nuance upon nuance in all of this categorization that we're picking up day after day. Um, for example, we've tons more category 2Ps than we expected. I really did think that we were going to have a small number of property level intervention solutions. Um, they're looking like being way up at 100 plus, maybe 200 now, category 2Ps. Um, that's really intensive work. The category 2P gets your engineers into detail, backwards and forwards discussions with quantity surveyors and homeowners and, and to figure out the 2P solution. Is it viable? Is it cost effective? Um, when at the same time, instead of having those conversations and trying to work out what to do about a category 2P, they could be smashing out a whole bunch of category ones. Um, so we're learning as we go along and still adding resources. Again, this morning I was signing off hundreds of thousands of dollars to more consultants to bring more people in to help us with this work. I'm not sure there was an answer there, but... Uh, Phil Wilson, please. Uh, I was, I was just going to comment on this general area because um, uh, Matt and I have been talking about this a lot and I think you know the starting point is just to again acknowledge that you know there are people in difficult situations and needing us, wanting us to go as fast as we can and we've absolutely got that intent within the, in the recovery team um, and, and there may be community representatives and affected people online so you know, I just want to give voice to the fact that people are uh, trying really hard here. <clears throat> what we need to do is keep checking ourselves and identifying any options that we have to speed it up, even if there are some cost implications um, to doing that. That was the gist of the Minister's letter to us earlier in the week as well. And as I said earlier in proceedings, you know, I think we're all on the same page there. We all want the same outcome. Um, which is the right result as soon as possible, um, in as many situations as possible. Um, <clears throat> I indicated that we want to have a workshop with you next week, and I think there are some particular things that we need to explore. There is complexity in this around the Category 2C solutions relative to Category 3. I know this probably sounds a bit complicated, um, and there are some issues in terms of where the money sits in which bucket and our decision making around this. Um, and therefore, there are parallel discussions going on with central government to make sure that we don't let the construction of the scheme done months and months ago without um, full intel, frankly, about what's going to be ha what was happening on the ground. We need to kind of use that to kind of inform um, uh, some adjustments here, in my view. That's the gist of the discussion that we want to have with you next week. So um, possibly not helping, but um, just want to kind of reinforce um, for the team and Matt in particular that things are, you know, we're exploring all the avenues to try and kind of um, speed things up. Thank you for that. Councillor Fletcher, please. Thank you. Um, Matt, you may be aware that under the performance of the CEO earlier this morning, um, I asked about the adequacy of our advocacy 
Um, it related particularly to Category 3 buyouts, where there were family trusts in place. Um, I'm well aware of the uh, press release the government put out, but I also note that we don't always agree with government and we often push back. And I want to know what advocacy is taking place um, in those special circumstances, because as you have correctly pointed out, there's a lot of stress and a lot of trauma for a lot of families. Thank you, Councillor. I'll take that one. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I think this is um, an area where we probably do disagree uh, with government and we are actively advocating to them to relook at uh, the eligibility um, for those uh, with homes held in trust. We understand that it is um, a complicated uh, process to do that and that that means it has taken more time. Um, but we are um, yeah, working with the Deputy Mayor's Office and the Mayor's Office. At the moment we have a letter, advocacy letter to ministers drafted um, seeking both a review of the eligibility requirements as it relates to homes held in trust, but also in relation to the duration of funding um, for uh, the provision of that assistance. At the moment, 30th of June of this year is when that assistance runs out, and we know that there's going to be a lot of Aucklanders who require that assistance beyond that point. So to speed things up, is there anything that we can do as elected members to encourage you uh, from the CEO down to be able to progress this? I think the answer probably is that, you know, knowing we have your support and backup to, um, if you like, strengthen that advocacy and, and to continue to work with the Mayor and Deputy Mayor is probably the key to this. Um, it really can only be solved, I would suggest, at a political level. Thank you, Phil. And I'm happy to support in any way I can, because um, like all of you, we want to be able to resolve as many of these awful situations for people as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Councillor Ferry. Oh, kia ora. Um, thank you for that. And uh, just putting my hand up to, um, you asked for some volunteers earlier and I'm not physically there, so um, this is me putting my hand up uh, to go through that, that Power BI stuff and things like that. Um, very interested in this space. Thank you for your work. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, one is, uh, I've asked before about, um, Linda, you mentioned the, the long tail of the recovery work. And I I'm guess I'm wanting a little bit of information about when yeah, thinking about um, the exit plan for the recovery office and how when are we likely to see, um, so I'm not asking for the plan now, but when are we likely to see a bit of a plan about how some of these functions are going to get embedded into other parts of council as the recovery office exits? Um, because, it, you know, we. Yeah, we've talked about this before, but I'm sort of wanting to get a sense of when the timeline might be about when we might start to see a plan of transition on that specific aspect of it. And then I've got a couple more, please. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Uh, Phil's asked me to bring that transition plan to you in June, so that will come to the, June, the June GB. It's already been drafted as we speak, uh, and, and the first version of it will come to the June GB. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so the next question I had was around um, the part of the report that's around storm impacted land and I see there that you're um, bringing a, a draft policy to us um, in a couple of months. What is the involvement going to be for local boards in coming up with that draft before it gets to us? Um, just acknowledging that in a lot of cases they'll be inheriting um, some of these assets and in the context of some of the conversations we're having around how their funding works and um, their future assets, it'd be useful, I think, to have their input and no doubt mana whenua input, actually, just thinking about off the top of my head, um, at as early a po as possible a stage. So what's sort of the thinking there, please? And then I've got one more. 
Yeah, thanks, Councillor. I'm getting advice from <laughs> both directions here. We've um, we've been to the the Manafenoa forum already with some of the early thinking about what that might might look like to engage there. Um, and at the end of April, uh, a similar exercise is going to happen with the local boards once the, the the things a bit better shaped up at the end of next month. Great, thank you. Um, last question is uh, we've we've inevitably end up talking a lot in this about um, landowners and owner occupiers how are we going in the renter space um, are we do we know yet uh, and you know that data stuff is great I'm really looking forward to being able to dive into that do we have a sense yet of how many of these properties are rental properties as opposed to owner occupiers um, do we have a sense yet of whether there's some work that needs to be done with landlords around um, you know, situations where perhaps they're not coming into the process or not fixing a home um, that actually, you know, would qualify? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Unfortunately, I, um, I think I did promise you that I could come back to you with data in relation to the navigation service and how many people we were supporting who are renters versus homeowners. Unfortunately, um, we haven't been able to do that. It's a, it's a manual process um, at the moment, but we're looking at how we capture data for the future so that we can record that more efficiently. Um, what is clear is that we are finding um, more and more tenants who are requiring support. Um, it's still not huge numbers uh, in the scheme of things, but it certainly is uh, on the increase. Um, we are also starting to hear, as we're uh, narrowing in on those areas that um, we know are likely to be uh, in that high risk area, that there's more reports of those being um, yeah, rental properties and that we're going to have to, as part of the strategy that Matt has talked to, um, reach out directly and think about how we engage with those landlords. Councillor, there's, there's around about 100 properties that haven't opted in that we clearly think should have. Um, we can see that from the modelling and the engineering work that we're doing and, and how the categorisation is progressing around them. And my suspicion would be that a high proportion of those would be renters. Uh, and that's why there hasn't been an opt-in from the landlord. So that's the, the, the door knocking should pick up a whole bunch of those too. So just to, sorry, just to follow up on that then, I mean, one of the issues there about, um, you know, about door knocking and really glad we're doing that is we're still going to be talking potentially to the wrong person. Um, the person who lives in the house, they, you know, the ability to contact the the owner may be quite limited. So, um, I guess are we, are we what are we doing in that sort of space? Are we working with any of the sort of I guess the um, property management companies and things like that who may be able to shortcut some of those conversations with landlords? Uh, kia ora. Yes, um, we aren't yet, but it is something that we um, are intending to do. Great. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, just indicating I'll leave after this item as I'm not well. Oh, we'll get well soon. Councillor Turner, please. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of struggling to get a grip on get a stake in the ground here, sort of, you know, 14 months on and the project seems more like a legit, you know, a wobbly blob than it does a form structure of some sort. And the, the lines keep keep moving. So, um, you know, we had a, we had a, a presentation in, in, in October. Um, we were given a big figure on top of the first slide at half by the bottom of the second slide. And then, we got into the figures that are publicly known now, 700 million for the buyout, 400 million for making space for water. There was another tens of millions there, a decent sum, especially for Auckland Transport, all to help with recovery costs. And I'd sat there and in my mind been slicing chunks off as I heard different figures told to me. But but now I keep hearing about us negotiating and and you know and how you know and then the next and so that's a division where the line just seems to be going all over the place. And the next division is between recovery and preparedness. There's an ever-moving line there too, because, you know, in that preparedness space, 
there's a whole bunch of other council considerations and departments like you know modeling for the future and you know and all, and and drains being 100% blocked if they're under having to model them as if they're under 600 mils in diameter arguments between whether you should model 3.8 degrees or 2 to 0.1 degrees C I'm not trying to sidetrack the discussion I'm just trying to say that I can't get a handle on this thing of where we're actually at I'd like to know how much we've spent on our process and how much is left to pay people yeah, thanks, Councillor. Um, you're right, it is really difficult to get a handle on. Um, all of the things that, that, that you've talked about in terms of the, the numbers that were negotiated last year with central government, you know, 700 million this, et cetera, et cetera, were all estimates. Estimates before we barely started categorization, barely begun to implement the categorization process and, and, and understand the reality of what is now unfolding in front of us as we get really, really stuck into the categorization. Excuse, but the, the, the thick figure of what you've got to spend wasn't an estimate, was it? We were, you know, well, it was a billion dollars from each of us, wasn't it? It was a billion from government, a billion from us, two billion locked in to this recovery thing. That's what happened at the beginning, correct? It's all based on estimates, an estimate of 700 Category 3 properties, an estimate of how difficult or easy dozens of 2C projects were going to be engineering solutions that had, could barely be considered because we hadn't got into the areas and started the categorization process, estimate upon estimate upon estimate. So, so I understand that. So are you telling me that those two big figures we heard, they too are legit... <laughs> Can be moved around. Are they? Are they? Were they only estimates too? I thought we'd been. I thought we'd agreed on a budget. The there is uh, there are specific elements of those uh, agreements with central government that are negotiable in good faith. Uh, once we get into the work on the ground, in particular the number of seven hundred category three homes. There's a clause in the agreement with government that if that 700 number that we base that calculation on is wrong, either up or down, particularly up, that they will talk to us in good faith about that number. I must stress that all the other regions are, are, are finding, you know, they're having to relook at these estimates as well now. I mean, if you look at the calculations that are done for Woody Debris on the East Coast, they've gone back to central government and have reopened the calculation. All we, of we, these works around the country were done upon estimates. We went to the public, though, because we had to, to to get a, a to, to you know for them to say yes, we can spend this money, and that was all just on an estimate. The, is that what you're telling me? The public said yes, and we even identified what it would affect the rates by and all that sort of stuff. How can it be an estimate? To to and and to finish the answer to your original question, councillor. Um, we have no intention and there is, is no indication that the overall envelope, the $2 billion that you talked about, is not sufficient. We're planning to and working to keep within that envelope, but part of the conversation is the different buckets, for want of a word, that make up that envelope and what the actual numbers for each of those buckets are now and, and flexibility between the buckets. Thank you. Got my first box squared up. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Henderson, please. Hey, thank you. Just um, picking up on the Deputy Mayor's question, because I, I've been really concerned about the health and wellbeing side of this. Um, hearing, you know, relationship breakdowns and severe mental health situations. Um, I'm concerned about the resourcing required. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that, whether you're hearing from providers that more resourcing is needed, and if there's anything we can do about that. Thanks, Councillor. Um, Look, I guess the first thing um, I want to reassure everyone here and those who are potentially listening online is that most people, no matter what terrible experience they had during their event, no matter how hard it is now, most people will get by just with support from their friends and their families. And the things that council does really, really well, like provide amazing libraries that provide opportunities for connections or local events that bring people together, that is a massive contributor 
to wellbeing. And for most people, that's going to be enough. So the more we can do are the things that council already does really well, the better. For those, more proportion, though, that do require more clinical kind of one-on-one -on -one support. Um, we, we, did, we certainly were hearing that there were issues um, pre-Christmas about extended waiting lists or no, no provision in the right places. And that was the point at which we went and talked to Te Whatuora and MSD about funding that they had received. Um, and we were able to bring that money into the recovery office and distribute it to community um, and social service and mental health providers to just get us through that little gap over Christmas. So that was great. We were able to get that money out quickly. We have since um, distributed a further $1.4 million to providers across the region doing a range of things, uh, right from kind of that one-on-one -on -one, uh, counselling support through to, uh, you know, activities that bring young people together or connect people back to the hour. Uh, so I'm feeling pretty good right now about where we're at for the next, um, probably through to the end of this year. Uh, my concern is probably in the longer term, but we, I think we've got time to work through that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. OK, and a lot of fully will complete the questions. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and thank you, team, for your hard work as well. Um, yeah, I'm just wanting to reflect back um, people in my community in Mangere who are affected, and I'm mindful that we've, we've talked a lot in the past about needing to prioritise areas like Mangere where we know it's, a, it's an area of high deprivation that was devastated by um, the weather events, and an area where many of the homeowners there who were affected are less likely to have the resources to respond on their own. Um, but I'm hearing more recently from the community that very few of them um, are being offered the buyouts or being categorised as Category 3. So I'm keen to hear and understand how we are prioritising Mangele if the result is actually very few will be offered buyouts. Um, and then I've got a couple of other questions as well. Kia ora. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, a couple of points. We... I've worked really closely with Kang Order over the last three or four months, um, in particular to support them to effectively categorise their homes in the same way that we're categorising everybody else's. So they're using the same um, metrics and process and, and approach to, to, to dealing with the homes that they have tenanted. And a considerable number of the homes that are affected in Mangere are Kang Order homes. So we intentionally did that and reached out to Kayang Order to help accelerate what was happening there because it's a, a, a subsequently small number really are private rather than Kayang Orders. Um, so they're making good progress in terms of categorization and inverted commas of the homes there. Um, we, we've begun now to segregate the 2C, the community level infrastructure projects around Auckland into three batches, for want of a better word. Um, there's a batch of projects which we think we can get done and completed and constructed within a couple of years, which seems as about as reasonable as it could get for someone to have to wait for a, a project to be completed to help protect their home. Two of those projects, those ones that we can prioritise and can get moving quickly, are in Mangere. Uh, two of the four, the top four that we can get going quickly will be a Mangere. Kia ora, thank you. That leads nicely to my next question, um, which is around the 2C projects. And, and I'm thankful to Caroline and Nick, who met with myself and Councillor Alf and Chair Tawanu, who explained that a little bit better. If those 2C projects do go ahead and we get the funding from the government, um, and I, what happens to the homes... Um, that are still intolerable risks to life if they don't have enough insurance, if they are not kanga order and they are privately owned, will they, if there are some homeowners in those 2C project areas who still might prefer to go for the buyout, are they able to do that or will they not be eligible because they're part of that 2C project? Um. There's a number of different ways of, 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 of answering that question. 
um, in terms of 2C versus Category 3, and, um, and, and, and we've broached this subject before with you about how long is too long for a homeowner to have to wait in a Category 2C situation until the infrastructure is built. That's next Wednesday's conversation. That's a key part of the workshop that we want to have with you next Wednesday to talk about that. How long is too long? When does the 2C become a Cat 3? Kia ora. Thank you, and I appreciate we've got that workshop coming up. And just last question, you asked for volunteers, and I know Councillor Alf, who's listening, is keen to volunteer as well. Um, yeah, would, would be keen to volunteer. What is it that you actually would require of us? Are we, can I throw him in the back of a van and we drive home to home door knocking? Or? <laughs> well, if he's still got bad knees, you might need to bring him in a van, eh? Um, the, yeah, an hour or two here and there. It's just some feedback on, we think this data would be useful to you, and you'd say, yes, it is, that's brilliant, or could you also add this, this, and this? Better. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, thanks very much for that. That was moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Mr Walker. Councillor Walker, all those in favour of accepting that and recognising that we have put a finished date for of the 30th of September on this. Please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, carried. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to move to item 11, which is the consideration of the 2024-25 Libre requests from the Museum of Transport and Technology and also the Auckland Regional Amenities Funding Board. This is two sort of items that are lumped together here. That's Motet and Arafa. It does seem unusual to have no one from Arafa Board here today to speak to their request for $18 million, but, which is about a million more than last year, but we, we do have the Motet Chair and Chief Executive lurking there somewhere. Uh, hands up, well done. Behind that insufferably tall fellow there who's in the road. Thank you. Um, welcome. This is just one example of a legislation dictated, dictated to us by Wellington. If there's any media still awake there. That makes no sense and we need changed. So we'll hear the presentations and ask the questions and staff will do their best to Arthur. Answer. I'd like to thank the Deputy Mayor, who's done a lot of work on this, along with her political working group, and particularly in lobbying Minister Goldsmith for his cha for changes associated with that, so thank you for that. Right, you guys, rattle off, and then we'll get some more interesting people up the front. Thank you, Your Worship. So, um, as you've set out this item, is concerning the levy requests for Mota and um, Arafa. For MOTAT, you have a relatively simple yes-no decision on whether to approve the 19,021,000 levy. Uh, Sarah is here to answer any questions, and as you've just done, acknowledged the uh, representatives of MOTAT uh, in the uh, gallery behind us. Um, and uh, in addition, um, we also have the uh, COO, Craig Hickman Goodall, who will soon be taking over as the uh, director. Also, we have TAU representatives who assess the levy ask uh, in the audience as well. Um, as it relates to ARAFA, your decision is different. Uh, you're not making a decision on the ARAFA levy today. That decision will happen next month. Uh, these resolutions about ARAFA are about providing feedback to the funding board on two specific issues. One, a recommendation that the funding board's pay not be increased for this year. And two, there's an issue of an um, the issue of the extra $500,000 that um, was proposed to be provided to the Auckland Theatre Company. Now, we are making the recommendations as it relates to the Auckland Theatre Company for two reasons. One, we don't think that uh, including the extra $500,000 is the best way to address the funding issue at this stage. And there's also the issue of an outstanding uh, ground lease, a uh, 4.9 million ground lease, which is yet to be resolved. So we'd like to take a bit of time to consider those um, issues together. Um, so therefore, the resolutions for you today are to the funding board, please amend the, le the levy request to remove uh, the border enumeration increase and the 500,000 increase for ATC to allow the council the opportunity to find a complete long-term solution for ATC. 
The other uh, resolutions relate to this, and they are to make it clear that uh, the that first resolution is not making a decision or not rejecting the levy. Uh, secondly, to ask staff to go away and bring back options to address ATC's funding issues. And also, um, there's a technical audit reason we need to provide an extension for the ground lease uh, for the, the ATC. So, um, just also to confirm that this approach, we've spoken to the funding board, the RAFA funding board, we've also spoken to the Auckland Theatre Company, and we also have um, Auckland Theatre Company CEO, chair and staff uh, in the gallery today as well. Um, their feedback is they're open to all options to solve this issue. Uh, their main concern is finding a solution and finding it quickly. Um, but with that said, we can take any questions. Deputy Mayor Simpson, please. Thanks, Chair. Look, I've just got three quick questions, um, more for clarification for everyone. So um, on the recommendation, by the way, those are the wrong recommendations. I think the team is sorting that out. On the recommendation around the um, AREFA remuneration, is this something that the board support? Yes. So thank you, right, Deputy thanks. Mayor. The, the board's been contacted and um, they understand council's decision, um, which the careful, the reasons for the decision they carefully set out in the report. Just checking that, thanks. And on the ATC, extra 500, is it true they only came to us less than a month ago? So what you're suggesting here is a bit more time to look at this. It's not a yes and it's not a no, just a little bit more time to look at their request around that because it was quite late to the party. Yeah, I think that's an accurate way to put it. And my last question is around the whole um, uh, Arafi lever, levy. And is it true that by law we can't approve sort of 99% of it and then come back with the other 1% or 2% that you've actually got to do it all in one go? So what we're really saying here is because you need a bit of time for Arafa, just park the whole thing for one more month and then come back with the, with the suite of stuff because of the binary decision that the legislation provides. Is that correct? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Your Worship, I'd just like to say something um, as well after the questions too, around the Chief Executive. I wouldn't dare stop you. Um, could I have Councillor Williamson? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I want to just follow through on the MOTAT issue. And I remember being in Parliament back in 2000 when Helen Clark moved the legislation to set up MOTAT. Uh, it had a paid staff of 10, and a budget of about $2 million at the time. And Section 15 of the Act requires that the Board appoint a Chief Executive who will imbue the paid and unpaid employees of the museum with a spirit of service to the community and will promote efficiency in the museum. Now, at the time, and it was made clear to the Select Committee, MOTAT was about a huge chunk of volunteers, 487 at the peak, and 10 staff. What I don't understand is how we've now got a situation where there is 110 staff, the volunteer numbers have collapsed, the funding is now 18 million per annum. It seems to me that a complete antithesis of what the legislation set up by Helen Clark as the local member and the Minister for Culture and Heritage was supposed to do and at a time when a huge number of our population are into their 70s and so on and want to do volunteer work, I would have thought there's no better time to have had huge numbers. And so I want to know from you why um, the 110 staff that are costing us nine, nearly 10, just on $10 million is where this place has gone to compared to where it was supposed to have gone to. Um, I might ask um, Helen and Michael if they'd like to. Oh, definitely. Tēnā koutou katoa, kō mako flori ahau, kai tia kawa hatu And on my right is my uh, um, chair, Helen. I was going to say Helen Clark. Helen, Helen <laughs> Atkins got Helen Clark on the thing. As the councillor will know, when he was sitting in Parliament, the reason that this uh, legislation was passed was that MOTAT was in bankruptcy and it needed money. And that's one of the driving uh, reasons behind the statute. The reason it was in difficulty was because it was a volunteer-run organisation. 
You are talking 24 years ago. So if you're looking at staff numbers and budget numbers, you only have to look at the council and look at how much that has grown over the same intervening 24 um, years. Morris is against that. Too. The, main, the main driver of MOTAP was to professionalise it, which is something that we have done. The figures that have been quoted about the volunteer numbers are inaccurate. I don't know where you got those figures from, but they're not right. I can tell you when I took over in 2013, the, we had on paper 300 volunteers, but the reality was most of those were either no longer with us for various reasons or um, were not participating in the museum because of their age. We currently have uh, 200 uh, volunteers. It has been more or less around that figure uh, since I have been running the museum. And we deliberately keep it at that level because if we tried, and what I think is behind the question is, is it being seriously suggested that MOTAT is run by volunteers with a budget that we're currently on by a staff of 10? It doesn't work that way. This is a seven day, 364 day operation covering 13 acres with security, health and safety and cultural issues that need to be dealt with and have been dealt with. And we are now having, uh, we now have in Auckland a professionally run transport and technology museum that Auckland can be proud of and the nation can be proud of to the point where we actually get our advice being sought internationally and both nationally uh, from Te Papa all the way down. So I don't know what is behind the question, but the other thing I should point out is that this annual plan process is set by the statute, which he would have um, supported when he was in Parliament. Every year we come to uh, Council and outline our annual plan, setting out our staffing numbers and what we intend to do it and what our objectives are. And leading up to that process, we spend a considerable amount of time working with Regional Facilities Auckland and now its successor to Taki Auckland Unlimited, uh, together with um, um, various other uh, stakeholders, including the MOTAT Society. So I am not sure what the point of the question, whether it was a statement, an observation or a question, but it's without factual foundation and I, I'm actually surprised that that's come out, actually. All right, well, let's do it then. Were there 10 full-time staff when the MOTAT Act was passed in 2000? Your pardon? Were there 10 full-time staff? I, I don't know, I wasn't there. Well, do you keep saying I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm asking you, were there 10? Um, I, I'm actually, what relevance does it have? Oh, it's got huge relevance if an organisation has gone from 10 to 110 staff, mm -hmm. full-time staff over that time. I think that has massive relevance. How? Oh, Money. okay. Any organisation that's had a, what is that, a tenfold increase in its staff mm -hmm. is something we should be concerned about. I'm actually, where is this going? I'm asking you the question, was it 10 and is it 110 now? It's actually 113 currently. Okay, is it 100? Okay. So you don't think there's something of a concern at an organisation? If I was on the board of any company and we had had 10 staff running an operation and now we had 113 doing that, I'd want to know why. Over a 24 year period? Yes. No. Actually, I don't think that's of any concern. Staff numbers shouldn't go up by very much compared to what maybe costs might with inflation. Well, what was the staff council? Mr. Yeah, Chair, Mr. Chair, this is an interrogation uh, bridging on execution. Can you please intervene? Oh. This is this is no, 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 this hang is on. not governance. He's got a thing about Morris. <laughs> got a thing the, about these, this is not an interrogation. This, this is a question where one of the councillors who is elected, who is entitled to ask questions, and he has noted that things have grown a lot over 24 years, and he's asked for an ex for the yes. and we've heard that it's professionalised. I'm not quite sure what that means. You guys, you told me that you're all professionals, and I'm not sure what the difference between that and a person who's just keen on their job is. But um, so I think that it, I'll, I'll let this run a little bit, but all right, I don't I'll... want it to get hostile. It's got to be done That's in true. a manner which is calm, but. Councils are entitled to request um, information, and the gentleman here is, is entitled to provide answers. So through That's the council, through the councillor, I was brought in on the back of a report 
produced by Dame Cheryl Sutherland, which painted a pretty dire picture of what MOTAT was being operated like with its staff and its volunteers. So I was brought in to professionalise that museum, and that's what I've done. And so, yes, we've got 114 dedicated staff that concentrate on the care of our collection, providing education services to 35,000 students per annum, who put on events like Christmas lights, and have actually um, bought back a professional approach to the collection care and management. So I, I'm flabbergasted that if there's any suggestion that you can run MOTAT with a staff of 10 and volunteers, we have a dedicated volunteer base. And as I said before, I don't know where the figure of 480s come from, because when I started there, we had 300. But the reality is when we actually went through the figures in 2013, we had 200 volunteers. And we have still got approximately 200 volunteers who are dedicated to the care and running and operation of the collection. That's what they like doing. They do not like, um, or we don't have volunteers that are focusing on the education program. And the other thing we've actually discovered that by running our tram operation, for example, if we rely on volunteers alone, we cannot provide a reliable service. That's no reflection on them. It's just the fact that they've got other things to do because they are of the age where they've got grandchildren and other sort of demands on their time. So what we do is we have professional tram drivers, which are included in the 114 staff there, supported by volunteers. And you can dovetail that through the whole museum. We have volunteers supporting staff. But the suggestion that we go back to the way it was when I took over, I, I would refute that. It was a mess. And so we have spent the last 12 years turning MOTAT into something that people can be proud of. You no longer said, see headlines of fraud, management in disarray, volunteers in uproar, and all those sort of things that, you know, you only have to do a Google search, it's all there for people to see. So we have professionalised the museum. It's a museum, as I said before, Auckland can be proud of, the country can be proud of, and I'm leaving it in a far superior um, state than when I took it over back in 2013. Okay. I don't know if my chair wants to say anything um, in relation to this. Well, I might just add a little bit to that question, because whilst Councillor has pointed out that the costs have written from 2 million to 18, and uh, it's much more professional and better run than it was. Uh, what are the visitors' um, numbers and income uh, changed in that period? Um, I can give you the last uh, five years um, on that. So the visitors um, have gone from, in 2019, we had uh, 205,000. Uh, we peaked up pre-COVID at 265, then of course uh, they've come down during the COVID period, uh, then hit 233 and they're now at 208,000. Uh, we're aiming to push that back up to the 240, 260 mark. One of the reasons why it's dipped is because as outlined in our draft annual plan, uh, we have had part of the museum closed while we re-roofed uh, one of our major buildings and put in the SciTech uh, Centre, which is referred to in our annual plan. Um, and so as a, a visitor attraction, it's, it's dropped down slightly, but the numbers are going back up. And admission revenue, um, it's 1.1 through to um, back in 2019, and it's currently at 1.6 uh, million. So, um, yeah. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I've got uh, that shows me that the cost per visitor is $86, which is pretty bloody expensive, I'd have thought. And, um, and the, the income per uh, visitor is only about $8, if that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's massively subsidised. It puts public, um, public transport into... into uh, Shame, really. That's, that's so, you... I mean, that, that is an item that is that is needs to be thought through. I mean, that's. It, 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 I like the museum. I must admit, but I didn't realise it was cost at eighty-six dollars per visit. 
But if you do with the through compared to eight dollars received, um, th that's kind of frightening, really. Just, just what, through what's you. the value there? What's the value so, proposition I'm missing? So just through you, um, uh, Mayor, the, the the situation at Motet, the visitor numbers are just a part of the equation. Obviously, it runs a very extensive education program, which is run through the Ministry of Education. Um, it does a lot of outreach um, activities, including both in terms of research, and also it sends out, you know, these these small sort of STEM um, equipment out to schools that can't get to Motet. I think the visitor numbers themselves don't really paint the entire picture, but you're quite correct. There is an element of subsidisation, as there is for all of the institutes like uh, Motet in Auckland. And as you know, and you've charged um, the Deputy Mayor with the responsibility of running the political working group, which we're working with, with a view to reporting back to you on where to for this institution and others um, going forward, because I think you noted at the outset some concerns you have with regard to the legislation, and to a certain extent the councillor's previous questions date back to that time when that legislation was put in place. And I can tell you that from the board's perspective, and being chair of the board, we are completely open to discussing um, those matters with the political working group with a view to bringing something to the council, I think it was, toward the end of June. All right, that's fair enough. But if the Ministry of Education is involved, are they contributing to the cost through of the education? Do. Through the chair. So yes. that you've got, another, you've got more money coming in on top of that. But that still comes back to 86 bucks no, through, through the chair, the, you can apply that mathematical formula to any institution in, in, in New Zealand. To Papa, doesn't matter. You will get a similar figure. The other thing that you've got to factor in is it's not just about the visitors, it's about the maintenance, preservation, conservation of our um, nation's heritage. And there is a cost associated with that. There's a storage cost associated with that. So applying a, a cost this divided by the number of visitors is a very blunt instrument for analysing what um, the, the makeup and value of an institution like MOTAT or an art gallery is. There are a whole pile of other things that happen behind the scenes that museums have to do. We have to preserve the history. That's our, in our brief, it's in our act. We maintain and look after our heritage. And there is a cost, and that's a significant cost associated with that. Well, there's an $18 million cost to rate pay as well, and you've got to be able to defend that, and I have to defend that as well. And so, I mean, you, you shouldn't bridle at being asked oh, no, to I'm question not that I'm not dollars per head the, is a, No, I'm not bridling against that. That is a very a fair question. Uh, uh, I, mean, I, I will bribing. ask exactly yeah. the same of the theatres that come in front of us. And we had the Q Theatre in recently, and we did that thing, and they weren't that far off breaking even. In fact, if we told you we added 10 bucks a shot coming in, they'd break even, and I'm blowed if I know why they don't. Yeah. But you've got to add $80 a shot, and I don't think a lot of people would come. And then you've got to examine the other thing. If your costs, I'm going to be harsh about this, but not you know everything's a business. Um, and uh, but a point uh, of order. No, uh, there's no point of order. Is this a question, Mayor? Because it is an interrogation. This is the person who yeah. I'm asking about. So don't interrupt. Asked a point of order. I'm just asking this, the person in charge of it to justify 18 million dollars to me. On the, and I'm going to vote on this thing shortly, probably in favour of it, but I want to, but if you've got a lot of stuff that's stored that no one's looking at, sell it. That preserves it. You, oh, uh, um, OK. Um, yeah. Is that a question? You're suggesting that we I'm asking sell, you, asking, we is, sell is there some New stuff Zealand's that you heritage. would rationalise within your stuff? Because if we're storing it for no one to look at it... You can't sell heritage. There is a whole pile of museum ethics and code around the storage and disposal of museum objects. You can't just sell them. You have to offer them up to other museums. You have to offer them back to the original donor. There is no magic panacea, let's sell the Solent flying boat that somehow produces a huge amount of money. It doesn't work like that in the museum world. What's behind your question is, is how important is arts, culture and heritage to Auckland? 
by all, you know, if you're sitting there behind the question saying, let's get rid of all these things because they cost $80 per person, what's the city going to be like without arts, culture and heritage? Now, that's, that's a much broader question. Well, you were on the cusp question. of a broader question. That's well, exactly the broader question at. was that the Q Theatre is only within $10 but the Q Theatre you are eighty yes, but dollars the Q away Theater from it. doesn't have a heritage collection that it's got to preserve. I mean, we I went to the uh, vintage car thing just recently, and there's lots of them preserved there without a museum. I'm not sure I understand the point of that. There's car clubs all over New Zealand where individuals with passion pay for their individual cars. And the uh, we, are, we, are, we are tasked by statute to preserve Auckland and the nation's heritage. OK, well, I'll finish <coughs> it there and ask Ken Turner to ask his... Thank you very much. <clears throat> and there's no disrespect to your efforts or the work you've put into turning around financially. I have been approached by people in the trade. You know, I'm 66 and I mix with the tradies. I have talked just recently at some length about MOTAT because I've been involved in a little thing to do with a rail licence and stuff like that and mixed with, with people, present and ex-volunteers of MOTAT. There's a perception, I think I've, I did a little bit of Googling a couple of weeks ago, not realising this meeting was coming. There's a bit of change of direction, am I correct, in MOTAT from you know, old clunkers to more of a science future-based presentation. Is that wrong or right? right, or right? Uh, no, it's, it's partially right. So going back to what MOTAT is about, MOTAT is about transport and technology. And behind technology is science. And behind science is science, technology, engineering and maths. In order to understand the technology and the transport items, you have to have science. So we are focusing on both the transport and technology items and pulling out the science. So we're not just telling the historical um, stories behind the objects themselves, we're explaining how the objects work. What are the scientific principles behind it? So there's a slight shift, but I know, and I know the sort of discussion you've had is that the focus has moved away from transport and now it's getting into science and it's, it's not um, in accordance with the Act. That is wrong. And in actual fact, we are still collecting significantly um, more transport and technology items than we have in the past. And what we're actually also doing is collecting the latest technology and transport. So it's not just stuck in a 1970s, 80s time warp. We're bringing that technology and stuff up to date. The other thing I would point out is that the building that we're in the process of um, putting, we've put the new roof on and we're putting the SciTech Centre in. That building was funded by the Ministry of Education as a science centre back in 1970. It was opened by, I think it was Prince Edward, as a science centre. It, had, it lasted one year before it became full of transport objects. What we're doing is taking it back to its original mana as a science centre. But inside that science centre, we are putting heritage objects so that we can go back and explain how do they work. So the two are interconnected, or the three are interconnected. Transport, technology and science are all interconnected. Thank you very much. If I could just give the feedback. I commend the science. There's a lot of mechanics out there who don't understand that brakes actually dissipate energy. They don't actually you know, lock something up. But my oldest son, 40, with these two boys, went there about, went to Motad about six or seven months ago, before I even knew about the subject. He's a tradie, he works on heavy, big equipment, specialised equipment, took his two sons, who were Westies on their little motorbikes at three and, well, now five and seven uh, at this age. And he said it wasn't what he expected and he didn't get out of it what he went there for. So I'll just give you that feedback. That's why I triggered into some of the comments that have been made to me. So yeah. thank Which you. Which is exactly what we're trying to do. I'm not sure what he was what he was actually looking for. What he, what he was looking for was old fashioned clunkers to show them how it used to be in the old days. Oh. Yeah, that's interesting because we've got a whole ex exhibit area that deals with exactly that. Maybe you didn't find it. Thank you very much. Council on Newman, please. 
Thank you. It's been an interesting exchange this afternoon, and I, I commend you for giving, giving your view and for receiving the questions. And this should be a place where questions are asked and answered. Yes. Um, my, question, my questions go to, um, and I'm not on the Working Party, but just talking about the, the, uh, the revenue assumptions, um, going back to that. So you're looking at um, the levy request and 86% of, which comprises 86% of the total revenue. So that nets out at 2.66 million that comes from other sources. Can I just get clarity? What, what of the 2.66 million, how much of that is, is essentially paid for by takings at the gate? And how much of that is, is paid for by the Ministry of Education? And, and, and then what's left over? Okay, so um, just give you sort of this, the emission revenue, 1.6 million. Uh, commercial revenue is uh, about 577. And I think at uh, the top of my head, it's about 140,000 from the Ministry of um, um, Education, plus these uh, grants and other, um, you know, lottery grants and other uh, funding sources. Um, plus, uh, there is a partnership with Samsung, um, uh, which we're in the process of finalising, and, and, you know, and other bits and pieces where people are uh, supporting various aspects of the museum. Okay, so that 140,000 from, from the Ministry of Education. Um, so, could I describe that as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, as an annual gift for for your contribution towards supporting STEM as an education <coughs> offering within primary and intermediate schools or no um, it's not a gift it's actually part of the it used to be the learning outside the classroom um, arrangements it's now um, the ECE uh, can you remember what, what that's something like um, curriculum education it's it's part and parcel of providing um, schools with a specific uh, program so when schools come and visit they go through um, um, experiences at MOTAP that are in line with the Ministry's curriculum. What's the chance that you could, over the next five years, say, look at uh, maybe a, I don't know, a ten percent increase in the amount of revenue that you take um, as a share via admissions, and and maybe looking to try and and drive up the ministry's contribution? I don't know how that ministry contribution works, but I'd like to. I mean, to me, to me, I mean, I, I love Motet. I think it's great. But it's an eye-watering sum of funding as a share of your operation. I'm not trying to be disparaging, but it's a, it's a large sum. And, and you know, in a, in a very cost-constrained environment, I'm just wondering how quickly could you dial up your revenue from other sources? Um, because you never know how long that statutory monopoly is going to exist? So, just through you, Chair, I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, given that Michael, as you've heard, is um, leaving the museum shortly, and Craig, who's taking on, over from him, is sitting behind me, um, look, the funding issue is absolutely top of the list in terms of the considerations of both the board and the senior management team. Um, we are looking at all of the things you've mentioned as a way of uh, increasing the overall um, situation so that, so that we can have a meaningful conversation with Council about um, you know, the reliance on that number. And we're absolutely um, open to doing that. And, and just on that, um, and this ties in very well to the next item, I think, on the agenda, which is the resolution that you'll be asked to consider for the um, War Memorial Museum. Now, the recommendation in that report is to accept a three-year funding agreement. And I can say um, categorically that from the board of MOTAT, if you accept that resolution from the War Memorial, we will be looking to do something similar with, uh, with Auckland Council, which will do two things. 
One, it will certainly be focusing our minds in those areas that you've asked about, Council Newman, but also it will be um, assisting both us and both Council in terms of the security around the numbers and the number itself looking forward. So I want to assure you that the reason we're not here talking about a three-year funding agreement today is because, well, we, we weren't, we, we were really interested to know how the War Memorial Museum goes first, to be quite frank. Um, and if it's successful at this meeting, then we will be certainly discussing that with the political working group when we meet with them in about two or three weeks. So thank you. Fair enough, Council Hills. Um, I, well, I guess I was before everything kind of went um, sideways. I was going to ask around, you know, what have been the sort of increases. I mean, we go there with Theo and the cafe and um, gift shop, which are revenue streams alone would be over ten stuff. So I mean, I, I'm trying to understand the changes over twenty years, if that and I can't find any documentation of just 10 staff running the place, but my understanding of just security and people, you know, what are the changes over a 24 year period, um, as I've seen? The volunteers are great, but you need to have that base of... Yeah, so um, Motet's broken into three component parts. You've got the collection side, which I alluded to before, which is around the storage, maintenance, preservation, um, and operation of heritage collection objects, and that takes a lot of management. The security alone, we're covering uh, three sites, covering over 13 um, acres, uh, so we have security uh, guards, um, cameras, the whole works that goes with that. Uh, we have, um, you alluded to it, we've got um, uh, staff and shops, we've got hosts keeping an eye on the um, exhibition floors to make sure that, uh, um, and to answer any questions. Uh, that visitors may have. Um, and then we've just got a team that actually managing the volunteer side of it is takes a couple of people alone. Um, but we are talking 24 years. We are talking, I don't, the visitor numbers were a lot less back um, back then. They've grown. Um, and has, as has the complexity of operating something of that size. We've got health and safety issues. Uh, we run a train, tram, System, so we are subjected to the same uh, legislative scrutiny as Kiwi Rail uh, with our operations. So the the whole complexity of the operation over 24 years is is is, is grown significantly. And my understanding, you know, although it was controversial, it was yourself and others who pushed to have things like paid parking and other things to help supplement. Yeah, so, so um, one of the reasons that we've got a loan currently is we developed um, paid car parking over at uh, our Motions Road site. Uh, one of the reasons for that was we foresaw that the Miola Road would be closed and that parking would be removed off that, um, um, off that roading and it would be pushed up into the museum and so we took the opportunity to develop a car park there that generates uh, revenue currently around about the eight thousand dollars per month um, side of things uh, it's a relatively small car park but we do that in conjunction with the um, Auckland Zoo uh, so we've got that aspect of it as as well but that required us putting in quite a complex uh, stormwater system, the water that goes through, down through the stormwater system and goes into the Miola Creek is, I'm told by our engineers, good enough to drink. I wouldn't test it myself, but um, uh, that's what they've told. So we spent a considerable amount of money making sure that um, that was, uh, um, the car park was done well. And we have stage two when we can um, afford to do that or in discussions with Auckland Transport, looking at developing the rest of that in order to support the removal of the cars off Miola Road. But that's just one of the initiatives where, you know, generating income from um, a car park source. And the the events, like you never, I don't remember you having the, so we go to the Christmas lights and all the big events now. I mean, how many staff does it take to, are, sure, are those paid on your books or are those contractors? <coughs> those are paid. Uh, we have contractors put in the lights for Christmas lights, but just to put that in perspective, we had something like uh, 53,000 people through for Christmas lights. 
Uh, that was a paid event. The Mayor will be pleased to know that that should we made money out of that. Um, so, uh, and that's an event where you're bringing people in to Christmas lights, it's showing Motat in a, a literally, no pun intended, a different light. But we also have exhibition spaces open so that people can actually see the um, heritage and learn about the technology and the science associated with it. And my last question, just, and you have fed this back to us over many years, and I know you're working with Tataki, but haven't some of the big increases been because of the state of the buildings? Like, yeah. either we have to decide to let, you know, have these big increases, or you just demolish the buildings, or... Yeah, uh, well... So, I don't know if people understand that you've got huge number of buildings there, but they're all falling, not all mm, falling apart, but yeah, this so, is not operating... Yeah, so one of the reasons for our levy request um, over the period since I've been at MOTAT is to address the capital infrastructure issues. So we have a significant number of buildings that have encapsulated asbestos in them. Uh, they are old. They were never designed to be museum buildings. They were ex-school buildings or something else from the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, they are um, starting to deteriorate, so we are either replacing them or removing them as and where we can. Uh, take, for example, the building that I referred to, the SciTech Centre. That roof was leaking and was about to collapse, so we've just spent quite a lot of money on that building, and in the draft annual plan that's before the councillors, there's reference to the pump house roof. That needs to be replaced, and the irony of that is we don't actually own the pump house, the council does. Um, we are liable for its maintenance, upkeep, and all that sort of stuff under our lease, um, but we don't have the money. The only source of money that we have to be able to do that heritage building up is through our levy. Uh, so the levy is not just for staffing, it is to deal with significant capital costs and um, other operational costs associated with an ageing infrastructure. Thank you for that. Councillor Lee. So I, I don't want to make a comment. Um, I, I don't want to ask a question, I should say, Mr Mayor. I, I, I want to foreshadow that I'd like to move an amendment or an addendum to the recommendations, if I could, at the right time. You can. If you've got a second, you can do it now. Um, I, I nothing, nothing Put in, this, in, writing in the city bring it, generates bring passion um, like MOTAT, and um, much of the passion is, is very, very positive and creative, with especially the passion of the volunteers. Um, there have been complaints, and there are complaints and concerns about MOTAT made to us as elected representatives. And it's our job to take these complaints seriously, just as the director of MOTAD has a job to run a, a technology museum. We have an obligation to ensure, especially under the MOTAD Act, um, that MOTAD is being run properly. And if people are complaining about it, people closely associated with the organisation, we can't be blamed for taking up those concerns, that's our job. And if we didn't take up those concerns, we wouldn't be doing our job. So what, what Mr Frawley has in defence, and there's no need for him to be so defensive, has pointed at, when it came to staff numbers, has pointed at the council staff numbers. Well, he may have a point. However, I, I think it's, it's not really appropriate. However, um, if we are concerned about the whole group, well, having a look at the situation in MOTAT may be very instructive for everyone. And so what I would like to move is that um, the Chief Executive be authorised to um, uh, review the performance of MOTAT with reference to the Museum um, of Transport and Technology Act year 2000, um, um, and to look at its um, finances and governance situation. Um, I, I'd like to move that if I could, Mr Mayor. Uh, are we still in questions? The, the staff are still at the table. Are we in debate now, or are we in... Where, where are we? A motion on the it 
He's proposed. It's not an amendment. Yes, I, I'm. I'm getting a little bit of advice here, as well. I want to. I want to make sure that the, um, you know, that there's some. I suppose role clarity here and a respect for the relationship with MOTAT. Um, if if the sentiment here mm. is that we need to dig into, or rather, not the right words, uh, uh, look at this, then you know I would choose to do that in a uh, in a collaborative fashion with um, with MOTAT. But this is really the point of the political working party as well. Um, right to have that engagement. So, yeah, I just want to. Yeah, a lot of it. Uh, whether it's appropriate depends a little bit on uh, on uh, how we approach the the job of working with MoTet to to um, provide a full picture, financial and otherwise, to you. Your Worship, could I help, please? Because I think um, Councillor Lee is correct. He wants to um, get a bit of a wider picture. And what he's actually asking for by way of resolution is in the terms of reference for the political working party. So I'm happy to move the recommendations, if you'd like to second. Yes. Um, and I'm actually really relaxed on whether Councillor Lee's, you know, if he's really passionate and he wants his extra recommendation put in. Um, but I would just want to give him the confidence that what he is requesting is indeed happening as part of the uh, political working group, and indeed, in fact, if Ms Mullen would like to come forward, can confirm for us that what Councillor Lee's asking is actually in the terms of reference. No. It's been moved and so it's I'm been seconded and it's been accepted. There is an addition to this, so we'll have an H or a G, rather, adding on, doing the same thing, and I'm quite happy about that. No, we'll get the wording right in a minute, but calm yeah. down, everybody. I'll go to the next question, which is from John whilst the wordsmiths are going. OK, um, th thank you, Mr Mayor. And um, just uh, the, the various interchanges there uh, prompted me to have a little closer look at the uh, indicative budget that we are considering today via the, the levy. And I just wonder if I could um, get a little bit more information. So when I come to the, the VEX question of, of staffing, um, I see that... Uh, this 2023-24, the, the staffing cost is 10.03 um, million, and and that constitutes roughly 51% of the total cost of activities. Is that correct? So staffing is over is over half the the cost of activities. No, it's 46% under the um, document in front of you. OK, well, that's, that's not what's, what's in your own plan here. If I look at the subsequent years, that staffing cost then just keeps going up about, on average, about 400 grand a year until 2027, 28, um, where, where the overall increase then over that period is 1.6 million. So I guess what I'm really asking is, given a situation where the staffing cost is uh, over 50% of the, the total cost of activities, and it keeps going up about 400 grand cumulatively, 1.6 million. In light of the visitor growth numbers I heard about, which um, you know relatively static, um, what what is attributing to that continually climbing staff cost, which is already at a very high um. high level as a proportion? Pay rises, and in actual fact, it's not static visitation. Under that document, the visitation goes up. Whichever way you want to cut it, it it's below 50%. So as staff costs go up, so does revenue, and so does visitation numbers. And and I can give you the figures for well, I did give you the figures. I've got them um, through through the council staff last night. Our um, revenue to staff cost goes 2019 42%, 48%, 45%, 42%, currently 43 It's anticipated to be 46% under the draft annual plan, not over 50%. 
So I guess just from our perspective, we, we have a, we have a situation where that that overall levy keeps going up, like as indeed other entities do. do. But in this instance, it's with a, a high staffing component and uh, relatively limited visitor growth. So I guess that's the point I'm making. You said it in one of your answers that you know the the, the situation you inherited. What was a was a rather vexed one, but but things have been relatively um, um, peaceful on that front since then. You've just you've just concluded, I think, a, a draft annual plan consultation process. Jeez, <laughs> I was that okay? Oh, okay, uh, Councillor Hey, Darby. Phil, you're not helping. Oh. Please respect the speaker. Um, Watson had some good points <coughs> there, and everyone's meddling and talking. Um, the hey, questions hey. why we're about <laughs> so much steady for, uh, increase. My elo eloquent concentration on my wording. Well, we'd be happy no one was listening. Was anyone listening? Yeah, have another go, John. Thank you, Alistair. Okay, so I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll briefly sum that. My understanding of your question was that it's been going up 400,000 a year for staff, and there's not much growth in the uh, visitor numbers. The and, gentleman and responded that the, the percentage of that against income, but in fact it's not <coughs> income; it's granted uh, grants and visit income. Uh, and I get both of that, but I'm just saying that right at the moment there's a hell of a lot of businesses out there that are cutting their costs, and it doesn't sound as though you guys are. You're just accepting things are going to go up and up and up, and I don't like hearing that. Uh, we cut our costs for the last three years. Um, you're, the, the, um, the Worship will remember last year we actually went below. We went backwards in our levy. Um, and you went in and said you should all take a page out of Motat's book, quote, unquote. So we've been static for three years, but given the um, infrastructure challenges that we have, we can't stay static. Um, we run a very tight ship, uh, but you know there comes a point at which we have to deal with um, uh, salary increases. We have to deal with infrastructural issues. We have to deal with things like the pump house. If we don't address them, they get worse and they cost even more to fix. So, uh, f uh, final question, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I'll, I'll maybe reserve the right to speak to that. And, and it goes to the notion of, um, you know, relative transformation over the over the last decade or whatever it is. You've just finished a um, your own consultation process, I think, on your draft annual plan. Um, did, did you did you receive any um, submissions from any organisations? Um, asking for a, a full public dialogue and review and direction and focus of MOTAT? Just um, through you, Chair, um, we have just completed the draft annual plan consultation process. We did not receive any submissions um, along the lines that you have asked about the question regarding a full public dialogue. We did receive submissions from some um, organisations seeking money from MOTAT. Um, and we received uh, a, a brief submission, which we've had in the past, regarding uh, you know the way in which um, MOTAT, the way in which MOTAT is focusing. We've addressed those through a full public process. We've responded to those submissions, but in terms of the kind of questioning that has happened here today, on nothing along those lines um, was presented at the uh, draft annual plan process. Through, through the chair, we did get a request from Mr Rayner, um, who I understand has been in contact with um, several councillors about exactly the um, points that have been raised uh, during questioning. Um, so, uh, yes, he suggested that we had a full-blown uh, discussion around MOTAT's future and all that sort of stuff, but going back to where we were before, that is one of the purposes of the political working group. And secondly, we are a independent statutory entity, the statute sets out the process which we are to follow. Um, so I know that Mr Rayner has been advocating and pushing quite hard on the edges, and I also know that he is probably the source of, uh, the volunteers are saying this, the volunteers are saying that, but Mr Rayner has not been um, involved with the volunteers for a number of years, 
and he only turns up on site when he's there for a MOTAT Society committee meeting. Um, but yes, he made that request. So, so I'm, I'm just trying to clarify. One answer said no, you hadn't. The other answer not, said yes, you had. Not specifically along the lines well, that have been asked here today. Okay, so well, I just read verbatim from the submission that wasn't just from Mr Rayner, it was from the Grey Power North Shore Association, submission to the MOTAT draft annual plan dated January 25th. Uh, through the Chair, that um, Grey Power uh, submission was signed by Mr Rayner. On behalf of Grey Power. Yeah, and he also made one in his own name. I just let you out of no idea who Mr Rayner has and he hasn't contacted me. Mr Rayner was the, um, he's a, uh, sits on the MOTAT Society Committee. He used to be the registrar at the, the MOTAT um, before the, I think it was before the legislation was passed. Um, he is passionate about the transport heritage of um, Auckland. Um, he has very strong views about the way uh, MOTAT should be managed, run and orientated. Um, he puts in a submission on behalf of Grey Power North Shore every year and he usually puts in one um, in his own right as well, which the councillor has read out. Uh, so uh, Mr Rayner is well known to us um, and in fact he used to be on our board uh, for a couple of years. The councillor read out the Grey Power submission, not Mr Rayner's. It's signed by Mr Rayner. OK, uh, sounds like not going to clear answer that, so we'll go to Councillor Furley. Uh, kia ora. thank you, Your Worship, and thank you um, for the presentation as well. I just want to start by saying that um, I've enjoyed coming to MOTAT since I was a little girl, and I remember well some of the sessions we had um, as a good little girl growing up in Ōtara where we would come and have sessions where we learned about how people used to make butter and how people used to write on slate. So those are some really awesome memories that I have. Just a question then on the benefit and the value of what you offer um, beyond the financial benefit, because I think perhaps people are very focused on the, the dollars, but it's the other benefit. As a, a young person growing up in Ōtara, um, having that experience at MOTAT, and even for my son, generations later, um, decades later, um, coming to MOTAT and experiencing the tech world in, in a different way. Can you, are you able to, to quantify or, or are you able to speak to that benefit outside of the financial benefit? Yes. And then also my second question is, if we were to add 10 or $20 to the admission, what effect would that have on accessibility for communities like mine in Ōtara, Papatoitoi, Mangele, Ōtahu, South Auckland? So, dealing with the benefit question first is there is a very strong element of education through it. Um, and that we, we, we start our education programs or experiences aimed at the under fives, and that goes all the way up to uh, 11. Uh, picking up the earlier question around science and technology, <coughs> excuse me, um, we're doing that deliberately because the school system uh, hasn't been focusing on science the technology, engineering and mass aspects. So we see that as an important element to focus on. So using the heritage objects to tell that educational um, aspect with the view that you know it, children then embrace and go, well, mathematics isn't boring, Engine engineering isn't boring. I've seen what it can do. I want to learn more about that. I want to stay at school and I want to go off to university and learn more. So we are deliberately focusing on that. To put our demographic into perspective, 89% of our visitors are families with children under the age of 11. The only other institution in Auckland that has that demographic is Auckland Zoo. Uh, Auckland Museum is similar to, uh, graphic to us, but when it comes to that very strong family side, that's what we focus on. If we were to put our prices up, we would lose the South Auckland um, visitation. And we are very conscious of that. We would, um, if we wanted to increase our visitation numbers, we could just stop charging entry. Our visitation would go up, but we would have to increase the staffing numbers because we aren't set up to deal with when the one month we have free, um, free entry to MOTAT was offered, we had 70,000 visitors through. We aren't geared to cope with that volume of visitation. 
So we're very conscious, we are looking at the pricing of our um, entry, but we are very conscious of what that slight increase can do to that particular demographic, which is very important to us. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Five to go. Councillor Alf Philippina, are you out there, Alf? Yes, I am, Your Worship, and um, thank you. Tēnā koe te rangatire mai ko ngā mihi ki a koe mō tō aroha mahi koutou. Tēnā koe. Mai ko, look, I've just got two very quick uh, questions. One of them is, um, I know that uh, supporting the community is a very big part of the museum. And I understand that uh, MOTAT commits to helping 10 community or charitable group, groups every month. How is that tracking, please? Uh, kia ora, uh, Namihi, uh, Elf, for your um, opening uh, uh, comments. Um, yes, we, we do. We, we provide a lot of uh, community support. I suppose a very good example of that was Pacifica, uh, which has just uh, uh, passed. We, we opened the museum up uh, free. Uh, we had our colleagues from the Auckland Museum, Star Dome, Maritime Museum and the Art Gallery on site. We did that to support both Tataki Auckland Unlimited but also the Pacifica community and we designed the experience on site specifically to address that. Uh, but we provide um, uh, food trucks to support, you know, free of charge entry to the museum um, at night, again, so people can experience the exhibitions in a different context. Uh, but that one's aimed at our local community to come in and, um, and basically uh, other communities, uh, um, uh, organisations, uh, we're happy to help them wherever we can. So that's built into to our objectives, uh, that community support. But like I say, probably our best example of that is the recent Pacifica one. To them. And the last part I um, might call is in regards to, um, can you confirm for me that um, in the aviation hall you have uh, Te Kōtiu and that story is from the sky. Can you just sort of confirm that um, it's been shortlisted for a, a, uh, the museum and heritage best use of digital and international award? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, that that that's a digital experience which is um, uh, projected onto the side of the airplanes, and it tells the story from uh, Māori kites, a kite, um, all the way through to uh, the modern day, picking up the stories around Jean Batten, uh, Richard Pearce, uh, through the story on uh, teal, uh, etc. So yes, and it has been shortlisted uh, for the award. Okay, Good, uh, and. Um, Look, just, just to let you know, I will be available in May if you want it. Kia ora. Yeah. Kia ora. Excellent offer, thank you. Councillor Bartley, and then we'll go to vote. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Michael, and um, your chair for the presentation. Um, I was going to try and ask a question to say what I want to say, but I'm just going to say it. I apologise for the tone of the questioning that you've had to endure today. I think there's a way that we can ask our questions, but do it with respect, and I don't think that's been exercised in this meeting today. So I do apologise as someone sitting around this table. Um, I want to acknowledge the work that you do with your outreach, because you're not just the museum that stays there. I, I'm being honest, I didn't really read all your reports, but what I know about what you do is from the community. I'm on the Board of Trustees for a school in South Auckland in Mangere, Low Desile School, Māori Pacifica, and they're going out to MOTAT. And that's how they're getting their connection to science and technology, which they wouldn't normally get that opportunity through the curriculum. So I am grateful to MOTAT for what you're doing, for the institution that you are for this city. Uh, I don't have any other questions to um, throw at you. I just want to say that we do appreciate your work and what you're doing for our city. Thank you for that. That's the end of the questions and we'll have a bit of a debate if you guys will retire.
And our first person who is entering that is the Deputy Mayor, who is going to give us a bit of an address around the Arafa thing, because we got a bit tangled up with Motat there, because Arafa is tangled up amidst all the stuff. So off you uh, go, Deputy Mayor. Simpson. No, I'm not actually. I'm actually going to um, ask Michael to come back to the front, if I may, please. So, Michael, this is the last meeting uh, at Council for you as Chief Executive of MOTAT. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, your work in charge of that organisation. For those of you who don't know, Michael brought to MOTAT skills he had gained for many roles, but in particular almost two decades at a major London firm, uh, law firm, uh, Taylor Wessing, and at least five as its CEO and managing partner. When you arrived at MOTAT in 2013, the organisation had well-known issues as set out in Dame Cheryl Sutherland's report. In essence, that report said, get serious or shut down. So Michael set up reshaping MOTAT for, uh, for Auckland and improving the professionalism of the organisation to meet modern museum standards. The MOTAT Act is very prescriptive, but within this, Michael, you were able to shift the focus and ensure that uh, MOTAT engaged with a wide range of Auckland communities, including our young people, and towards a modern vision of a science that underpins the many wonderful transport and technology collections and objects that MOTAT holds. <coughs> More recently, I think you deserve significant kudos for how you led MOTAT through the COVID years. As Council, we asked for a significant restraint from you and your board, and you consistently responded to those requests. So thank you. And you did take a, a backward step around the, that time, and we are very grateful around that. At that time as well, you provided proactive and outward-looking leadership in the broader Auckland Museum sector around visitor and staff protocols through the many and sometimes confusing alert levels and traffic lights. You were generous in sharing those with other institutes, both in our city and indeed throughout the country. Michael, your tenure comes to an end at a very interesting time. It feels like MOTAT is approaching its next stage of evolution, both as a museum and also in its relationship with Auckland Council as its main funder. It is helpful then that you will not be lost quite yet, as I'm told you're staying on in an advisory capacity for some months. So in summary, you took an organisation that was widely seen as it being at war with itself and failing to one that is far more stable and ready now to look into the future. So thank you for that contribution. And I know that we all join with you in thanking you for what you have done for Auckland. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Philip Pine, you want to have another crack at the whip? Uh, no, look, I won't have another crack uh, because that was questions. Um, and if, if, if it's going to go to the vote, I'll just leave it at that. Kia ora. Okay, well, I think we have finished questions at long last. I didn't realise it was a speech coming up. Have uh, you got a question, Councillor Hills? No, I was just wanting to briefly speak on it. Well, I We've got in front of you something that's moved by the Deputy Mayor and seconded by Councillor Lee, and it has on a, a G, which wasn't there this morning. And um, so um, now it's open for debate. So, Councillor Hills, if you want to say something now, it's fine. Kia ora, thank you. And look, of course, we're supposed to question um, things that come to us. And some of us, well, I, I'll speak to my, for myself only, just didn't like the way. Um, some questions were asked, and the surprise nature, this has happened twice today, if people were given a chance to find details from 2000 before a meeting, I'm sure that all would have been laid out on the table quite easily. Um, when Michael, and thank you for your service to our city, um, Michael, the, when he took over, the whole point was it was in a dire state. I think, as someone said, the, the um, I think it was Deputy Mayor, that that actually it was completely dysfunctional. 
There was um, reports of childish behavior, misappropriation um, of funds, all sorts of different things. And Michael took over to try and turn that around. When Michael took over, there were 70 staff. So I'm not sure what happened between 2010 and, and the time that Michael took over, but there were 70 staff. So within a 10 year uh, time frame, it's not a huge increase. Um, but in that time, things have changed as well. If you look back to when MOTAP, when the legislation happened, they had under 90,000 visitors a year. So you are going to see an increase in the numbers of staff. Um, as someone mentioned, the mayor actually did congratulate, and I remember that they took an $80,000 cut last year. They were the only um, ones in this decision last year to take a reduction because they said didn't need it. In 2010, when the super city happened, they had to rebuild an, a $15 million uh, building for the aviation hall, which was put to be paid over levies over time. So it's very easy to point to the beginning and an end and go, how come inflation, you're not traveling? Well, staff costs, we know our inflation has gone up miles, but they're having to pay for buildings new and old um, through a levy. And as Michael mentioned, some of those buildings that the million dollars going to one of, our, one of their buildings this time is our building. If they gave up tomorrow, we'd be having to do that with the money instead of giving it to them to do it. So I just want to make sure that, of course, we need to do this. I'm happy with G because that's what actually happens anyway. But it's important also to recognize currently, whether we like the uh, legislation or not, they are independent from us. They give over more details than we than we get from most organizations already. Um, but I think it's important to note all the different things they do rather than just thinking they're doing the same as what they were doing 24 years ago. The other thing, Mayor, of course things cost money when they're public. Um, I, I, what do our libraries cost us? We don't charge people to go through there. I know some people uh, may want us to charge for libraries or sports fields or art or whatever it is, but there is a it's actually a very slim, if you look at the pie graphs for the annual budget, what we spend on arts, culture and heritage in this city is tiny compared to what um, cities in Australia, uh, around the world actually spend and compared to what we spend on water, roads and everything else, it is extremely small. So I think the conversation, if we don't like this, then the conversation, someone needs to put up a notice of motion and say, we want MOTAT to close down. I wouldn't support that, but it does require public funding to pub to, to uh, address and look after public assets. Of course, we should always be looking for efficiencies, but it did feel like the attack or the assumption was that, 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 the, that this shouldn't be happening or we shouldn't be having kids through the door or we should just charge $80 uh, per person on there. So um, just wanted to put that out there. But everything else is, is fine. Councillor Lee, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy with the with the amendment the way it has been incorporated. But I I believe there there are three salient aspects that should be included, and one is the Museum of Transport and Technology Act 2000, um, which underlines the importance and, if you will, the permanence of of MOTAT. The second aspect of it, and quite unique, is the um, Museum of Transport and Technology Society, which was also established by the Act. And finally, as part of that, um, are the volunteers. It's a very unique organisation. It's much beloved, and I think everyone in this room would, would support it. However, um, we do need to have a look at it, uh, what, 40... 24 years on after the establishment of the Act. And so I would request that the Act, the Society and the volunteers also be included um, in that review. Thank you. Yep. I think the governance covers that and it will look into those three things and that was a very good uh, 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 amendment. Thank you very often. And so I've now got Coun Councillor Watson. Yeah, thanks, Mr Mayor. And it's um, not just 24 years since the Act, it's actually 60 years since uh, MOTAT was established back in 1964. And, and as uh, a number of people have said, MOTAT is very dear to people from all over Auckland. Yeah. Uh, it's been part of our lives. I can remember our own family, the um, 
the very moving experience it always was going over to Motad and seeing the, the Lancaster bomber, which had a real meaning to the people in our family. And um, I can remember the last time we went with my grandkids, there was still a blacksmith there. I don't know if he's, he's still there or not. Yeah. And yeah. seeing my dad uh, <laughs> jump in behind and, and start whacking out a, a horseshoe, because he'd, he'd been a blacksmith himself, and that, that my little grandkids were there to see him in full full flight. And, and, the, and the blacksmith at Motat was uh, was kind enough to let him <laughs> take over <laughs> take over for his own little solo performance. So Motat is an intrinsic part of Auckland. So no one uh, is in any way suggesting it be closed down or prices Correct. put up. That's the last thing I want, and I'm sure anyone sitting in this room wants. Uh, but what the public wants and has a right to expect is that if councillors feel that it's necessary to answer, uh, ask questions on the basis of information they've received from co constituents, they should be able to do that. Uh, and often the tone of questioning is informed by the tone of answers too on some occasions, I might say. So from my perspective, um, all I was looking to clarify is what I, what I thought was a, a, a rather disproportionately high percentage of staff cost that, that might well be um, you know, f fully justified or, or, or required. I'm not really in a position to say either way, but I am in a position to ask of, of, a, of a staffing ratio as to the cost of activities that, that is over 50% and a circumstance where over a four or five year period those staff costs then go up uh, $1.6 million uh, while uh, the visitor growth level um, grows a little bit, but, but doesn't grow too much. It is relatively static, if, if I could generalise to that extent. I guess in terms of that 60-year um, hallmark for this, this wonderful institution of ours, um, it, 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 it probably is appropriate to, um, to, to look at um, how Motat has, has evolved. We, we all know things change, but as Councillor Lee pointed out, um, there is a very unique act that, that governs Motat and, and really emphasises that, that importance of, of the history of transport and technology and the conservation of the heritage of, of the museum, um, historical and scientific scholarship and research and so on. So that, that's entrenched in that legislation. And, and I would suggest it's entrenched in the psyche of Aucklanders who, who over decades have got such enjoyment uh, out of those features at, at, the, at the museum. So um, I welcome the, the G. Um, I, I think that, that certainly enables me to support matters as they are. Um, and I look forward, I hope, to the involvement of some of these other people um, and associations who have a real passion for MOTAT and have backed that passion up with volunteering, yes. with putting work in yes. over many years. So they're not just been sitting on the sideline making you know, casual comments. These are people who have turned up and volunteered their services either as work or in a governance role. So those people deserve to have a say too. And I think that's implicit in the Act. So uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, for the way you've uh, allowed this item to be um, conducted. I think it's resulted in some, some good debate. Um, and, and hopefully the outcome is, is a good one for MOTAT and, and, for, and for the people of Auckland uh, who so treasure it. Thank you. For that, Councillor Dub. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge MOTAT and the representatives here today and um, thank you for your um, presence here and the way you conducted yourself um, and the information that you conveyed. And Michael, I do want to thank you for your um, really proud history, um, um, taking care of a, a very frail organisation when you took it over. And it's a very successful organisation now. Um, I'm going to make an apology to Michael, because I, I, I'm a part of a collective here. I'm part of this governing body. And today, the standard of governance here on this item dropped to a new low. That is my opinion. It is one thing to interrogate the information, the numbers. It is another thing to interrogate an individual. We have lost individuals from our organisation. Some tragically, others have just left to go to jobs 
because they do not feel cared for. I say this very seriously. We are governors and leaders of an organisation of some 10,000 plus people. We have a responsibility to care for our people and all the people that visit this place. They were not cared for today. Our 10,000 people will be watching this streaming. They will now, and they will look and they will go, where are our leaders? Mayor, I know it's distracting sometimes because things are coming in on your phone, but at a point in this meeting, a critical point, you were distracted, and it was important to have the chair take control. I'm not going to labour the criticism, Mayor. Hello, Nicole speaking. Hey, Nicole, this is Alf again. Oh, Alf, your mic's on. Hi. Hi. So, look, I, I acknowledge Michael Alf, as well. Alf, your mic is on. Oops. I am embarrassed at the level of governance here today. It is, was, has not been a governing body on this item. It has been an interrogation body. All right, that's your unworthy. opinion. I am giving, I am the one that is speaking. I have taken the floor, and you are welcome to take the floor after me if you like, Mayor. Others have interjected on me. It is uncomfortable what I am saying, but it is the truth. Thank you. Thank you for that opinion. Um, Councillor Walker. Without speaking at length, I'm at odds with what I heard just now. I think that one of the most important things in this chamber is debate, and arguably vigorous debate, especially when we're talking about very significant sums of money. And in this instance, the sums of money are very significant. And in my view, and I'm sure the view of many of us, there are improvements that can be made. You only have to visit uh, Motet, as I've done, to experience that. It's a wonderful institution, but it has a lot of potential. Much of that potential relies on the volunteers that have largely built it up and maintained those collections. And in my view, one of the things that this city needs to do much better, both across uh, MOTAT but also uh, other institutions, is to really cultivate volunteerism in our city. We do not do it to anywhere near the extent I've seen in some other cities fairly recently. So I support the healthy debate. I have very real concerns around the expenditure on uh, MOTAT. And that's in the context where there's another institution, the Auckland Museum, which receives a substantial sum of money, and I have some concerns around that. But I think we get real value for money there and significant um, visita visitation around what is uh, another um, cultural um, icon. So I think, as a collective, we need to actually foster healthy debate. And that appears to be diminishing around this table because some people don't like it. I certainly think that there is the expectation from Aucklanders that we have healthy debate, that we ask the appropriate questions, and we get answers. Um, we should all be able to do that without being accused of um, interrogation or something of that order. Yet we get that every time now that one of us asks a question, we ask it in an appropriate manner, but the retort comes back, oh, no, um, you, you can't do that. I'm afraid that's not right. That's our job. And I commend the mayor for allowing that uh, debate and those questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Newman. I had, uh, very briefly, Your Worship, I had no... I can't draw the line between an inquiry about um, additional revenue and closing down MOTAT. If somebody has a line to draw upon that, I'd like to know because that's not what I heard today. Um, I hear, you know what that's called? It's called flying a kite. And I just want to acknowledge you, Michael, because I think that um, you have um, led the organisation uh, through 
a difficult period, um, and you've answered some questions, possibly not to the extent that some people would like, but you, you gave a narrative uh, better than anybody else who was trying to argue your case today. Um, not sure that I agree with some of the assumptions around um, the business case, but I think that the Chair, Helen, understands that, and she's nodding in the background there, Your Worship, and that's good, because a, a frank and candid exchange is necessary when you're talking about public money, a substantial amount of public money. What I do look forward to, Your Worship, is for um, more information on this matter because I have every expectation that um, just as the government works through its current legislative program at some point, the MOTAT Act, which is nearly a quarter of a century old, will come back for consideration. And I would expect that this council would be part of that. Uh, and finally, I just want to say that um, I, I, I happen to love MOTAT, and MOTAT's best days um, really exist um, because of the love of the people who do give their time. It is an organisation that, that marches in part because of its volunteers who love it. Um, and I think that that's fabulous. There's, there's, there's fun, <laughs> um, transport and technology, and um, yeah, there's a lot to love about the about the transport modes that have built Auckland, even if some people struggle with that. Thank you. OK, thanks for that. Um, we're now just about to put the boat, but I will point out that whilst some people here are for the staff, I'm here for the 1.8 million Aucklanders and the thousands and thousands who pay rates. And $18 million or $19 million is about 20 bucks a rate, a rate unit. and. And um, I only got into this because and when I do division and the question that Councillor Williamson raised, I don't know any of the people, the elderly gentleman from North Shore apparently is a protagonist. But when I divide one into the other and find $86 a head versus $8 in, it requires some debate and consideration. There's no question about that. I mean, uh, and people who are defending it shouldn't feel bad about defending it either. They should be able to defend it. They should know that that is a very large sum of subsidy for each thing. And we have a lot of things for subsidies, probably more than we have for opera, of all things. Um, and uh, something I have no contact with in my life at all. But thank you for everybody not getting too hostile or upset about it. I'm now going to put the vote. All those in favour of that, please say aye. aye. To the contrary. Carried. There you are. Oh, I'd like to record my vote against G, but I'll support it. What if you're you taking like it in part. What Record your... Vote against G. I don't support G, but I support the rest okay. of it. Um, righto. Well, OK, you don't have to. Everyone, everyone else does. Record against G, please. Record OK. Against Two people who don't want to look into why $85 is a good price I think it'll be recorded. done anyway. You don't need and, a second um, one. Uh, the rest of us will make sure that it's good value for the next lot, which is now the Auckland War Memorial Funding and Levy Agreement. And there's been some pretty good work getting to this point, I have to say. That congratulates the Deputy Mayor for getting something on the table for a three-year funding agreement. And, well, hang on, I'll get to the end of it. We've got on with doing this while we wait for the government to demand meander their way through changing legislation, which will come. And it's good work, and I enjoyed meeting the museum team last month, I have to say. Uh, we have people from the museum to give us a bit of a presentation, and I may as well take a mover in a second to write from the staff, and I'm pretty sure it's the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Walker. So that's been moved and seconded. There's a... There's a Outside chance that this might be a little quicker than the last one, but I, I have um, the TAB is not placing any bets on that. Welcome, uh, Professor Richard Bedford, David Reeves, and James Liddell. Thank you very much. And, and with, it's over to you. Nice picture on the screen, I might say. Um, 
thank you, Worship. I just um, uh, briefly, I will outline the agreement. This is the funding agreement for the museum. Um, but first, we have, as you've introduced, museum representatives who have a short presentation and will make some comments on the agreement. Well, thank you, Your Worship, for the opportunity to come. We really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with councillors. Uh, as you're aware, we have our uh, Chief Executive, David Reeves, who will be new, I think, to some councillors because he recently took up his role as the museum's Chief uh, Executive, and James Liddell, our External Relations Manager. I'd just like to start by thanking the council uh, for the support that you and the ratepayers, of course, provide the museum every year. It's very substantial and it's uh, humble in some ways for us to acknowledge that ratepayers contribute such a significant part of the operation of this cultural institution. I want to assure you we are very mindful of the financial constraints that the council is working with. And we do appreciate very much the cooperation that we've had over the last six or seven months, working on ways that we can address aspects of our act and also aspects of our funding arrangements which are built into that act. And that has been a very constructive process and that we will hear more about that uh, shortly. But we thought it would be useful to start by just quickly going over some of the performance elements for the last 12 to 18 months to give you a sense of some of the work we've been doing with the communities in Auckland. We have a very brief presentation, um, which a video presentation, and um, then David Reeves is going to talk through some of our key elements before we move directly to the item on the agenda. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Richard. Uh, called David Reeves, Aho, um, as Richard has just said, new chief executive. This is my first opportunity to address you, but I have met a number of you in past years, as I had 12 years on the executive team of the Auckland War Memorial Museum. Um, Recent performance of the museum, um, I'm not going to slavishly read all of those bullet points to you. I appreciate you've had a long day already and I will endeavour to be concise and constructive. I do want to point out um, that our visitation is on target for this current financial year. We've had good responses from the public and also steady growth in international tourism. Our education visits have been slightly less than target for the 22-23 year as schools have been slower than expected to come out of um, the COVID lockdowns, but we are on, growth, on, on target for growth this coming um, year with good bookings in terms two and three. Our online offer continues to perform very strongly and is something that we are looked to internationally and nationally in terms of the way we engage off-site from our museum. Of particular note is the um, self-generated revenue that we've been able to achieve. This has been driven in part by um, the strong tourism recovery, but also Aucklanders have come back to the museum following the COVID lockdowns and we've achieved quite a substantial change in the per visitor spend from around $12 per person before COVID to around $30 per person in the current year. And this is enormously gratifying for us because it enables us to do more of the good things that we endeavour to deliver for Aucklanders. I also need to point out that we have a, an old and complex building. We have a 20-year asset management plan, which um, looks comprehensively at weather tightness, at building systems like uh, air conditioning, security systems, wiring, lighting, all of those things that, that make a building work. Um, a number of these are at their end of life phase. And so we have a comprehensive 20-year plan to progressively um, replace those, but 
that is not a cheap exercise in such a complex and much loved heritage building. I want to now go to a very short video just to outline some of the um, external work that we do in working with communities in a variety of ways. This is a two minute video and I think it will be um, more efficient for you to watch that than for me to talk for two minutes, so please enjoy it. Hopefully it's going to run. Here it is. So that outlines a bit of the flavour of what we've been up to. Now looking at the year ahead, the first year of the three-year proposed funding agreement that you are considering today. We have set ourselves a strong self-generated revenue target of 19.73 million. That's our highest ever target. Um, we have two uh, international touring exhibitions uh, scheduled locked in and ready to be promoted, as well as to homegrown smaller exhibitions utilising our own collections and those of other organisations around Aotearoa. The key things that we'll achieve in the upcoming financial year is the phased opening of our new Natural Environment and Human Impacts Gallery on the middle floor of the museum. We need to begin the planning and engagement of the complete renewal of the Māori Court and Pacific gal Galleries. My aim is to have those completely redone by the centenary of the museum in 2029. It would be a crying shame if we celebrated the centenary of that building with 30-year-old exhibitions in those galleries. So we need to start that work now. We will be strengthening our education delivery over the coming year and also beginning a, an approach to more proactive repatriation of Taonga in line with a number of international museums um, and other museums around New Zealand. So the funding for the next uh, three years, the request that we have been working with council officials on, the figures are there and they're in your papers. Um, as I've said, we've set ourselves high self-generated revenue targets, we will be aiming towards a 60-40 split, 60% um, council funding, 40% generated from third parties by the end of the three-year period. Um, 
The three-year funding agreement we are very much looking forward to because it gives both yourselves and us a degree of certainty and it means that we can spend our time and energy talking about what we're doing um, rather than the fine points of um, the, the money here and there. Um, the terms in the report have uh, you've got in your report. There are some minor things still to be uh, decided, but we are in full support of what is proposed. And that's all I have to say on that. Very good. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Sure. Um, got a few questions. I'll just rattle the questions off if that's OK, and you can, you can just pick how you want to um, uh, answer them. Um, so one of the things I'd like to know is just how you're getting on building the case for more funding from government and the context around that, you know, we've got more treasures, more taonga than they have down in Te Papa. And quite clearly, the outreach that you're doing, everything that you're doing goes to a, um, a national context. So that's one question. The other question I've got um, just follows on from your, I, I guess, what I'd call international exhibitions, particularly um, Egypt and, and the like. It'd be good to know just what the relative success of those things are. I understand that there's a cost attached to bringing them in, but it would be useful to know um, just how they, how, how they pan out. The other question just goes to your... Um, exhibits, if, if that's the appropriate um, uh, expression, because you have pointed out that in some parts of the museum things are tired and there's a need for a, a refresh, and quite obviously the most outstanding one is the uh, Māori and uh, Pacific, uh, which is critical. Um, so really, really um, three questions, and, and I guess a, a related one, um, given the enhanced revenue from, let's call it tourism and um, and and the like, whether you um, see more more scope in that, particularly if we can encourage better better transport and integrate that with the tourism offering in um, in Auckland, and, and, and just any comment on what council could do in that respect. Certainly, thank you, councillor, for your questions um, on the government funding matter. Um, we met with. Uh, Minister Goldsmith three weeks ago and introduced him to uh, the museum and our financial situation and the matter of uh, future government funding was certainly on our agenda. He listened politely as you would expect and made no commitments as, as you would expect. Um, but those conversations are underway. It's also something that in my first six months in the role I've met with officials from the Ministry for Culture of Her and of Heritage in Wellington on a number of occasions. They are aware of our work in this area. And uh, two weeks ago, um, Chairman uh, Richard Bedford and I were in Christchurch on, on, on business and were able to meet with the directors of Canterbury Museum and Otago Museum who are facing similar issues and we have a strategy around um, making approaches for particular things where we believe that there's a case for partnership funding with central government. Things like education, things like natural science and biodiversity research, things like uh, repatriation of Tonga Māori to communities. Your question about the relative success of the special exhibition program. The business cases for those are predicated on them being um, profit making. Um, we have to book those in two and three years in advance and so we can't always be 100% certain of the break even point because costs shift in the meantime um, and audience preferences can shift. But I'm um, happy to say that the recent uh, pharaohs uh, in the time of Egypt um, was a, a very successful. We had 17% um, higher visitation than we were predicting and particularly retail spend was above um, prediction as well. And we're expecting that the upcoming Relics exhibition, which will open in May, which is a whimsical look at a post-apocalyptic world where Lego has taken over all of our rubbish and detritus and leftover bits and pieces, um, that is looking to be a highly profitable 
um, exhibition as well. So the, that special exhibition program is a key part of reducing the reliance on council funding. Um, you had a question about the refreshing of the, the older exhibits. Again, we have uh, a program stretching out to 2039. We have a stated position of the board is that by 2039 we want to have no exhibit older than 20 years. Um, and so we've got a program, and in fact the team are working today um, on a workshop to look at what the planning for that means over the next 15 years. Um, and your final question about tourism. Um, we are seeing good growth, um, but we are at the whim of what happens internationally and what happens with airlines bringing people in. Um, we are in constant contact with the tourism industry, Aotearoa, and um, keeping track with, with their trends and with their predictions. And our estimates of visitation um, that are in our, what's behind the numbers that we've presented to you today is based on quite scientific estimates of percentages um, of those visitation numbers. Thank you very much, Mr. Good answer, thanks. I don't have any other questions, or do I? No. Uh, I'm the, I think you've probably withdrawn now. Uh, sorry, I do have a question um, from Councillor Newman, and I think um, the Deputy Mayor wants to make a comment. Yeah, look, thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, I love the War Memorial Museum. I love Motown as well, but really love the museum. So can I just ask, um, I know that uh, the general admission is free for Auckland residents and members, but do you have any idea of roughly what percentage of Auckland residents nevertheless may pay when they come up? We, we pay. We pay our ticket, pay our full price, um, because I know it's for a good cause. Have you got any idea of your numbers? Um, yeah, through the chair, it's at 60% now, so it's grown from 43% pre-COVID to 60% now. Okay, look, I didn't, I, sorry, I didn't read the details fully, but I, I think that that is absolutely fantastic because um, it, is, it is free, but there are people who are choosing to make that decision as much as they're choosing to go there. And I know that not everybody can afford it, so those who can't, fine, but it, I won't be commenting for the Chair, but thank you. Yeah, good point. I'd, I'm quite happy to make a donation when I go there, if, it's, if it looks obvious, that's all. Um, I don't want to embarrass anybody who can't. Deputy Mayor Simpson, who can make a donation. And does. Exhibition of um, clothing there at some stage, which would draw a huge crowd. I'm not dead yet. Um, with respect to what you have... <laughs> OK, let's just... <laughs> um, Your Worship, in all seriousness, I, um, it gives me great pleasure to move this today because it is indeed, I believe, great news for both Auckland Council and uh, the museum. It provides certainty, reduces conflict, and will allow a conversation about modernising the museum's relationship uh, with Council to be ongoing and take place. The proposed increases are moderate, and I think that's welcome on certainly our side, uh, but very agreeable by you as well. And it effectively delivers uh, the first result from the political working party, Your Worship, that you tasked me to, um, to deliver on. And I do want to take the opportunity to thank Dr Bedford, um, your chairmanship of the board, your willingness to engage, and, I mean, um, respectfully, this hasn't happened before. Not that you haven't happened before, but you know what I'm saying, don't you? We've never been in this place before. Um, and I think it's really healthy for both sides, and that's a big credit to you. Uh, Chris, I want to give credit to you as well. You've um, negotiated with the, with the museum staff very, very well, and I think it's an outcome that we are all happy with. So thank you to the staff involved, both at the museum side and our side, for your work. Um, we've still got a long way to go, but I'm certainly very confident that this sets us up for the future. Our next stage, of course, is the ongoing discussion around legislative change. And we've, we've had a conversation with the Minister, you've had a conversation with the Minister, and I think there's a clause in the, in the agreement that actually keeps that conversation going. So um, I just want to give a huge vote of thanks uh, to, to you for being so willing to come to the party and work with us. It's an important time for you, an important time to us. It's a bit of a milestone, and I think um, it's congratulations all round, really. Thank you very much. 
It's the second to the motion. Uh, Councillor Walker wants to say a little bit too. Yes, uh, so commendations to yourself, uh, Desley, around achieving this uh, three-year um, agreement. That's really good in terms of certainty for the uh, museum. Uh, my main comment is in the instance of the uh, museum, it ain't broken, it's whole, and in my opinion is very well run. Uh, so I put a question mark over the necessity for, um, for changes. There's obviously a criticality around being financially viable, and you're on track to do that. So I would hope that we can uh, look forward to another year in the next uh, three years that will be um, a raging success, because it is an outstanding museum, both nationally but internationally. And its collection, both in respect of a physical sense and the increasing digital um, collection, is equally outstanding on a global scale. So you really hit well above your, um, your base, in my, in my opinion. So thank you very much. I enjoy going there. My family enjoys going there. Everybody I know enjoys <laughs> going there. And whenever I see a tourist buzzing around, I always say to them, go to the museum. It's a must. Thank you, Councillor. We Thanks, really mate. appreciate this comment. OK, very good. I'm going to tell them to go to Motet as well, just in case, to get the value down, the cost down. Of um, right, I'm ready. Oh, no, Baker. Yeah, because I say a lot. Um, yeah, look, I just, I, I just want to um, add, too, that I think I'm really pleased to see us moving to these three-year funding agreements. They are something that we should be doing. Um, in my view, we should be putting a RAFA legislation to bed at some stage because it's no longer fit for purpose, and that's something that would yeah. be great to see happen. And so these funding agreements allow you guys to have certainty, it allows you to leverage other funding, and is a far better outcome. And I did love the way that Morris smiled intently when you talked about the relic, uh, I think, uh, exhibition, because I think he was wanting to be in it. Um, but uh, that's, um, you know, well done. <laughs> um, but uh, nice work, and, and long may uh, the work on the, on the three-year funding agreements continue. So nice to see you uh, leading the way there. On that note, I'll, I'll move, the, I'll put the motion, which has been uh, moved and seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, bingo. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And <laughs> at the risk of upsetting my well-being, I'm going to ask for the health and safety and well-being report, which has been reviewed by the Audit Risk Committee, who have said it's bloody good. So now I'm prepared to take their word for it. <laughs> right. <-o. laughs> Fooly. Walker Fooly. Don't feel kind of monstered, but but if you're feeling monstered, that's okay. <laughs> Even at the risk of upsetting certain sensitive members of the thing about my ability to run a meeting, I'm encouraging you to be prompt about this, but very good. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, so this is uh, the standard report that is referred from the Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, this report was uh, tabled at the February committee meeting and was um, deferred from the February um, governing body meeting to this one. So the date of the performance indicators is... Um, December uh, 2023, you'll get a, uh, an updated version of this at the next uh, meeting, which I believe is after the May uh, Audit and Risk Committee report. So look, I will keep this relatively short. Um, the Mayor's re uh, referred to some commentary from the Audit and Risk Committee, and I won't go into that. Uh, and I will take the report broadly as read uh, in the interest of time. Uh, I will note uh, that the majority of the activity we're going through at the moment is to strengthen the control environment around how we manage health, safety and well-being, to ensure that our staff have the 
uh, the, the systems, processes, and capabilities to be able to manage the safety of work and the well-being of Kaimahi uh, through the work that they do. So the work that we're doing focuses predominantly on risk management and ensuring that the systems that we use are not uh, bureaucratically heavy and that deliver value as we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, happy to take any questions on any of the content within the report, though. Councillor Watson. Very quick one. Um, it goes to uh, the, the recommendation from the Audit and Risk um, of a uh, range of opportunities to improve the systems that support good health, safety and, and well-being. Do, do we have, as we did have uh, under the previous uh, regime, the facility for staff members to go to, to a, an outside entity for any concerns or issues they might have within the organisation? Is that still in place? Uh, thanks for the question. So, uh, yes, if we're referring to a speak-up process, so if, the, if staff feel like they have something they want to raise from it um, that is a concern, they don't want to raise that internally through internal channels, we do have an external service that they can uh, access to, to raise any issues, and that's then referred back appropriately through the right channels within the organisation. Just a quick follow-up in, in, in that process of referring back that the person obviously remains a, 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 anonymous, and what, what is the line of communication that then takes place on, on behalf of that person? Uh, so we ensure that the person who's made the, um, the disclosure, is their identity is protected to the, uh, to the degree possible. They will at some point be asked whether or not they want to disclose their, um, uh, their identity in order to progress certain things. For example, if it was a disciplinary issue, it's very hard to do that without disclosing who the person is that's making the complaint. But we do try and ensure that confidentiality throughout that process and deal with the issue at hand only. Okay, final question, what has been the uptake of that facility? We haven't had a huge uptake of the external um, service because we have an internal service as well that uh, delivers a similar uh, approach uh, through a number of channels. Most of the speak up uh, issues that get raised get raised through the internal system. However, we're also looking at that as to whether or not that's sustainable and effective and the best, um, best approach, because it may be actually easier and cheaper to go external on all of them. We haven't, uh, I, don't, I haven't got the um, stats here, Councillor, but they are available. Thank you for that, Councillor Hills. Thanks, Mayor. Um, thank you for the report. I have three questions. The first one is just the, the incidents, although they look flat, over time they're actually is it, am I correct that the incidents and near misses are actually higher as an average of tracking higher? Or is it just I can't see years gone by? A little bit from column A, a little bit from column B on that one. So uh, one of the things that we've seen is an increase in our reporting culture. Part of that is due to the reporting system improvements we've made, which has made it easier to report something that has <laughs> happened. And then the second part is a more uh, willing... Um, uh, disclosure, so staff feel more able to tell us when things are happening. It is important to note as well when we're looking at an increasing number of incidents that many of those incidents are successful incidents. They're telling us that something's happened. It doesn't necessarily mean that anything went wrong. It's just that there was an incident that occurred. Okay. The other question is in relation to EAP. So under the risks, um, it says that can't remember what the exact word is, sorry, the medium or needs improvement is the lack of available counsellors and um, resources for staff to access EAP. And then later on, it's obviously got graphs where EAP cases drop off and presenting issues are dropping off and cases by directorate are dropping off. But I'm assuming those two are connected. If they can't access it, then those other things look better. Well, not better, because I think accessing EAP is actually a really good thing, not, a, not something we should be what, concerned. You know, it's not a negative thing. There's a, uh, and a great question, actually, um, very perceptive. The, um, there is a third item that, that uh, modifies that, and that's in relation to the delivery of pastoral care uh, within the organisation, which was a recommendation that was made in the whole water review of 2021 that we provide this service. What we're seeing is an uptake in pastoral care uh, support being delivered within the organisation, and the working theory is that that's offsetting some of the EAP usage. However, we also know 
that uh, those people who are applying to seek EAP support, they're dealing with a constraint within that system where there's just not enough counsellors nationally to be able to support at uh, short notice. Okay, and sorry, it'll be four questions because this is additional to that. So if they can't access the counsellors in the EAP service, what does it bounce back to? Does it come back to just leaving them on a waiting list or does it come back to management to help them? I know it's um, confidential, but what, if those people are getting high stress, which is what it says, what, where do they, what happens? So one of the things that the pastoral care team is doing is uh, you could consider it an early intervention. So a lot of the lower level stuff we're taking away from EAP and delivering that internally through a, a, a prompt conversation before it becomes more of an issue. What that does is it also allows us to ensure that those people who really need support can access it because EAP is not then tied up with lower level interventions that may be better dealt with internally. Cool, and last question, um, probably may, maybe more for you, Phil. The two things, one, uh, we had feedback at the stakeholder um, day, Māori outcome stakeholder day, that there is a concern from members of the public that they're feeling, um, you know, being attacked um, through the racism against Māori at the moment. The other thing um, around staff feeling that way, and the today we had the rainbow crossing painted over and threats from Destiny Church that they're going to continue attacking uh, council events and council structures, I guess, that have rainbow-related themes. Um, what are we doing to A, beef up security or beef up support for not only staff but keep communities safe? Because if those threats are, unfortunately, they were real two days ago and then we saw it this morning, um, are we thinking of, I don't know, what supports we can provide but for communities and staff? <clears throat> Probably have to uh, take some of the actions that we, you know, in terms of beefing up external security around events and work and what have you, that's quite a significant challenge, obviously. You'll be aware that we have, for other reasons, but related to um, aggression and, and um, behavioural problems that our staff face, we have taken the step of putting security in, uh, in some venues. Um, so, we've, you know, there's a few practical interventions there. I think the other part of it, though, is... Um, and I get a lot of feedback from staff around how it's welcomed. The communication that we um, have going into the organisation is really important. Okay, the, the leadership commitment that we give voice to in terms of our commitment around Māori outcomes, treaty relationships, um, the fact of us valuing diversity and inclusion and having the mechanisms that we have, staff support arrangements, the advisory panels, and so on. These are, these are good, tangible acknowledgements of the nature of our workforce and that people are valued. So it's, you know, this, I suppose, some soft stuff that's really important in terms of uh, leadership-wise, what we're expressing into the organisation. I'll have to... might sort of take offline and have some discussion with Paul and others about... Um, you know, how we are dealing with the external service delivery related aspects of this. But I can tell you it's real and it's certainly um, in the minds of staff. But I thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Dub, please. Thanks for this, Wick. Um, just following up on the pastoral care at, um, on the original report at paragraph 20, um, I was intrigued by 27 individuals, but then I go to 13 teams. Can you just give us a, a sense of how many people we're dealing with in 13 teams? This is a, a new, relatively new service, and are you, if you can comment about the 13 teams and just the trajectory of the growth in demand, I'd like to know, you know where, where it seems to be heading in that service. And then the following part, can you look at um, paragraph 17, um, and it's the second sentence, the remaining actions require resources which have been instead been working. No, no, I, it, there's just a probably an error in the sentence construction there. I can't quite work out. Assuming you have those, those paragraphs in front of you. 
Yes, uh, so on the, the first questions um, there, uh, the number of staff, I don't have that detail in front of me right now, but we do track that so we know how many staff we're engaging with more broadly. So in many of the pastoral care cases, it is an individual that needs support. In some cases, it is a team that um, is processing something that may have happened. For example, a critical incident may have occurred and we get the team together to debrief them and work through that with them. I don't have the numbers of the total number of people that um, uh, are supported through that, but I do have it elsewhere. Uh, on the uh, paragraph 17 issue, what I mean, we have a small but effective uh, well-being team. They generally provide a lot of the work and um, development required for the um, development of programs and initiatives that support well-being. But from time to time, they are also required to go and provide that pastoral care service across the organisation. So as um, the uh, the number of cases starts to increase, it just means that they can't do some of the preventative work um, as quickly as they can. We're still processing whether or not that's a sustained increase over time or whether or not it's just an, a, uh, a rebalancing because it is such a new service and it may plateau again in the next few months. We're continuing to track that and the impact on EAP as well. One final one. There's, um, there's a real rise of anti-Semitic rhetoric in this country. And um, does religious preference come up as, as a concern? Uh, you know, um, practicing one's uh, religious preference, does that come up as a concern? Does that show up in any of the discussions you have with staff? It's a good question. Uh, I'm just looking back to the information I've seen through EAP and through the pastoral care teams. I'm not aware of that being a significant issue within our community of Kaimahi, um, although I would expect that those uh, staff who are um, externally facing may see that from time to time. I don't have data on that. What I can say is we do have some very strong staff networks that provide a lot of support and advocacy within the organisation, and those continue to network very well and be quite effective. Thank you very much. I'm happy to move that we have the recommendation. Oh, are you seconding it, or are you questioning we're doing both? Oh, I'm happy to second it, but oh no, you already got a seconder. I just wanted to ask a question. Um, Councillor Bartley. Yeah. I don't want to second that, it's just he asked me if I wanted to. Um, I wanted to ask, please, um, is the support for staff proactive? Like when something comes up, do um, red flags go off and go, oh my God, we need to get to that team? And I, I'm specifically referencing the animal management staff and the death threats that they get and the fact that they have to lock up their place of work um, for what they you know, have to endure like that. That's really, that's really hard. Yeah, that's a great question. The, uh, so we do three things. One is we pr uh, proactively review incident reports as they come in, and if we do have a critical incident, we do apply resource into those areas. Uh, the other part is that we are proactively going out and engaging with staff who may not have reported anything, but if we identify that there is something in the conversation that has us worried about that individual, then we would lean in. The third part is for, specifically for animal management is a great example, they do have quite a highly stressful role. And so we have applied dedicated pastoral care resourcing into that team and through the engagement survey round that's just closed, we are getting a lot of positive feedback coming through from that team that is making a difference to their lived experience at work. Very good answers, Paul. Uh, I'd like to put the motion that we Note the council as presented by the Audit and Risk Committee. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary. Thank you, Paul. Carried. Summary of the Governing Body Committee Information Memorandum and Briefings. That's usually um, moved Simpson Baker. by Simpson Walker Baker. Is it? and Baker. No, Simpson yes. and Baker. Aye. Aye. Can you have a contest? Aye. Oh, there you go. All those in favour of that say please. Uh, and summary of the confidential decisions and blah, blah, blah. Moved and seconded by, to, by somebody or other and somebody else. All that in favour, please say that. Everyone going to exclusion and secrecy, please say that.
extension of time, The please. entire public has just got up and extension wandered out. Of, extension of time, please. Extension of time. Ah, yeah. Well, while they're being secretive, all those in favour of being secretive. No, uh, extension of time first. No, no, I'm going to do that now. All those in favour of an extension of time, uh, moved and seconded by somebody or other and somebody else. And that means means that A, we can carry on, B, Gail has gone. No, you need to... Um, yeah. uh, I would like to move a motion to speed time up. It's been particularly slow today. Um, Rightio. I think we've got through all that. Um, you actually need to take a moment because the members online need to... Uh, we're going to have a, a, a compulsory stop for five minutes while a, we go from uh, digital to manual and manual back to digital. Thank you.